section fourteen of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain fifteen thirty through fifteen thirty four henry's defiance the victory of anne part three before norfolk could reach the south of france news came to him that the pope coerced by the emperor had issued a brief declaring all of henry's proceedings in england to be nullified and he and his abettors excommunicated unless of his own accord he restored things to their former condition before september it was plain therefore that any attempt at the coming interview to reconcile clement with henry's action would be fruitless norfolk found francis also much cooler than before and sent back his nephew rochford post haste to england to beg the king's instructions he arrived at court in early august at a time when henry's perplexity was at its height he had learnt of the determination of francis to greet the pope and carry through the marriage between the duke of orleans and catherine de medici whether the king of england's demands were satisfied by clement or not he now knew that the dreaded sentence of excommunication pended over him and his instruments if he had been left to his own weakness he would probably have given way or at least have sought compromise if norfolk had been at his elbow the old aristocratic english party might also have stayed the king's hand but cromwell bold and astute and anne with the powerful lever of her unborn child which might be a son knew well that they had gone too far to return and that defiance of the papacy was the only road open to them already at the end of june henry had gone as far as to threaten an appeal from the pope to the general council of the church the meeting of which was then being discussed but now that he knew that francis was failing him and the pope had finally cast down the gauge he took the next great step which led to england's separation from rome norfolk was recalled and gardiner accredited to francis only with a watching brief during the papal interview at nice whilst henry's ambassadors in rome were recalled and english agents were sent to germany to seek alliances with the german protestant princes when therefore norfolk arrived in england he found that in his two months absence cromwell had steered the ship of state further away than ever from the traditional policy of the english conservatives namely one of balance between the two great catholic powers and that england was isolated but for the doubtful friendship of those vassal princes of the empire who professed the dreaded new heresy thenceforward the ruin of anne and cromwell was one of the main objects of norfolk and the noble party the treatment meted out to catherine during the same time followed a similar impulse chapus had been informed that the king having now taken a legal wife catherine could no longer be called queen but princess dowager of wales and that her regal household could not be kept up and on the third july catherine's principal officers were ordered to convey a similar message to her personally the message was roughly worded it could only be arrogance and vainglory she was told that made her retain or usurp the title of queen she was much mistaken if she imagined that her husband would ever live with her again and by her obstinate contumacy she would cause wars and bloodshed as well as danger to herself and her daughter as both would be made to feel the king's displeasure the queen's answer as might have been expected was as firm as usual she was the king's legitimate wife 
and no reward or fear in the world would ever make her abandon her right to the title she bore it was not vainglory that moved her for to be the daughter of ferdinand and isabel was a greater honor than to be a queen henry might punish her she said or even her daughter Quote, yet neither for that nor a thousand deaths would she consent to damn her soul or that of her husband the king End quote. the king beside himself with rage could do no more than warn catherine's household that they must all treat their mistress as princess of wales or suffer the penalty as for catherine no punishment short of death could move her and cromwell himself in admiration at her answer said that quote, nature had injured her in not making her a man for she would have surpassed in fame all the heroes of history End quote. when a few days after this catherine was removed to buckton crowds followed her with tears and blessings along the road even as they had followed the princess mary shortly before Quote, as if she were god almighty end quote, as anne said in defiance of henry's threats god save the queen rang high and clear wherever she went and the people quote, wishing her joy comfort and all manner of prosperity and mishap to her enemies begged her with tears to let them serve her for they were all ready to die for her sake end quote and spite at such demonstrations was characteristic catherine possessed a very rich and gorgeous length of stuff which she had brought from spain to serve as a christening robe if she should have a son and heir anne's time was drawing near and she would not be content until the king had demanded of his wife the spanish material to serve as a robe for the prince of wales which he was confident would be born to anne god forbid replied catherine that i should ever give help or countenance in a case so horrible and abominable as this and the indignity of forcible searching of her chests for the stuff at least was not insisted upon then anne's own position was hardly a happy one her one hope being that the coming child would be a son as the king was assured by astrologers that it would be for amorous henry was already tiring somewhat of her and even cromwell's tone was less confident than before early in august henry left her at greenwich to go to windsor alone for the first time since they had been together sometime in july she had insisted upon a very sumptuous bed which had formed part of a french royal ransom being taken out of the treasure room for the birth of the expected heir it is well sneered chapus in the first days of september that she got it betimes Quote, otherwise she would not have it now for she has been for some time past very jealous of the king and with good cause spoke about it in words that he did not like he told her that she must wink at such things and put up with them as her betters had done before her he could at any time cast her down as easily as he had raised her End quote. frequent bickerings of this sort went on during the last weeks of anne's pregnancy but on sunday seventh september the day that was to heal all differences came henry had defied the greatest power in the world had acted basely and brutally to his legal wife and had incurred the reprobation of his own people for the sake of having a son and on the fateful day mentioned a fair girl baby was born to anne at greenwich the official rejoicings were held but beneath the surface everyone knew that a tragedy lurked for unless a son was born to anne her doom was sealed henry had asserted his mastership in his own realm and had defied christendom 
he had found that his subjects however sulkily had accepted his action without open revolt and that charles notwithstanding the insult to his house was still speaking softly through his ambassadors if a great princess like catherine could thus be repudiated without disaster to his realm it would indeed be easy for him to cast away quote, that naughty pake nan bullen end quote, if she failed to satisfy his desire for a son but in the meanwhile it was necessary for him to secure so far as he could the succession of his new daughter since cranmer's decision had rendered mary princess of wales of whom her father had been so proud illegitimate accordingly immediately after the child elizabeth was christened heralds proclaimed in the king's name that princess mary was thenceforward to lose her title and preeminence the badge upon her servants coats being replaced by the arms of the king and the baby lady elizabeth was to be recognized as the king's only legitimate heir and princess of wales in vain the imperial ambassador protested and talked to cromwell of possible war in which england might be ruined which cromwell admitted but reminded him that the emperor would not benefit thereby in vain catherine from her retirement at buckton urged chapus and the emperor to patronize reginald pole as a possible threat to henry in vain princess mary herself in diplomatic language told her father that he might give her what title he liked but that she herself would never admit her illegitimacy or her mother's repudiation in vain bishop fisher and chapus counseled the invasion of england and the overturn of henry cromwell knew that there was no drawing back for him and that the struggle must go on now to the bitter end anne with the birth of her daughter became more insolent and exacting than ever nothing would satisfy her but the open degradation of catherine and her daughter and henry in this respect seems to have had no spark of generous or gentlemanly feeling irritated by what he considered the disobedience of his wife and child and doubtless also by their constant recourse for support and advice to the emperor's ambassador against him he dismissed mary's household and ordered her to go to hatfield and serve as maid the princess elizabeth mary was ready with her written protest which chapus had drafted for her but having made it decided to submit and was born to hatfield in scornful dudgeon to serve quote, the bastard end quote, of three months old when she arrived the duke of suffolk asked her if she would go and pay her respects to quote, the princess end quote i know of no other princess but myself replied mary the daughter of lady pembroke has no right to such a title but she added as the king acknowledges her i may call her sister as i call the duke of richmond brother mary was the true daughter of her proud mother and bluff charles brandon got many a tart answer from her before he gave her up in despair to perform a similar mission to her mother at buckton catherine had never changed her tone knowing henry's weakness she had always pressed for the final papal decision in her favor which she insisted would bring her husband to his knees as it doubtless would have done if he had stood alone for a time the pope and the king of france endeavored to find a via media which should save appearances for charles would not bind himself to carry out by force the papal deposition of henry which clement wanted but catherine would have no compromise nor did it suit cromwell or anne though the former was apparently anxious to avoid offending the emperor 
parliament moreover was summoned for the fifteenth january fifteen thirty four to give the sanction of the nation to henry's final defiance of rome and persistence in the path to which the king's desire for a son and his love for anne had dragged england was now the only course open to him suffolk and a deputation of councillors were consequently sent once more with an ultimatum to catherine accompanied by a large armed force to intimidate the queen and the people who surrounded her the deputation saw her on the eighteenth december and suffolk demanded that she should recognize cranmer's decision and abandon her appeal to rome whilst her household and herself were to take the oath of allegiance to the king in the new form provided the alternative was that she should be deprived of her servants and be removed to fotheringay or somersame seated in the midst of pestilential marshes suffolk was rough in his manner and made short work of the english household nearly all of whom were dismissed and replaced by others but he found catherine the same hard woman as ever considering all the king had done for her and hers he said it was disgraceful that she should worry him as she had done for years putting him to vast expense in embassies to rome and elsewhere and keeping him in turmoil with his neighbors surely she had grown tired of her obstinacy by this time and would abandon her appeal to rome if she did so the king would do anything for her but if not he would clip her wings and effectually punish her as a beginning he said they were going to remove her to fotheringay catherine had heard of such talk many times before though less rudely worded and she replied in the usual tone she looked to the pope alone and cared nothing for the archbishop of canterbury as for going to fotheringay that she would not do the king might work his will but unless she was dragged thither by main force she would not go or she would be guilty of suicide so unhealthy was the place some of the members of the household were recalcitrant and the two priests abel and barker were sent to the tower the aged spanish bishop of landolf jorge diateca the queen's confessor was also warned that he must go and de la saw her apothecary and a physician both spaniards but at her earnest prayers they were allowed to remain pending an appeal the queen's women attendants were also told they must depart but upon catherine saying that she would not undress or go to bed unless she had proper help two of them were allowed to stay for a whole week the struggle went on every device and threat being employed to break down the queen's resistance she was as hard as adamant all the servants who remained but the spaniards who spoke no english had to swear not to treat her as queen and she said she would treat them as gailers on the sixth day of suffolk's stay at buckton pack animals were got ready and preparations made for removing the establishment to fotheringay but they still had to reckon with catherine locking herself in her chamber she carried on a colloquy with her oppressors through a chink in the wall if you wish to take me she declared you must break down my door but though the country gentlemen around had been summoned to the aid of the king's commissioners and the latter were well armed such was the ferment and indignation in the neighborhood and indeed throughout the country that violence was felt to be unwise and catherine was left in such peace as she might enjoy well might suffolk write as he did to norfolk quote, we find here the most obstinate woman that may be inasmuch as we think surely there is no other remedy than to convey her by force to somersame 
concerning this we have nothing in our instructions we pray your good lordship that we may have knowledge of the king's pleasure End quote. all this petty persecution was of course laid at the door of anne by catherine's friends and the catholic majority for cromwell was clever in avoiding his share of the responsibility the lady they said would never be satisfied until both the queen and her daughter had been done to death either by poison or otherwise and catherine was warned to take care to fasten securely the door of her chamber at night and to have the room searched before she retired in the meantime england and france were drifting further apart if henry finally decided to brave the papal excommunication francis dared not make common cause with him the bishop of paris du Bellay, once more came over and endeavored to find a way out of the maze anne whom he had befriended before received him effusively kissing him on the cheek and exerting all her witchery upon him but it was soon found that he brought an ultimatum from his king and when henry began to bully him and abuse francis for deserting him the bishop cowed him with a threat of immediate war the compromise finally arrived at was that if the pope before the following easter fifteen thirty four would withdraw his sentence against henry england would remain within the pale of the church otherwise the measure drafted for presentation to parliament entirely throwing off the papal supremacy would be proceeded with this was the parting of the ways and the decision was left to clement the seventh parliament opened on the fifteenth january perhaps the most fateful assembly that ever met at westminster the country as we have seen was indignant at the treatment of catherine and her daughter but the instinct of loyalty to the king was strong and there was no powerful centre around which revolt might crystallize the clergy especially even those who like stokesley fox and gardiner were henry's instruments dreaded the great changes that portended and an attempt to influence parliament by a declaration of the clergy in convocation against the king's first marriage failed notwithstanding the flagrant violence with which signatures were sought with difficulty even though the nobles known to favor catherine were not summoned a bill granting a dowry to the queen as dowager princess of wales was passed but the house of commons trembling for the english property and the imperial dominions threw it out the prospect for a time looked black for the great ecclesiastical changes that were contemplated and the hopes of catherine's friends rose again the bishop of paris in the meanwhile had contrived to frighten clement and his cardinals by his threatening talk of english schism and the universal spread of dissent into an insincere and half-hearted acquiescence in a compromise that would submit the question of a divorce to a tribunal of two cardinals sitting at cambray to save appearances and deciding in favor of henry when the french ambassador castillon came to henry with this news early in march fifteen thirty four the king had experienced the difficulty of bringing parliament and convocation to his views and again if left to himself he would probably have yielded but anne and cromwell and indeed cranmer were now in the same boat and any wavering on the part of the king would have meant ruin to them all they did their best to stiffen henry but he was nearly inclined to give way behind their backs and after the french ambassador had left the council unsuccessful henry had a long secret talk with him in the garden in which he assured him that he would not have anything done hastily against the holy see but whilst the rash and turbulent bishop of paris was hectoring clement at rome 
in sending unjustifiably encouraging messages to england circumstances on both sides were working against the compromise which the french desired so much cromwell and anne were panic-stricken at the idea of reopening the question of the marriage before any papal tribunal and kept up henry's resentment against the pope henry's pride also was wounded by a suggestion of the french that as a return for clement's pliability alexander de medici duke of florence might marry the princess mary cromwell's diplomatic management of the parliamentary opposition and the consequent passage of the bill abolishing the remittance of peter's pence to rome also encouraged henry to think that he might have his own way after all and the chances of his making further concessions to the pope again diminished a similar process was going on in rome whilst clement was smilingly listening to talk of reconciliation for the sake of keeping england under his authority he well knew that henry could only be moved by fear and all the thunderbolts of the church were being secretly forged to launch upon the king of england on the twenty third march fifteen thirty four the consistory of cardinals sat the french cardinals being absent and the final judgment on the validity of henry's marriage with catherine was given by the head of the church the cause which had stirred europe for five years was settled beyond appeal so far as the roman church could settle it catherine was henry's lawful wife and anne boleyn was proclaimed by the church to be his concubine almost on the very day that the gage was thus thrown down by the pope henry had taken similar action on his own account in the previous sitting of parliament the king had been practically acknowledged as head of the church in his own dominions and now all appeals and payments to the pope were forbidden and the bishops of england were entirely exempt from his spiritual jurisdiction and control to complete the emancipation of the country from the papacy on the twenty third march fifteen thirty four a bill the act of succession was read for the third time confirming the legality of the marriage of henry and anne and settling the succession to the crown upon their issue to the exclusion of the princess mary cranmer's divorce decision was thus ratified by statute and any person questioning in word or print the legitimacy of elizabeth's birth was adjudged guilty of high treason every subject of the king moreover was to take oath to maintain this statute on pain of death the consummation was reached for good or for evil england was free from rome and the fair woman for whose sake the momentous change had been wrought sat planning schemes of vengeance against the two proud princesses mother and daughter who still refused to bow the neck to her whom they proclaimed the usurper of their rights end of section fourteen Section 15 of The Wives of Henry the Eighth and the Parts They Played in History by Martin Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1534 through 1536. A Fleeting Triumph. Political Intrigue and the Betrayal of Anne. Part 1 in the previous pages we have witnessed the process by which a vain arrogant man naturally lustful and held by no moral or material restraint had been drawn into a position which when he took the first step that led to it he could not have contemplated 
in ordinary circumstances there would have been no insuperable difficulty in his obtaining a divorce and he probably expected little the divorce however in this case involved the question of a change in the national alliance and a shifting of the weight of england to the side of france and the emperor by his power over the pope had been able to frustrate the design not entirely on account of his family connection with catherine but rather as a question of international policy the dependent position of the pope had effectually stood in the way of the compromise always sought by france and the resistance to his will had made henry the more determined to assert himself with the natural result that the dispute had developed into religious schism there is a school of historians which credits henry personally with the far-reaching design of shaking off the ecclesiastical control of rome in order to augment the national greatness but there seems to me little evidence to support the view when once the king had bearded the papacy rather than retrace the steps he had taken and confess himself wrong it was natural that many of his subjects who conscientiously leant towards greater freedom in religion than rome would allow were prepared to carry the lesson further as the german lutherans had done but i can find no reason to believe that henry desired to initiate any change of system in the direction of freedom his aim being as he himself said simply to make himself pope as well as king within his own realm even that position as we have seen in the aforegoing chapters was only reached gradually under the incentive of opposition and by the aid of stouter hearts and clearer brains than his own and if henry could have had his way about the marriage as he conceivably might have done on many occasions during the struggle by a very slight change in the circumstances there would have been so far as he personally was concerned no reformation in england at the time one of the most curious phases in the process here described is the deterioration notable in henry's character as the ecclesiastical and moral restraints that influenced him were gradually cast aside we have seen him as a kind and courteous husband not more immoral than other men of his age and station a father whose love for his children was intense and a cultured gentleman of a headstrong but not unlovable character resistance to his will had touched his pride and hardened his heart until at the period which we have now reached fifteen thirty four we see him capable of brutal and insulting treatment of his wife and elder daughter of which any gentleman would be ashamed on the other hand the attitude of catherine and mary was exactly that best calculated to drive to fury a conceited overbearing man loving his supreme power as henry did it was of course heroic and noble of the two ladies to stand upon their undoubted rights as they did but if catherine by adopting a religious life had consented to a divorce the degree of nullity would not have been pronounced her own position would have been recognized her daughter's legitimacy saved and the separation from rome at least deferred if not prevented there was no such deterioration in anne's character as in that of henry for it was bad from the first and consistently remained so her ambition was the noblest trait in her nature and she served it with a petty personal malignity against those who seemed to stand in her way that goes far to deprive her of the pity that otherwise would go out to her in her own martyrdom at the hands of the fleshly tyrant whose evil nature she had been so greatly instrumental in developing it was undoubtedly to anne's prompting 
that the ungenerous treatment of the princess mary was due a treatment that aroused the indignation even of those to whom its execution was entrusted henry was deeply attached to his daughter but it touched his pride for her to refuse to submit without protest to his behest when norfolk told him of the attitude of the princess on her being taken to hatfield to attend upon elizabeth he decided to bring his parental authority to bear upon her personally and decided to see her but anne quote, considering the easiness or rather levity of the king and that the great beauty and goodness of the princess might overcome his displeasure with her and moved by her virtues and his fatherly pity for her be induced to treat her better and restore her title to her sent cromwell and other messengers posting after the king to prevent him at any cost from seeing or speaking to the princess End quote. when henry arrived at hatfield and saw his baby daughter elizabeth the elder princess begged to be allowed to salute him the request was not granted but when the king mounted his horse in the courtyard mary stood upon a terrace above to see him the king was informed of her presence or saw her by chance and as she caught his eye she threw herself upon her knees in an attitude of prayer whereupon the father touched his bonnet and bowed low and kindly to the daughter he was wronging so bitterly he explained afterwards that he avoided speaking to her as she was so obstinate with him thanks to her spanish blood when the french ambassador mentioned her kindly during the conversation he noted that henry's eyes filled with tears and that he could not refrain from praising her but for anne's jealousy for her own offspring it is probable that mary's legitimacy would have been established by act of parliament as cromwell at this time was certainly in favor of it but anne was ever on the watch especially to arouse henry's anger by hinting that mary was looking to foreigners for counsel as indeed she was it was this latter element in which danger principally lurked catherine naturally appealed to her kin for support and all through her trouble it was this fact joined with her firm refusal to acknowledge henry's supreme power that steeled her husband's heart but for the king's own daughter and undoubted born subject to act in the same way made her what her mother never had been a dangerous centre around which the disaffected elements might gather the old nobility as we have seen were against anne and henry quite understood the peril of having in his own family a person who commanded the sympathies of the strongest foreign powers in europe as well as the most influential elements in england he angrily told the marquis of exeter that it was only confidence in the emperor that made mary so obstinate but that he was not afraid of the emperor and would bring the girl to her senses and then he went on to threaten exeter himself if he dared to communicate with her the same course was soon afterwards taken with norfolk who as well as his wife was forbidden to see the princess although he certainly had shown no desire to extend much leniency to her the treatment of catherine was even more atrocious though in her case it was probably more the king's irritated pride than his fears that was the incentive when the wretched elizabeth barton the nun of kent was prosecuted for her crazy prophecies against the king every possible effort was made to connect the unfortunate queen with her though unsuccessfully and the attempt to force catherine to take the oath prescribed by the new act of succession against herself and her daughter was obviously a piece of persecution and insult the commission sent to buckton to extort the new oath of allegiance to henry and to anne as queen consisted of dr lee 
the archbishop of york dr tunstall bishop of durham and the bishop of chester and the scene as described by one of the spanish servants is most curious when the demand was made that she should take the oath of allegiance to anne as queen catherine with fine scorn replied hold thy peace bishop speak to me no more these are the wiles of the devil i am queen and queen will i die by right the king can have no other wife and let this be your answer assembling her household she addressed them and told them they could not without sin swear allegiance to the king and anne in a form that would deny the supreme spiritual authority of the pope and taking counsel with her spanish chamberlain francisco felipe they settled between them that the spaniards should answer interrogatories in spanish in such a way that by a slight mispronunciation their answer could be interpreted quote, i acknowledge that the king has made himself head of the church end quote say hi acho cabeza de la iglesia whereas the commissioners would take it as meaning quote, that the king be created head of the church end quote say i acho cabeza de la iglesia and on the following morning the wily chamberlain and his countrymen saved appearances and their consciences at the same time by a pun but when the formal oath of allegiance to anne was demanded felipe speaking for the rest replied quote, i have taken one oath of allegiance to my lady queen catherine she still lives and during her life i know no other queen in this realm end quote lee then threatened them with punishment for refusal and a bold burgundian lackey bastian burst out with quote, let the king banish us but let him not order us to be perjurers end quote. the bishop in a rage told him to be gone at once and nothing loath bastian knelt at his mistress's feet and bade her farewell taking horse at once to ride to the coast catherine in tears remonstrated with lee for dismissing her servant without reference to her and the bishop now that his anger was calmed sent messengers to fetch bastian back which they did not do until he had reached london this fresh indignity aroused catherine's friends both in england and abroad the emperor had already remonstrated with the english ambassador on the reported cruel treatment of the queen and her daughter and henry now endeavored to justify himself in a long letter june 1534 as for the queen he said she was being treated quote, in everything to the best that can be devised whom we do order and entertain as we think most expedient and as to us seemeth prudent and the like also of our daughter the lady mary for we think it not meet that any person should prescribe unto us how we should order our own daughter we being her natural father End quote. he expressed himself greatly hurt that the emperor should think him capable of acting unkindly notwithstanding that the lady catherine quote, hath very disobediently behaved herself towards us as well as contemning and setting at naught our laws and statutes as in many other ways End quote. just lately he continues he had sent three bishops to exhort her in most loving fashion to obey the law and quote, she hath in most ungodly obstinate and inobedient wise wilfully resisted set at naught and contemned our laws and ordinances so if we would administer to her any rigor or extremity she were undoubtedly within the extreme danger of our laws End quote. the blast of persecution swept over the land the oaths demanded by the new statutes were stubbornly resisted by many fisher and more as learned and noble as any men in the land were sent to the tower april fifteen thirty four to be entrapped 
and done to death a year later throughout the country the commissioners with plenary powers were sent to administer the new oaths and those citizens who cavilled at taking them were treated as traitors to the king but all this did not satisfy anne whilst catherine and mary remained recalcitrant and unpunished for the same offence henry was in dire fear however of some action of the emperor in enforcement of the papal excommunication against him and his kingdom which according to the catholic law he had forfeited by the pope's ban francis willing as he was to oppose the emperor dared not expose his own kingdom to excommunication by siding with henry and the latter was statesman enough to see as indeed was cromwell that extreme measures against mary would turn all christendom against him and probably prove the last unbearable infliction that would drive his own people to aid a foreign invasion so although anne sneered at the king's weakness as she called it and eagerly anticipated his projected visit to francis during which she would remain regent in england and be able to wreak her wicked will on the young princess the king held by political fear and probably too by some fatherly regard refused to be nagged by his wife into the murder of his daughter and even relinquished the meeting with francis rather than leave england with anne in power in the meanwhile catherine's health grew worse henry told the french ambassador in january soon after suffolk's attempt to administer the first oath to her that quote, she was dropsical and could not live long end quote. and his enemies were ready with the suggestion which was probably unfounded that she was being poisoned she shut herself up in her own chamber and refused to eat the food prepared by the new servants what little food she took being cooked in her own room by her one maid early in the summer may she was removed from buckton to kimbolton castle within the miasmic influence of the fens and there was no attempt to conceal the desire on the part of the king and those who had brought him to this pass that catherine should die for by that means alone it seemed could foreign intervention and civil war be averted catherine herself was as we have seen full of suspicion in march chapus reported that she had sent a man to london to procure some old wine for her as she refused to drink the wine provided for her use they were trying he said to give her artificial dropsy two months later just after the stormy scene when lee and tunstall had endeavored to extort from the queen the oath to the new act of succession chapus in hot indignation suddenly appeared at richmond where the king was to protest against such treatment henry was intensely annoyed and offended and refused to see the ambassador he was master he said in his own realm and it was no good coming to him with such remonstrances no wonder that chapus concluded quote, everybody fears some ill turn will be done to the queen seeing the rudeness to which she is daily subjected both in deeds and words especially as the concubine has said that she will not cease till she has got rid of her and as the prophecies say that one queen of england is to be burnt she hopes it will be catherine End quote. early in june catherine urged strongly that chapus should travel to kimbolton to see her alleging the bad condition of her health as a reason the king and cromwell believed that her true object in desiring an interview was to devise plans with her nephew's ambassador for obtaining the enforcement of the papal censure which would have meant the subversion of henry's power and for weeks chapus begged for permission to see her in vain ladies were not to be trusted cromwell told him 
whilst fresh commissioners were sent one after the other to extort by force if necessary the oath of catherine's lady attendants to the act of succession much to the queen's distress at length tired of waiting the ambassador told cromwell that he was determined to start at once which he did two days later on the sixteenth july with a train of sixty horsemen his own household and spaniards resident in england he rode through london towards the eastern counties ostensibly on a religious pilgrimage to our lady of walsingham riding through the leafy lanes of hertfordshire in the full summer tide solaced by music minstrelsy and the quaint antics of chapus's fool the party were surprised on the second day of their journey to see gallop past them on the road stephen vaughan one of the king's officers who spoke spanish and later when they had arrived within a few miles of kimbolton they were met by the same man accompanied this time by a humble servitor of catherine bringing to the pilgrims wine and provisions in abundance but also the ill news that the king had ordered that chapus was to be forbidden access to the queen the ambassador was exceedingly indignant he did not wish to offend the king he said but having come so far and being now in the immediate neighborhood he would not return unsuccessful without an effort to obtain a more authoritative decision early the next morning one of catherine's old officers came to chapus and repeated the prohibition begging him not even to pass through the village lest the king should take it ill other messages passed but all to the same effect poor catherine herself sent secret word that she was as thankful for chapus's journey as if it had been successful and hinted that it would be a consolation to her if some of her countrymen could at least approach the castle needless to say that the spaniards gathered beneath the walls of the castle and chatted gallantly across the moat to the ladies upon the terraces and some indeed including the jester are asserted to have found their way inside the castle where they were regaled heartily and the fool played some of the usual tricks of his motley chapus in high dungeon returned by another road to london without attempting to complete his pilgrimage to walsingham secretly spied upon as he was the whole way by the king's envoy vaughan tell cromwell he said to the latter as he discovered himself on the outskirts of london quote, that i should have judged it more honourable if the king and he had informed me of his intention before i left london so that all the world should not have been acquainted with a proceeding which i refrained from characterising but the queen he continued nevertheless had cause to thank him cromwell since the rudeness shown to her would now be so patent that it could not well be denied End quote henry and cromwell had good reason to fear foreign machinations to their detriment the emperor and francis were in ominous negotiations for the king of france could not afford to break with the papacy the rising of kildar in ireland was known to have the sympathy if not the aid of spain and it was felt throughout christendom that the emperor must sooner or later give force to the papal sentence against england to avoid the utter loss of prestige which would follow if the ban of rome was after all seen to be utterly innocuous a sympathetic english lord told chapus secretly that cromwell had ridiculed the idea of the emperors attacking england for his subjects would not put up with a consequent loss of trade but if he did continued cromwell quote, the death of catherine and mary would put an end to all the trouble end quote. chapus told his informant for cromwell's behoof that if any harm was done to either of the ladies the emperor would have the greater cause for quarrel in the autumn 
mary fell seriously ill she had been obliged to follow the bastard elizabeth against her will forever intriguing cleverly to avoid humiliation to herself but the long struggle against such odds broke down her health and henry who in his heart of hearts could hardly condemn his daughter's stubbornness so like his own softened to the extent of his sending his favorite physician dr butts to visit her a greater concession was to allow catherine's two medical men to attend the princess and permission was given to catherine herself to see her but under conditions which rendered the concession nugatory the queen wrote a pathetic letter in spanish to cromwell praying that mary might be permitted to come and stay with her it will half cure her she urged as a small boon henry had consented that the sick girl should be sent to a house at no great distance from kimbleton alas urged catherine if it be only a mile away i cannot visit her i beseech that she be allowed to come to where i am i will answer for her security with my life but cromwell or his master was full of suspicion of imperial plots for the escape of mary to foreign soil and catherine's maternal prayer remained unheard the unhappy mother tried again soon afterwards to obtain access to her sick daughter by means of chapus she besought for charity's sake that the king would allow her to attend mary with her own hands you shall also tell his highness that there is no need for any other person but myself to nurse her i will put her in my own bed where i sleep and will watch her when needful when chapus saw the king with this pathetic message henry was less arrogant than usual Quote, he wished to do his best for his daughter's health but he must be careful of his own honor and interests which would be jeopardized if mary were conveyed abroad or if she escaped as she might easily do if she were with her mother for he had some suspicion that the emperor had a design to get her away End quote. henry threw all the blame for mary's obstinacy upon catherine who he knew was in close and constant touch with his opponents in the fear he expressed that the emperor and his friends in england would try to spirit mary across the sea to flanders where indeed she might have been made a thorn in her father's side were perfectly well founded and these plans were at the time the gravest peril that threatened henry in england cruel therefore as his actions towards his daughter may seem it was really prompted by pressing considerations of his own safety apart from this desire to keep mary away from foreign influence working against him through her mother henry exhibited frequent signs of tenderness towards his elder daughter much to anne's dismay in may fifteen thirty four for instance he sent her a gentle message to the effect that he hoped she would obey him and that in such case her position would be preserved but the girl was proud and not unnaturally resentful and sent back a haughty answer to what she thought was an attempt to entrap her to her foreign friend she said that she believed her father meant to poison her but that she cared little she was sure of going to heaven and was only sorry for her mother in the meanwhile anne's influence over the king was weakening she saw the gathering clouds from all parts of christendom ready to launch their lightning upon her head and ruin upon england for her sake and her temper never good became intolerable henry having had his way was now face to face with the threatening consequences and could ill brook snappish petulance from the woman for whom he had brought himself to brave the world as usual with weak men he pitied himself sincerely and looked around for comfort finding none from anne francis eldest son of the church and most christian king 
was far from being the genial ally he once had been now that henry was excommunicate the german protestant princes even stood apart and rejected henry's approaches for an alliance to the detriment of their own suzerain and worst of all the english lords of the north hussey dacre and the rest of them were in close conspiracy with the imperialists for an armed rising aided from abroad which if successful would make short work of henry and his anti-papal policy in return for all this danger the king could only look at the cross discontented woman by his side who apparently was as incapable of bearing him a son as catherine had been for some months in the spring of fifteen thirty four anne had endeavored to retain her hold upon him by saying that she was again with child and during the royal progress in the midland counties in the summer henry was more attentive than he had been to the woman he still hoped might bear him a son although her shrewish temper sorely tried him and all around her at length however the truth had to be told and henry's hopes fled and his eyes again turned elsewhere for solace end of section fifteen section sixteen of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain fifteen thirty four through fifteen thirty six a fleeting triumph political intrigue and the betrayal of anne part two anne knew that her position was unstable and her husband's open flirtation with a lady of the court drove her to fury presuming upon her former influence she imperiously attempted to have her new rival removed from the proximity of the king henry flared up at this and let anne know as brutally as language could put it that the days of his complacence with her were over and that he regretted having done so much for her sake who the king's new lady love was is not certain chapus calls her quote, a very beautiful and adroit young lady for whom his love is daily increasing whilst the credit and insolence of the concubine i e anne decreases End quote. that the new favorite was supported by the aristocratic party that opposed anne and the religious changes is evident from chapus's remark that quote, there is some good hope that if this love of the kings continues the affairs of the queen catherine and the princess will prosper for the young lady is greatly attached to them End quote. anne and her family struggled to keep their footing but when henry had once plucked up courage to shake off the trammels he had all a weak man's violence and obstinacy in following his new course one of princess mary's household came to tell chapus in october that quote, the king had turned lady rochford and sister-in-law out of the court because she had conspired with the concubine by hook or by crook to get rid of the young lady End quote. the rise of the new favorite immediately changed the attitude of the courtiers towards mary quote, on wednesday before leaving the moor she mary was visited by all the ladies and gentlemen regardless of the annoyance of anne the day before yesterday october twenty second the princess was at richmond with the brat garce i e elizabeth and the lady anne came to see her daughter accompanied by the dukes of norfolk and suffolk and others all of whom went and saluted the princess mary with some of the ladies which was quite a new thing End quote. the death of pope clement and the advent of cardinal farnese as paul the third known to be not too well affected towards the emperor 
seemed at this time to offer a chance of the reconciliation of england with the papacy and the aristocratic party in henry's councils hoped now that the king had grown tired of his second wife that they might influence him by a fresh appeal to his sensuality france also took a hand in the game in its new aspect the aim being to obtain the hand of mary for the dauphin to whom it will be recollected she had been betrothed as a child with the legitimization of the princess and the return of henry to the fold of the church with a french alliance this would of course have involved the repudiation of anne with the probable final result of a french domination of england after the king's death the admiral of france chabot de Bion, came to england late in the autumn to forward some such arrangement as that described and incidentally to keep alive henry's distrust of the emperor whilst threatening him that the dauphin would marry a spanish princess if the king of england held aloof but though anne's influence over her husband was gone cromwell the strong spirit was still by his side and reconciliation with the papacy in any form would have meant ruin to him and the growing interests that he represented even if henry had now been inclined to yield to the papacy of which there is no evidence cromwell had gone too far to recede and when parliament met in november the act of supremacy was passed giving the force of statute law to the independence of the church of england chabot de brion's mission was therefore doomed to failure from the first and the envoy took no pains to conceal his resentment towards anne the origin of all the trouble that dislocated the european balance of power there was much hollow feasting and insincere professions of friendship between the two kings but it was clear now to the frenchman that with anne or without her henry would bow his neck no more to the papacy and it was to the princess mary that the catholic elements looked for a future restoration of the old state of things a grand ball was given at court in chabot's honor the day before he left london and the dignified french envoy sat in a seat of state by the side of anne looking at the dancing suddenly without apparent reason she burst into a violent fit of laughter the admiral of france already in no very amiable mood frowned angrily and turning to her said are you laughing at me madame or what after she had laughed to her heart's content she excused herself to him by saying that she was laughing because the king had told her that he was going to fetch the admiral's secretary to be introduced to her and on the way the king had met a lady who had made him forget everything else though henry would not submit to the papacy at the charming of francis he was loath to forego the french alliance and proposed a marriage between the younger french prince the duke of angoulême and elizabeth and this was under discussion during the early months of fifteen thirty five but it is clear that although the daughter of the second marriage was to be held legitimate anne was to gain no accession of strength by the new alliance for the french flouted her almost openly and henry was already contemplating a divorce from her we are told by chapus that he only desisted from the idea when a counsellor told him that quote, if he separated from the concubine he would have to recognize the validity of his first marriage and worst of all submit to the pope End quote. who the counsellor was that gave this advice is not stated but we may fairly assume that it was cromwell who soon found a shorter and for him a safer way of ridding his master of a wife who had tired him and could bear him no son a french alliance with a possible reconciliation with rome in some form would not have suited cromwell 
for it would have meant a triumph for the aristocratic party at henry's court and the overthrow of the men who had led henry to defy the papacy if the aristocratic party could influence henry by means of the nameless new young lady the bolins and reformers could fight with the same weapons and early in february fifteen thirty five we find chapus writing quote, the young lady formerly in the king's good graces is so no longer and has been succeeded by a cousin german of the concubine the daughter of the present governess of the princess End quote. this new mistress whilst her little reign lasted worked well for anne and cromwell but in the meantime the conspiracy amongst the nobles grew and strengthened throughout the upper classes in the country a feeling of deep resentment was felt at the treatment of mary and there was hardly a nobleman except anne's father and brother who was not pledged to take up arms in her cause and against the religious changes cromwell's answer to the disaffection of which he was quite cognizant was the closer keeping than ever of the royal ladies with threats of their death if they were the cause of a revolt and the stern enforcement of the oath prescribed by the act of supremacy the martyrdom of the london carthusians for refusing to take the oath of supremacy and shortly afterwards the sacrifice of the venerable bishop fisher sir thomas more and catherine's priest abel and the renewed severity towards her favorite confessor friar forrest soon also to be martyred with atrocious cruelty shocked and horrified england and aroused the strongest reprobation in france and rome as well as in the dominions of the emperor destroying for a time all hope of a french alliance and any lingering chance of a reconciliation with rome during henry's life all catholic aspirations both at home and abroad centered for the next year or so in the princess mary and her father's friendship was shunned even by francis except upon impossible conditions henry's throne indeed was tottering his country was riddled with disaffection and dislike of his proceedings the new pope had forged the final thunderbolt of rome enjoining all christian potentates to execute the sentence of the church though as yet the fiat was held back at the instance of the emperor the dread of war and the general unrest arising from this state of things had well nigh destroyed the english oversea trade the harvest was a bad one and food was dear ecclesiastics throughout the country were whispering to their flocks curses of nan bullen for whose sake the church of christ was being split in twain and its ministers persecuted and it is true was now quite a secondary personage as a political factor but upon her unpopular head was heaped the blame for everything the wretched woman fully conscious that she was the general scapegoat could only pray for a son whose advent might save her at the eleventh hour for failing him she knew that she was doomed in the meanwhile the struggle was breaking catherine's heart for seven years she had fought as hard against her fate as an outraged woman could she had seen that her rights her happiness were only a small stake in the game of european politics to her it seemed but righteous that her nephew the emperor should at any cost rise in indignant wrath and avenge the insult put upon his proud line and upon the papacy whose earthly champion he was by crushing the forces that had wrought the wrong but charles was held back by all sorts of considerations arising from his political position francis was forever on the lookout for a weak spot in the imperial armor the german protestant princes although quite out of sympathy with henry's matrimonial vagaries would look askance at a crusade to enforce the pope's executorial decree against england 
the french and moderate influence in the college of cardinals was strong and charles could not afford by too aggressive an action against henry to drive francis and the cardinals into closer union against imperial aims especially in the mediterranean and italy where owing to the vacancy in the duchy of milan they now mainly centred so catherine clamoured in vain to those whose sacred duty she thought it was to vindicate her honour and the faith both she and her daughter at her instigation wrote burning letters to the pope and the imperial agents urging beseeching exhorting the catholic powers to activity against their oppressor henry and cromwell knew all this and recognizing the dire danger that sooner or later catherine's prayer to a united christendom might launch upon england an avalanche of ruin strove as best they might to avert such a catastrophe every courier who went to the emperor from england carried alarmist rumors that catherine and mary were to be put out of the way and the ladies in a true spirit of martyrdom awaited without flinching the hour of their sacrifice cromwell himself darkly hinted that the only way out of the maze of difficulty and peril was the death of catherine and in this he was apparently right but at this distance of time it seems evident that much of the threatening talk both of the king's friends and those of the catholic church in england was intended on the one hand to drive catherine and her daughter into submission and prevent them from continuing their appeals for foreign aid and on the other to move the emperor to action against henry so in the welter of political interests catherine wept and raged fruitlessly the papal decree directing the execution of the deprivation of henry though signed by the pope was still held back for charles could not afford to invade england himself and was determined to give no excuse for francis to do so though there is no known ground for the then prevailing belief that henry was aiding nature in hastening the death of his first wife the long unequal combat against invincible circumstances was doing its work upon a constitution never robust and by the late autumn of fifteen thirty five the stout-hearted daughter of isabel the catholic was known to be sick beyond surgery in december fifteen thirty five chapus had business with cromwell and during the course of their conversation the latter told him that he had just sent a messenger to inform the king of catherine's serious illness this was the first that chapus had heard of it and he at once requested leave to go and see her to which cromwell replied that he might send a servant to inquire as to her condition but that the king must be consulted before he chapus himself could be allowed to see her as chapus was leaving whitehall a letter was brought to him from catherine's physician saying that the queen's illness was not serious and would pass off so that unless later unfavorable news was sent chapus need not press for leave to see her two days afterwards a letter reached him from catherine herself enclosing one to the emperor she wrote in the deepest depression praying again and for the hundredth time in words that as chapu says quote, would move a stone to compassion end quote, that prompt action should be taken on behalf of herself and her daughter before the parliament could do them to death and consummate the apostasy of england it was her last heartbroken cry for help and like all those that had preceded it during the seven bitter years of catherine's penance it was unheard amidst the din of great national interests that was ringing through europe it was during the feast of christmas fifteen thirty five which henry passed at eltham that news came to chapus from de la salle that catherine had relapsed and was in grave peril the ambassador was to see the king on other business in a day or two in any case but 
this news caused him to beg cromwell to obtain for him instant leave to go to the queen there would be no difficulty about it the secretary replied but chapus must see the king first at greenwich whither he would go to meet him the ambassador found henry in the tilt yard all amiability with a good deal of overdone cordiality the king walked up and down the lists arm in arm with chapus the while he reverted to the proposal of a new friendship and alliance with the emperor the french he said were up to their old pranks especially since the duke of milan had died but he should at last be forced into an intimate alliance with them unless the emperor would let bygones be bygones and make friends with him chapus was cool and non-committal he feared he said that it was only a device to make the french jealous and after much word bandying between them the ambassador flatly asked henry what he wanted the emperor to do i want him replied the king not only to cease to support madame catherine and my daughter but also to get the papal sentence in madame's favor revoked to this chapus replied that he saw no good reason for doing either and had no authority to discuss the point raised and as a parting shot henry told him that catherine could not live long and when she died the emperor would have no need to follow the matter up when chapus had taken his leave the duke of suffolk came after him and brought him back to the king who told him that news had just reached him that catherine was dying chapus might go and see her but he would hardly find her alive her death moreover would do away with all cause for dissension between the emperor and himself a request that the princess mary might be allowed to see her dying mother was at first met with a flat refusal and after chapus's remonstrance by a temporizing evasion which was as bad so that mary saw her mother no more in life chapus instantly took horse and sped to london and then northward to kimbleton anxious to reach the queen before she breathed her last for he was told that for days the patient had eaten and drank nothing and slept hardly at all it took chapus two days of hard travel over the miry roads before he reached kimbleton on the morning of the second january fifteen thirty six he found that the queen's dearest friend lady willoughby dona maria de sarmiento had preceded him by a day and was with her mistress she had prayed in vain for license to come before and even now catherine's stern guardian bedingfield asked in vain to see lady willoughby's permit which she probably had not got she had come in great agitation and fear for according to her own account she had fallen from her horse and had suffered other adventures on her way but she braved everything to receive the last sigh of the queen whose girlhood's friend she had been bedingfield looked askance at the arrival of these folks and at chapus's first interview with catherine he the chamberlain and vaughan who understood spanish were present and listened to all that was said it was a consolation said the queen that if she could not recover she might die in the presence of her nephew's ambassador and not unprepared he tried to cheer her with encouraging promises that the king would let her be removed to another house and would accede to other requests made in her favor but catherine only smiled sadly and bade him rest after his long journey she saw the ambassador again alone later in the day and spoke at length with him as she did on each day of the four that he stayed her principal discourse being of the misfortune that had overtaken england by reason of the long delay of the emperor in enforcing justice to her after four days' stay of chapus catherine seemed better and the apothecary de la Salle, 
gave it as his opinion that she was out of immediate danger she even laughed a little at the antics of chapus's fool who was called in to amuse her and reassured by the apparent improvement the ambassador started on his leisurely return to london on the second day after his departure soon after midnight the queen asked if it was near day and repeated the question several times at short intervals afterwards when at length the watchers asked her the reason for her impatience for the dawn she replied that it was because she wished to hear mass and receive the holy sacrament the aged dominican bishop of landoff jorge diateca volunteered to celebrate at four o'clock in the morning but catherine refused and quoted the latin authorities to prove that it should not be done before dawn with the first struggling of the gray light of morning the offices of the church for the dying were solemnly performed whilst catherine prayed fervently for herself for england and for the man who had so cruelly wronged her when all was done but the administration of extreme unction she bade her physician write a short memorandum of a few gifts she craved for her faithful servants for she knew and said that by the law of england a married woman could make no valid will the testament is in the form of a supplication to henry and is remarkable as the dictation of a woman within a few hours of her death each of her servants is remembered a hundred pounds to her principal spanish lady blanche de vargas twenty pounds to mistress darrell for her marriage his wages and forty pounds were to be paid to francisco felipe the groom of the chambers twenty pounds to each of the three lackeys including the burgundian bastion and like bequests one by one to each of the little household not even the sum she owed for a gown was forgotten for her daughter she craved her furs and the gold chain and cross she had brought from spain all that was left of her treasures after anne's greed had been satisfied and for the convent of observant franciscans where she begged for sepulchre quote, my gowns which he the king holdeth end quote it is a sad little document compliance with which was for the most part meanly evaded by henry even francisco felipe quote, getting nothing and returning poor to his own country end quote. thus dignified and saintly at the second hour after midday on the eighth january fifteen thirty six catherine of aragon died unconquered as she had lived a great lady to the last sacrificed in death as she had been in life to the opportunism of high politics in manos tuas domine commendo spiritum meum she murmured with her last breath from man she had received no mercy and she turned to a gentler judge with confidence and hope as usual in such cases as hers the people about her whispered of poison and when the body was hastily seared and lapped in lead quote, by the candle-maker of the house a servant and one companion end quote, not even the queen's physician was allowed to be present but the despised candle-maker who really seems to have been a skilled embalmer secretly told the bishop of landoff who waited at the door that all the body was sound except the heart which was black and hideous with a black excrescence which clung closely to the outside on which report dr de la saw unhesitatingly opined that his mistress had died of poison the news the joyous news sped quickly to greenwich and within four and twenty hours on saturday ninth january henry heard with exultation that the incubus was raised from his shoulders god be praised was his first exclamation 
we are free from all suspicion of war now he continued he would be able to manage the french better they would be obliged to dance to his tune for fear he should join the emperor which would be easy now that the cause for disagreement had gone thus heartlessly and haggling meanly over his wife's little bequests even that to her daughter henry greeted the death of the woman he once had seemed to love he snivelled a little when he read the affecting letter to him that she had dictated in her last hour but the word went forth that on the next day sunday the court should be at its gayest and henry and anne in gala garb of yellow finery went to mass with their child in full state to the sound of trumpets after dinner the king could not restrain his joy even within the bounds of decency entering the hall in which the ladies were dancing he pirouetted about in the exuberance of his heart and then calling for his fair little daughter elizabeth he proudly carried her in his arms from one courtier to another to be petted and praised there was only one drop of gall in the cup for the bolins and they made no secret of it namely that the princess mary had not gone to accompany her mother if anne had only known it her last chance of keeping at the king's side as his wife was the survival of catherine and lamentation instead of rejoicing should have been her greeting of the news of her rival's death henry in fact was tired of anne already and the cabal of nobles against her and the religious system she represented was stronger than ever but the repudiation of his second wife on any excuse during the life of the first would have necessitated the return of catherine as the king's lawful spouse with all the consequences that such a change would entail and this henry's pride as well as his inclinations would never permit now that catherine was dead anne was doomed to speedy ruin by one instrumentality or another and before many weeks the cruel truth came home to her catherine was buried not in such a convent as she had wished for henry said there was not one in england but in peterborough cathedral within fifteen miles of kimbleton the honours paid to her corpse were those of a dowager princess of wales but the country folk who bordered the miry tracks through which the procession ploughed paid to the dead catherine in her funeral litter the honours they had paid her in her life parliament far away in london might order them to swear allegiance to nan bullen as queen and to her daughter as heiress of england king harry on his throne might threaten them as he did with stake and gibbet if they dared to disobey but though they bowed the head and mumbled such oaths as were dictated to them catherine to them had always been queen consort of england and mary her daughter was no bastard but true princess of wales whatever king and parliament might say end of section sixteen section seventeen of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain fifteen thirty four through fifteen thirty six a fleeting triumph political intrigue and the betrayal of anne part three all people and all interests were as if instinctively shrinking away from anne her uncle norfolk had quarrelled with her and retired from court the french were now almost as inimical as the imperialists and even the time-serving courtiers turned from the waning favourite she was no longer young and her ill temper and many anxieties had marred her good looks her gaiety and lightness of manner 
had to a great extent fled and sedate occupations reading needlework charity and devotion occupied most of her time oh for a son was all the unhappy woman could sigh in her misery for that she knew was the only thing that could save her now that catherine was dead and anne might be repudiated by her husband without the need for taking back his first discarded wife hope existed again that the prayed for son might come into the world and at the first prospect of it anne made an attempt to utilize the influence it gave her by cajoling or crushing mary into submission to the king's will the girl was desolate at her mother's death but she had her mother's proud spirit and her answers to anne's approaches were as cold and haughty as before Quote, the concubine writes chapus twenty first january fifteen thirty six has thrown out the first bait to the princess telling her by her aunt lady shelton that if she would discontinue her obstinacy and obey her father like a good girl she anne will be the best friend in the world to her and like another mother will try to obtain for her all she wants if she will come to court she shall be exempt from carrying her anne's train and shall always walk by her side End quote. but obedience meant that mary should recognize cranmer's sentence against her mother the repudiation of the papal authority and her own illegitimacy and she refused the olive branch held out to her then anne changed her tone and wrote to her aunt a letter to be put into mary's way threatening the princess in her former approaches she said she had only desired to save mary out of charity it was no affair of hers she did not care but when she had the son she expected the king would show no mercy to his rebellious daughter but mary remained unmoved she knew that all catholic europe looked upon her now as the sole heiress of england and that the emperor was busy planning her escape in order that she might from the safe refuge of his dominions be used as the main instrument for the submission of england to the papacy and the destruction of henry's rule for things had turned out somewhat differently in this respect from what the king had expected the death of catherine very far from making the armed intervention of charles in england more improbable had brought it sensibly nearer for the great war storm that had long been looming between the french and spaniards in italy was now about to burst francis could no longer afford to alienate the papacy by even pretending to a friendship with the excommunicated henry whilst england might be paralyzed and all chance of a diversion against imperial arms in favor of france averted by the slight aid and subsidy by the emperor of a catholic rising in england against henry and anne on the twenty ninth january fifteen thirty six anne's last hope was crushed in the fourth month of her pregnancy she had a miscarriage which she attributed passionately to her love for the king and her pain at seeing him flirting with another woman henry showed his rage and disappointment brutally as was now his wont he had hardly spoken to anne for weeks before and when he visited her at her bedside he said that it was quite evident that god meant to deny him heirs male by her when you get up he growled in answer to the poor woman's complaints as he left her i will talk to you the lady of whom anne was jealous was probably the same that had attracted the king at the ball given to the admiral of france two months previously and had made him as anne hysterically complained Quote, forget everything else end quote. this lady was mistress jane seymour a daughter of sir john seymour of wolf hall wilts she was at the time just over twenty-five years of age 
and had been at court for some time as a maid of honor to catherine and afterwards to anne during the king's progress in the autumn of fifteen thirty five he had visited wolf hall where the daughter of the house had attracted his admiring attention apparently for the first time jane is described as possessing no great beauty being somewhat colorless as to complexion but her demeanor was sweet and gracious and the king's admiration for her at once marked her out as a fit instrument for the conservative party of nobles at court to use against anne and the political and religious policy which she represented apparently jane had no ability and none was needed in the circumstances chapus moreover suggests with unnecessary spite that in morals she was no better than she should have been on the unconvincing grounds that quote, being an englishwoman and having been so long at court whether she would not hold it a sin to still be a maid end quote. her supposed unchastity indeed is represented as being an attraction to henry quote, for he may marry her on condition that she is a maid and when he wants a divorce there will be plenty of witnesses ready to testify that she was not end quote. this however is mere detraction by a man who firmly believed that the cruelly wronged catherine whose cause he served had just been murdered by henry's orders that jane had no strength of character is plain and throughout her short reign she was merely an instrument by which politicians sought to turn the king's passion for her to their own ends the seymours were a family of good descent allied with some of the great historic houses and jane's two brothers edward and thomas were already handsome and notable figures at henry's court the elder sir edward seymour especially having accompanied the showy visits of the duke of suffolk cardinal wolsey and the king himself to france so far as can be ascertained however the brothers prompt as they were to profit by their sister's elevation were no parties to the political intrigue of which jane was probably the unconscious tool she was carefully indoctrinated by anne's enemies especially sir nicholas carew how she was to behave she must above all profess great devotion and friendship to the princess mary to assume a mien of rigid virtue and high principles which would be likely to pique a sensual man like henry without gratifying his passion except by marriage many of the enemies of the french connection which included the great majority of the nation looked with hope towards the king's new infatuation as a means of luring back england to the comity of catholic nations and friendship with the emperor though there was still a section especially in the north of england which believed that their best interests would be served by an open rebellion in the interests of mary supported from flanders by her cousin the emperor all this was of course well known to cromwell he had been one of the first to counsel defiance of the pope but throughout he had been anxious to avoid an open quarrel with the emperor or to pledge england too closely to french interests and now that even the french had turned against anne cromwell saw that unless he himself was to be dragged down when she fell he must put the brake hard down upon the religious policy that he had initiated and make common cause with anne's enemies in a secret conference that he held with chapus at the austin friars which in future was to be his own mansion cromwell proposed a new alliance between england and the emperor which would necessarily have to be accompanied by some compromise with the pope and the recognition of mary's legitimacy he assured the imperial ambassador that norfolk suffolk and the rest of the nobles formerly attached to france were of the same opinion as himself and tried earnestly to convince his interlocutor 
that he had no sympathy with anne whom he was ready to throw overboard to save himself when charles received this news from his ambassador he took a somewhat tortuous but characteristic course he was willing to a great extent to let bygones be bygones and to forget the sufferings and perhaps the murder of his aunt catherine if henry would come to terms with the papacy and legitimize the princess mary but curiously enough he preferred that anne should remain at henry's side instead of being repudiated her marriage he reasoned was obviously invalid and any children she might have by henry would consequently be unable to interfere with mary's rights to the succession whereas if henry were to divorce anne and contract a legal marriage any son born to him would disinherit mary to this extent was charles ready to descend if he could obtain english help and money in the coming war and cromwell at all events was anxious to go quite as far to meet him he now showed ostentatious respect to the princess mary restoring to her the little gold cross that had been her mother's and of which she had been cruelly deprived condemned openly the continued execution of his own policy of spoliation of the monasteries and quarrelled both with anne and the only man now in the same boat with her archbishop cranmer who trembled in his shoes at the ruin he saw impending upon his patroness ready at any moment to turn his coat but ignorant of how to do it for cranmer however able a casuist he might be possessed little statesmanship and less courage lady exeter was the go-between who brought the imperial ambassador into the conspiracy to oust anne the time was seen to be ripening henry was already talking in secret about quote, his having been seduced into the marriage with anne by sorcery and consequently that he considered it to be null which was clearly seen by god's denying a son he thought he should be quite justified in taking another wife end quote and jane seymour's company seemed daily more necessary to his comfort sir edward seymour was made a gentleman of the privy chamber early in march and a fortnight later the marchioness of exeter reported to her friend chapus that the king who was at whitehall had sent a loving letter and a purse of gold to his new lady love the latter had been carefully schooled as to the wise course to pursue and played pewtery to perfection she kissed the royal letter fervently without opening it and then throwing herself upon her knees besought the messenger to pray the king in her name to consider that she was a gentlewoman of fair and honourable lineage and without reproach Quote, she had nothing in the world but her honour which for a thousand deaths she would not wound if the king deigned to make her a present of money she prayed it might be when she made an honourable marriage End quote. according to lady exeter's report this answer inflamed even more the king's love for jane quote, she had behaved herself in the matter very modestly he said and in order to let it be seen that his intentions and affection were honourable he intended future only to speak to her in the presence of some of her relatives End quote. cromwell moreover was turned out of a convenient apartment to which secret access could be obtained from the king's quarters in order that sir edward seymour now viscount beauchamp and his wife should be lodged there and facility thus given for the king's virtuous billing and cooing with jane whilst saving the proprieties when it was too late even anne attempted to desert her own political party and to rally to the side of the emperor whether because she understood the indulgent way in which the latter now regarded her union with henry 
or whether from mere desperation at the ruin impending it is not easy to say but the conspiracy for her destruction had already gone too far when the emperor's diplomatic instructions came to his ambassador it was understood now at court that the king intended somehow to get rid of his doubtful wife and marry another woman and cromwell with a hypocritical smile behind his hand whispered to chapus that though the king might divorce anne he would live more virtuously in the future when the imperial ambassador with his master's friendly replies to henry's advances saw the king at greenwich on the eighteenth april fifteen thirty six the court was all smiles for him and anne desperately clutched at the chance of making friends with him chapus was cool and declined to go and salute her as he was invited to do he was ready as he said to hold a candle to the devil or a hundred of them if his master's interests would thereby be served but he knew that anne was doomed and notwithstanding his master's permission he made no attempt to conciliate her all the courtiers were watching to see how he would treat her on this the first occasion that they had met since catherine's death as anne passed into the chapel to high mass she looked eagerly around to greet her enemy where was he in the chapel she knew and to sit close by her side but he was nowhere to be seen he was in fact standing behind the open door by which she entered but determined not to be balked she turned completely round and made him a profound curtsy which as he was bound to do he returned in anne's rooms afterwards where the king and the other ambassadors dined chapus was not present much to the concubine's chagrin but the princess mary and her friends in the conspiracy were suspicious and jealous even of the bow that had been exchanged under such adverse circumstances in the chapel anne at dinner coarsely abused the king of france and strove her utmost to lead people to think that she too was hand in glove with the imperialists as her enemies were whilst henry was graciousness itself to chapus until he came to close quarters and heard that the emperor was determined to drive a hard bargain and force his english uncle to eat a large piece of humble pie before he could be taken to his bosom again then henry hectored and vaunted like the bully that he was and upon cromwell fell his ill humor for having as henry thought been too pliant with the imperialists and for the next week cromwell was ill and in disgrace submission to the pope to the extent that charles demanded was almost impossible now both in consequence of henry's own vanity and because the vast revenues and estates of the monasteries had in many cases replenished the king's exchequer or had endowed his nobles and favorites catholics though many of them were a surrender of these estates and revenues would have been resisted even if such had been possible to the death by those who had profited by the spoliation and unless the pope and the emperor were willing to forget much the hope of reconciling england with the church was an impossible dream the great nobles who had battened upon the spoils especially norfolk themselves took fright at the emperor's uncompromising demands and tried to play off france against charles during cromwell's short disgrace the secretary saw that if the friends of france once more obtained the control over henry's fickle mind the revolutionary section of the catholic party in favor of mary and the imperial connection would carry all before them and that in the flood of change cromwell and all his works would certainly be swept away if anne could be got rid of and the king married to mistress seymour jointly with the adoption of a moderate policy of compromise with rome and the emperor all might be well and cromwell might retain the helm 
but either an uncompromising persistence in the open protestant defiance with probably a french alliance against the emperor or on the other hand an armed catholic revolution in england subsidized from flanders would have been inevitable ruin to cromwell and then must be destroyed at any cost and the king be won to the side of the man who would devise a means of doing it but how a repudiation or formal divorce on the ground of invalidity would of course have been easy but it would have been too scandalous it would also have convicted the king of levity and above all have bastardized his second daughter leaving him with no child that the law of the realm regarded as legitimate henry himself as we have seen talked about his having been drawn into the marriage by sorcery and ardently desired to get rid of his wife his intercourse with jane seymour who was being cleverly coached by anne's enemies and mary's friends plainly indicated that marriage was intended but it was the intriguing brain of cromwell that devised the only satisfactory way in which the king's caprice and his own interests could be served in the treatment of anne appearances must at any cost be saved for henry he must not appear to blame whatever happened cromwell must be able for his own safety to drag down anne's family and friends at the same time that she was ruined and the affair must be so managed that some sort of reconciliation could be patched up with the emperor whilst norfolk and the french adherents were thrust into the background cromwell pondered well on the problem as he lay in bed sick with annoyance at henry's rough answer to the emperor's terms and thus he hit upon the scheme that alone would serve the aims he had in view the idea gave him health and boldness again and just as henry under norfolk's influence was smiling upon the french ambassador cromwell appeared once more before his master after his five days absence what passed at their interview can only be guessed by the light of the events that followed it is quite possible that cromwell did not tell the king of his designs against anne but only that he had discovered a practice of treason against him but whether the actual words were pronounced or not henry must have understood before he signed and gave to cromwell the secret instrument demanded of him that evil was intended to the woman of whom he had grown tired it was a patent dated the twenty fourth april appointing the lord chancellor audley and a number of nobles including the duke of norfolk and anne's father the earl of wiltshire together with the judges a commission to inquire into any intended treasonable action no matter by whom committed and to hold a special court to try the persons accused with this instrument in his pocket cromwell held at will the lives of those whom he sought to destroy anne as we have seen had loved and courted the admiration of men even as her daughter elizabeth afterwards did to an extent that bordered upon mania her manners were free and somewhat hysterical and her reputation before marriage had been more than doubtful but the stern act of succession which in fifteen thirty four made it treason to question the legitimacy of anne's daughter barred all accusations against her except in respect to actions after elizabeth's birth cromwell was well served by spies even in anne's chamber for her star was visibly paling and people feared her vengeance little and not many days passed before the secretary had in his hand testimony enough to strike the first blow it was little enough according to our present notions of evidence and at another time would have passed unnoticed a young fellow of humble origin named mark smeaton had by anne's influence 
been appointed one of henry's grooms of the chamber in consequence of his skill as a lute player anne herself who was a fine musician and composer delighted in listening to mark's performances and doubtless as was her wont she challenged his admiration because he was a man a contemporary who repeated the tattle of the court says that she had fallen in love with the lute player and had told him so and that she had aroused the jealousy of her rival admirers norries brereton and others by her lavish gifts and open favor to mark smeaton according to this story she endeavored to appease the former by renewed flirting with them and to silence mark's discontent by large gifts of money others of her courtiers especially sir thomas percy indignant that an upstart like mark should be treated better than themselves insulted and picked quarrels with the musician and it is evident that anne at the very time that cromwell was spreading his nets for her was hard put to it to keep the peace between a number of idle jealous young men whose admiration she had sought for pastime on the twenty ninth april mark smeaton was standing sulkily in the deep embrasure of a window in anne's chamber in the palace of greenwich the queen asked him why he was so out of humor he replied that it was nothing that mattered she evidently knew the real reason for his gloom for she reminded him that he could not expect her to speak to him as if he were a nobleman no no said mark a look suffices for me and so fare you well sir thomas percy seems to have heard this little speech and have conveyed it with many hints of mark's sudden prosperity to cromwell it is hardly three months since mark came to court and though he is only a hundred pounds a year from the king and has received no more than a third he has just bought three horses that have cost him five hundred ducats as well as very rich arms and fine liveries for his servants for the may-day ridings such as no gentleman at court has been able to buy and many are wondering where he gets the money mark smeaton was a safe quarry for he had no influential friends and it suited cromwell's turn to begin with him to build up his case against anne End of section seventeen. Section 18 of The Wives of Henry the Eighth and the Parts They Played in History by Martin Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1534 through 1536. A Fleeting Triumph. Political Intrigue and the Betrayal of Anne. Part 4. There was to be a May Day jousting in the tilt yard at Greenwich at which anne's brother lord rochford was the challenger and sir henry norreys was the principal defender early in the morning of the day cromwell who of course took no part in such shows went to london and asked smeaton to accompany him and dine returning in the afternoon to greenwich in time for the writings mark accepted the invitation and was taken ostensibly for dinner to a house at stepney that probably being a convenient halfway place between greenwich and westminster by water no sooner had the unsuspecting youth entered the chamber than he saw the trap into which he had fallen six armed men closed around him and cromwell's face grew grave as the secretary warned the terrified lad to confess where he had obtained so much money smeaton prevaricated and quote, then two stout young fellows were called and the secretary asked for a rope and cudgel the rope which was filled with knots was put around mark's head and twisted with the cudgel until mark cried sir secretary no more i will tell the truth the queen gave me the money 
End quote. Then, bit by bit, by threats of torture, some sort of confession incriminating Anne was wrung out of the poor wretch, though exactly what he confessed is not on record. Later, when the affair was made public, the quidnucks of London could tell the most private details of his adultery with the Queen, for Cromwell took care that such gossip should be well circulated. Whatever confession was extorted from Smeaton, it implicated not only himself, but the various gentlemen who shared with him the Queen's smiles, and was quite sufficient for Cromwell's purpose. Hurrying the unfortunate musician to the tower in the strictest secrecy, Cromwell sent his nephew, Richard, post-haste to Greenwich, with a letter divulging Smeaton's story to the king. Richard Cromwell arrived at the tilt-yard as the tournament was in progress, the king and Anne witnessing the bouts from a glazed gallery. Several versions of what then happened are given, but the most probable is that as soon as Henry had glanced at the contents of the letter and knew that Cromwell had succeeded, he abruptly rose and left the sports, starting almost immediately afterwards for London, without the knowledge of Anne. With him went a great favorite of his, Sir Henry Norris, keeper of the privy purse, who was engaged to be married to Madge Shelton, Anne's cousin, who had at one time been put forward by the Bolin interests as the king's mistress. Norris had, no doubt, flirted platonically with the queen, who had openly bidden for his admiration, but there is not an atom of evidence that their connection was a guilty one. On the way to London, the king taxed him with undue familiarity with Anne. Horror-stricken, Norris could only protest his innocence and resist all the temptations held out to him to make a clean breast of the queen's immorality. One of the party of Anne's enemies, Sir William Fitzwilliam, was also in attendance on the king, and to him was given the order to convey Norris to the tower. After the king's departure from Greenwich, Anne learnt that he had gone without a word of farewell, and that Smeaton was absent from the joust, detained in London. The poor woman's heart must have sunk with fear, for the portents of her doom were all around her. She could not cry for mercy to the flabby coward her husband, who, as usual, slunk from bearing the responsibility of his own acts, and ran away from the danger of personal appeal from those whom he wronged. Late at night, the dread news was whispered to her that Smeaton and Norris were both in the tower, and early in the morning she herself was summoned to appear before a quorum of the royal commissioners, presided over by her uncle and enemy, the Duke of Norfolk. She was rudely told that she was accused of committing adultery with Smeaton and Norris, both of whom had confessed. She cried and protested in vain that it was untrue. She was told to hold her peace, and was placed under arrest until her barge was ready and the tide served to bear her upstream to the tower. With her went a large guard of halberdiers and the Duke of Norfolk. Thinking that she was being carried to her husband at Westminster, she was composed and tranquil on the way, but when she found that the traitor's gate of the tower was her destination, her presence of mind deserted her. Sir William Kingston, one of the chief conspirators in Mary's favor and governor of the fortress, stood upon the steps under the gloomy archway to receive her, and in sign of custody took her by the arm as she ascended. Quote, I was received with greater ceremony the last time I entered here, end quote, she cried indignantly. And as the heavy gates clanged behind her and the portcullis dropped, she fell upon her knees and burst into a storm of hysterical tears. Kingston and his wife did their best to tranquilize her, 
but her passionate protestations of innocence made no impression upon them her brother lord rockford had unknown to her been a few hours before lodged in the same fortress on the hideous and utterly unsupported charge of incest with his sister and cromwell's dragnet was cast awide to bring in all those whose names were connected however loosely with that of the queen by her servants all of whom were tumbling over each other in their haste to denounce their fallen mistress sir thomas weston and william brereton with both of whom anne had been fond of bandying questionable compliments were arrested on the fourth may and on the fifth sir thomas wyatt the poet and a great friend of the king was put under guard on similar accusations with regard to wyatt there seems to have been no doubt as has been shown in an earlier chapter that some love passages had passed between him and anne before her marriage and there is contemporary assertion to support the belief that their connection had not been an innocent one but the case against him was finally dropped and he was again taken into henry's favor a proof that there was no evidence of guilt on his part since anne was queen he is asserted to have begged henry not to contract the marriage and subsequently to have reminded him that he had done so confessing after her arrest that anne had been his mistress before she married the king the wretched woman babbled hysterically without cessation in her chamber in the tower all her distraught ravings being carefully noted and repeated by the ladies mostly her personal enemies who watched her night and day artful leading questions being put to her to tempt her to talk the more she was imprudent in her speech at the best of times but now in a condition of acute hysteria she served the interests of her enemies to the full dragging into her discourse the names of the gentlemen who were accused and repeating their risky conversations with her which were now twisted to their worst meaning at one time she would only desire death then she would make merry with a good dinner or supper chatting and jesting only to break down into hysterical laughter and tears in the midst of her merriment anon she would affect to believe that her husband was but trying her constancy and pleaded with all her heart to be allowed to see him again but he once having broken the shackles was gaily amusing himself in gallant guise with mistress seymour who was lodged for appearance sake in the house of her mentor sir nicholas carew a few miles from london but within easy reach of a horseman anne in her sober moments must have known that she was doomed she hoped much from cranmer almost the only friend of hers now not in prison but cranmer however strong in counsel was a weak reed in combat and hastened to save himself at the cost of the woman upon whose shoulders he had climbed to greatness the day after anne's arrest cranmer wrote to the king quote, a letter of consolation yet wisely making no apology for her but acknowledging how divers of the lords had told him of certain of her faults which he said he was sorry to hear and concluded desiring that the king would continue his love to the gospel lest it should be thought that it was for her sake only that he had favored it End quote. before he had time to despatch the letter the timorous archbishop was summoned across the river to westminster to answer certain disquieting questions of the commissioners who informed him of the evidence against the queen and in growing alarm for himself and his cause he hurried back to lambeth without uttering a word in favor of the accused whose guilt he accepted without question thenceforward 
Anne's enemies worked their way unchecked, even her father being silenced by fear for himself. For Cromwell's safety, it was necessary that none of the accused should escape who later might do him injury, and now that he and his imperialistic policy had been buttressed by the discovery of Anne's infidelity, not even the nobles of the French faction dared to oppose it by seeming to side with the unhappy woman. The secretary did his work thoroughly. The indictments were laid before the grand juries of Middlesex and Kent, as the offences were asserted to have been committed over a long period, both at Greenwich and Whitehall, or Hampton Court. To the charges against Anne, of adultery with Smeaton, who it was asserted had confessed, Norreys, Weston, Brereton, and Lord Rockford, was added that, of having conspired with them to kill the king. There was not an atom of evidence worth the name to support any of the charges, except the doubtful confession of Smeaton, wrung from him by torture, and it is certain that at the period in question the death of Henry would have been fatal to the interests of Anne. But a state prosecution in the then condition of the law almost invariably meant a condemnation of the accused, and when Smeaton, Weston, Norreys and Brereton were arraigned in Westminster Hall on the 12th May, their doom was practically sealed before the trial. Smeaton simply pleaded guilty of adultery only, and prayed for mercy. The rest of the accused strenuously denied their guilt on the whole of the charges, but all were condemned to the terrible death awarded to traitors though on what detailed evidence, if any, does not now appear. Every effort was made to tempt Norris to confess, but he replied that he would rather die a thousand deaths than confess a lie, for he verily believed the queen innocent. In the meanwhile, Anne in the tower continued her strange behavior at times arrogantly claiming all her royal prerogatives, at times reduced to hysterical self-abasement and despair. On the 15th May, she and her brother were brought to the great hall of the tower before a large panel of peers under the presidency of the Duke of Norfolk. All that could add ignominy to the accused was done. The lieges were crowded into the space behind barriers at the end of the hall. The city fathers, under the Lord Mayor, were bidden to attend. And with bated breath, the subjects saw the woman they had always scorned publicly branded as an incestuous adulteress. The charges, as usual at the time, were made in a way and upon grounds that now, would not be permitted in any court of justice. Scraps of overheard conversation with Norris and others were twisted into sinister significance. Allegations unsupported and not included in the indictment were dragged in to prejudice the accused, and loose statements incapable of proof or disproof were liberally introduced for the same purpose. The charge of incest with Rockford depended entirely upon the assertion that he once remained in his sister's room a long time, and in his case also loose gossip was alleged as a proof of crime. That Anne had said that the king was impotent, that Rockford had thrown doubts upon the king being the father of Anne's child, and similar hearsay ribaldry. Both Anne and her brother defended themselves, unaided, with ability and dignity, they pointed out the absence of evidence against them, and the inherent improbability of the charges. But it was of no avail, for her death had already been settled between Henry and Cromwell, and the Duke of Norfolk, with his sinister squint, condemned his niece, Anne, Queen of England, to be burnt or beheaded at the king's pleasure, 
and viscount rockford to a similar death both denied their guilt after sentence but acknowledged as was the custom of the time that they deserved death this being the only way in which mercy might be gained so far as forfeiture of property was concerned anne had been cordially hated by the people her rise had meant the destruction of the ancient religious foundations the shaking of the ecclesiastical basis of english society but the sense of justice was not dead and the procedure at the trial shocked the public conscience already men and women murmured that the king's goings-on with mistress seymour whilst his wife was under trial for adultery were a scandal and anne in her death had more friends than in her life on all sides in london now from the lord mayor downwards it was said that anne had been condemned not because she was guilty but because the king was tired of her at all events wrote chaphus to grenville there was surely never a man who wore the horn so gaily as he on the seventeenth may the five condemned men were led to their death upon tower hill all of them including smeaton being beheaded as usual in such cases they acknowledged general guilt but not one except perhaps smeaton admitted the particular crimes for which they died for their kin might have suffered in property if not in person if the king's justice had been too strongly impugned anne in alternate hope and despair still remained in the tower but mostly longing for the rapid death she felt in her heart must come little she knew however why her sacrifice was deferred yet from day to day in one of her excited nervous outbursts she had cried that no matter what they did no one could prevent her from dying queen of england she had reckoned without henry's meanness cromwell's cunning and cranmer's suppleness her death warrant had been signed by the king on the sixteenth may and cranmer was sent to receive her last confession the coming of the archbishop her archbishop as she called him gave her fresh hope she was not to be killed after all but to be banished and cranmer was to bring her the good news alas poor soul she little knew her cranmer even yet he had been primed by cromwell for a very different purpose that of worming out of anne some admission that would give him a pretext for pronouncing her marriage with the king invalid from the first the task was a repulsive one for the primate whose act alone had made the marriage possible but cranmer was cranmer the position was a complicated one henry as he invariably did wished to save his face and seem in the right before the world consequently he could not confess that he had been mistaken in the divorce from catherine and get rid of anne's marriage in that way nor did he wish to restore mary to the position of heiress to the crown what he needed cranmer's help for was to render elizabeth also illegitimate but still his daughter in order that any child he might have by jane seymour or failing that his natural son the duke of richmond might be acknowledged his successor at intervals during anne's career her alleged betrothal to the earl of northumberland before her marriage had been brought up to her detriment and the poor hare-brained earl had forsworn himself more than once on the subject he was dying now but he was again pressed to say that a regular betrothal had taken place with anne but he was past earthly fear and finally asserted that no contract had been made foiled in this attempt henry or rather cromwell sent cranmer to the tower on the sixteenth may on his shameful errand to lure the poor woman by hopes of pardon 
to confess the existence of an impediment to her marriage with the king what the impediment was was never made public but anne's latest biographer mr friedman adduces excellent reasons for arriving at the conclusions that i have drawn namely that mary bolin having been henry's mistress he and anne were within the prohibited degrees of affinity for husband and wife the fact that no marriage had taken place between henry and mary bolin being regarded as canonically immaterial in any case the admission of a known impediment having been made by anne no time was lost the next day the seventeenth may cranmer sat with cromwell and other members of the council in his primate's court at lambeth to condemn the marriage that he himself had made anne was formally represented but nothing was said on her behalf and sentence was hurriedly pronounced that the king's marriage with anne boleyn had never been a marriage at all at the same time order was sent to sir william kingston that the concubine was to suffer the last penalty on the following morning when the sleepless night for anne had passed mostly in prayer she took the sacrament with the utmost devotion and in that most solemn moment swore before the host on her hopes of eternal life that she had never misused her body to the king's dishonor in the meanwhile her execution had been deferred until the next day and anne again lost her nerve it was cruel she said to keep her so long in suspense pray she petitioned put her out of her misery now that she was prepared the operation would not be painful kingston assured her quote, my neck is small enough end quote, she said spanning it with her fingers and again burst into hysterics soon she became calm once more and thenceforward only yearned for despatch quote, no one ever had a better will for death than she end quote, wrote chapus to his master and kingston hardened as he was to the sight of the condemned in their last hours expressed surprise to cromwell that instead of sorrow quote, this lady has much joy and pleasure in death End quote. remorse for her ungenerous treatment of the princess mary principally troubled her she herself she said was not going to execution by the divine judgment for what she had been accused of but for having planned the death of the princess and so in alternate prayer and light chatter passed anne's last night on earth and at nine o'clock on the spring morning of the nineteenth may she was led forth to the courtyard within the tower where a group of gentlemen including cromwell and the dukes of richmond and suffolk stood on or close to a low scaffold or staging reached by four steps from the ground anne was dressed in gray damask trimmed with fur over a crimson petticoat and cut low at the neck so as to offer no impediment to the executioner's steel and for the same reason the brown hair was dressed high in a net under the pearl bordered coif kept back by guards to some little distance from the platform stood a large crowd of spectators who had flocked in at the heels of the lord mayor and sheriffs though foreigners had been rigidly excluded when anne had ascended the steps she received permission to say a few words and followed the tradition of not complaining against the king's justice which had condemned her she had not come thither to preach she said but to die though she was not guilty of the particular crimes for which she had been condemned when however she began to speak of jane seymour being the cause of her fall those on the scaffold stopped her and she said no more a headsman of st omer had been brought over from calais in order that the broadsword instead of the axe might be used and this man 
who was undistinguishable by his garb from the other bystanders, now came forward, and, kneeling, asked the doomed woman's pardon, which granted, and herself knelt in a distraught way, as if to pray, but really gazed around her in mute appeal from one pitiless face to another. The headsman, taking compassion upon her, assured her that he would not strike until she gave the signal. "'You will have to take this quaff off,' said the poor woman, and one of the ladies who attended her did so, and partially bound her eyes with a handkerchief. But Anne still imagined that her headdress was in the way, and kept her hand upon her hair, straining her eyes and ears towards the steps, where, from the headsman's words, she expected the sword to be handed to him. Whilst she was thus kneeling erect in suspense, the sword, which was hidden in the straw behind her, was deftly seized by the French executioner, who, swinging the heavy blade around, in an instant cut through the erect slender neck, and the head of Anne Boleyn jerked from the shoulders and rolled upon the cloth that covered the platform. Catherine, in her neglected tomb at Peterborough, was avenged, but the fissure that had been opened up between England and the papacy for the sake of this woman had widened now past bridging. Politicians might, and did, make up their differences now that the concubine was dead, and form alliances regardless of religious affinities, but submission to the papacy in future might mean that the most powerful people in England would be deprived of the fat spoils of the church with which Cromwell had bought them, and that the vainest king on earth must humbly confess himself in the wrong. Anne herself was a mere straw upon a whirlpool, though her abilities, as Cromwell confessed, were not to be despised. She did not plan or make the Reformation, though she was forced by her circumstances to patronize it. The real author of the great schism of England was not Anne or Cranmer, but Luther's enemy, Charles V, the champion of Catholicism. But for the pressure he put upon the Pope to refuse Henry's divorce, in order to prevent a coalition of England and France, Cranmer's defiance of the papacy would not have been needed, and Henry might have come back to Rome again easily. But with Cranmer, to provide him with plausible pretexts for the repeated indulgence of his self-will, and Cromwell, to feed his pride and cupidity by the plunder of the church, Henry had already been drawn too far to go back. Greed and vanity of the ruling powers thus conspired to make permanent in England the influence of Evanescent and Boleyn. End of section 18section nineteen of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain fifteen thirty six through fifteen forty plot and counterplot jane seymour and anne of cleves part one from the moment that henry abruptly left the lists at may day on the receipt of Cromwell's letter detailing the admissions of Smeaton, he saw Anne no more. No pang of remorse, no wave of compassion passed over him. He easily believed what he wished to believe, and Anne was left to the tender mercies of Cromwell, to be done to death. Again Henry was a prey to profound self-pity forever having fallen under the enchantment of such a wicked woman he of course was not to blame for anything he never was he was always the clement just man 
whose unsuspecting goodness of heart had been abused by others and who tried to find distraction and to forget the evil done him on the very night of the day that anne was arrested the duke of richmond henry's son now a grown youth went as was his custom into his father's room at whitehall to bid him good night and ask his blessing the king we are told fell a-weeping as he blessed his son quote, saying that he and his sister mary might well be grateful to god for saving them from the hands of that accursed and venomous harlot who had intended to poison them End quote. that anne may have planned the assassination of mary is quite probable even if she had no hand in the shortening of catherine's days and this may have been the real hidden pretext of her death acting upon henry's fears for himself but if such were the case henry at least was deserving of no pity for when it was only catherine's life that was in danger he was as we have seen brutally callous and only awoke to the enormity of the quote, venomous harlot unquote, when cromwell made him believe that his own safety was jeopardized then no fate was too cruel for the woman he once had loved on the day preceding anne's trial jane seymour was brought from sir nicholas carew's house to another residence on the river bank only a mile from whitehall stairs to be ready for her intended elevation as soon as the queen was disposed of here jane was served for the few days she stayed quote, very splendidly by the cooks and certain officers of the king and very richly adorned end quote. so certain was henry that nothing would now stand in the way of his new marriage that jane was informed beforehand that on the fifteenth by three in the afternoon she would hear of her predecessor's condemnation and anne's cousin and enemy sir francis bryan eagerly brought the news to the expectant lady at the hour anticipated the next day when the sword of the french headsman had made henry indeed a widower the king only awaited receipt of the intelligence to enter his barge and seek the consolation of jane seymour at six o'clock in the morning of the twentieth may when the headless body of anne barely cold still awaited sepulture huddled in an old arrow box in the church of st peter within the tower jane was secretly carried by water from her residence to hampton court and before nine o'clock she had been privately married to the king by virtue of a dispensation issued the day previously by the accommodating cranmer it would seem probable that the day after the private espousals jane travelled to her home in wiltshire where she stayed for several days whilst preparations were being made in the king's abodes for her reception as queen for all the a's had to be changed to j's in the royal ciphers and traces of anne's former presence abolished wherever possible whether henry accompanied his new wife to wiltshire on this occasion is not quite certain though from sir john russell's account it is probable that he did in any case the king and his new wife visited mercer's hall in cheapside on the twenty ninth may st peter's eve to witness from the windows the civic ceremony of the annual setting of the watch and on the following day thirtieth may the pair were formally married in the queen's closet at whitehall the people at large looked somewhat askance at this furious haste to marry the new wife before the shed blood of the previous one was dry but the court and those who still recollected the wronged princess mary and her dead mother were enthusiastic in their welcome to jane the emperor's friends too were in joyous mood and princess mary at hunston was full of hope and eager to be allowed to greet her father and his new wife now that 
that woman was dead chapus we may be sure did not stand behind the door now when he went to court on the contrary when he first visited whitehall a few days after the wedding henry led him by the hand to jane's apartments and allowed the diplomatist to kiss the queen quote, congratulating her upon her marriage and wishing her prosperity i told her that although the device of the lady who had preceded her on the throne was the happiest of women i had no doubt that she herself would realize that motto i was sure that the emperor would be equally rejoiced as the king himself had been at meeting such a virtuous and amiable queen the more so that her brother that is sir e seymour afterwards the duke of somerset had been in the emperor's service i added that it was almost impossible to believe the joy and pleasure which englishmen generally had felt at the marriage especially as it was said that she was continually trying to persuade the king to restore the princess to his favor as formerly End quote. most of chapus's courtly talk with jane indeed was directed to this point of the restoration of mary but the new queen though inexperienced had been well coached and did not unduly commit herself only promising to favor the princess and to endeavor to deserve the title that chapus had given her of quote, peacemaker end quote. henry strolled up to the pair at this point and excused his new wife for any want of expertness quote, as i was the first ambassador she had received and she was not used yet to such receptions he henry felt sure however that she would do her utmost to obtain the title of peacemaker with which i chapus had greeted her as besides being naturally of a kind and amiable disposition and much inclined to peace she would strive to prevent his henry's taking part in a foreign war if only out of the fear of being separated from him End quote but all these fine hopes were rapidly banished jane never possessed or attempted to exercise any political influence on her husband she smiled sweetly and in a non-committal way upon the princess mary and upon the imperialist and moderate catholic party that had hoped to make the new queen their instrument but cromwell's was still the strong mind that swayed the king he had obtained renewed control over his master by ridding him of anne and had at all events prevented england from being drawn into a coalition with france against the emperor but he had no intention even if it had been possible of going to the other extreme and binding his country to go to war against france to please the emperor henry's self-will and vanity as well as his greed also stood in the way of a complete submission to the papacy and those who had brought jane seymour in hoping that her advent would mean a return to the same position as that previous to anne's rise now found that they had been over sanguine charles and francis were left to fight out their great duel alone in italy and provence to the general discomfiture of the imperial cause and instead of hastening to humble himself at the feet of paul the third as the pontiff had fondly expected henry summoned parliament and gave stronger statutory sanction than ever to his ecclesiastical independence of rome anne's condemnation and elizabeth's bastardy were obediently confirmed by the legislature and the entire freedom of the english church from rome reasserted but the question of the succession was that which aroused the strongest feeling and its settlement the keenest disappointment now that anne's offspring was disinherited princess mary and her friends naturally expected that she 
with the help of the new queen would once more enter into the enjoyment of her birthright eagerly mary wrote to cromwell bespeaking his aid which she had been led to expect that he would give and by his intercession she was allowed to send her humble petition to her father praying for leave to see him her letters are all couched in terms of cringing humility praying forgiveness for past offences and promising to be a truly dutiful daughter in future but this did not satisfy henry cromwell desirous in pursuance of his policy of keeping friendly with the emperor without going to war with france or kneeling to rome hoped to bring about peace between mary and her father but the strongest passions of henry's nature were now at stake and he would only accept his daughter's submission on terms that made her a self-confessed bastard and against this the girl as obstinate as her father and as righteously proud as her mother still rebelled henry's son the duke of richmond was now a straight stripling of eighteen already married to norfolk's daughter and failing issue by jane here was an heir to the crown that might carry the tudor line onward in the male blood if parliament could be chicaned or threatened into acknowledging him so mary was plied with letters from cromwell each more pressing and cruel than the previous one driving the girl to distraction by the king's insistence upon his terms threats cajolery and artful casuistry were all tried again mary turned to her foreign advisers and the king's rebellious subjects for support and again her father's heart hardened when he knew it norfolk who with others was sent to persuade her was so incensed with her firmness that he said if she had been his daughter he would have knocked her head against the wall until it was soft as a codlin but norfolk's daughter was the duchess of richmond and might be queen consort after henry's death if mary were disinherited so that there was some excuse for his violence those who were in favor of mary were dismissed from the council even cromwell was in fear and jane seymour was rudely snubbed by the king for daring to intercede for the princess at length with death threatening her mary could stand out no longer without even reading it she signed with a mental reservation and confident of obtaining the papal absolution for which she secretly asked the shameful declaration forced upon her repudiating the papal authority and specifically acknowledging herself a bastard then henry was all amiability with his wronged daughter he and jane went to visit her at richmond whither she had been brought giving her handsome presents of money and jewels liberty was given to her to come to court and stately service surrounded her but it was all embittered by the knowledge that parliament had been induced to acknowledge that all the king's children were illegitimate and to grant to henry himself the right of appointing his own successor by letters patent or by will alas the youth in whose immediate interest the injustice was done was fast sinking to his grave and on the twenty second july fifteen thirty six the duke of richmond breathed his last to henry's bitter grief mary's prospects again became brighter and all those who resented the religious policy and henry's recalcitrancy now looked to the girl as their only hope of a return to the old order of things chapus too was ceaseless in his intrigues to bring england once more into a condition of obedience to the pope that should make her a fit instrument for the imperial policy and soon the disappointment that followed on the elevation of jane seymour found vent in the outbreak of rebellion in lincolnshire and yorkshire the priests and the great mass of the people 
had bent the neck patiently to the king's violent innovations in the observances that they had been taught to hold sacred they had seen the religious houses to which they looked for help and succor in distress destroyed and alienated the abuses of the clergy had doubtless been great and the first measures against them had been welcomed but the complete confiscation of vast properties in the main administered for the benefit of the lowly the continued enclosure of common lands by the gentry newly enriched by ecclesiastical plunder and the rankling sense of the scandalous injustice that had been suffered by catherine and mary for the sake as the people said of the king's lustful caprice at last provided the extreme militant catholic party with the impetus needed for revolt against the crown imperious henry was beside himself with rage and for a time it looked as if he and his system might be swept away in favor of his daughter or one of the poles who were being put forward by the pope the bull of excommunication against henry and england so long held back was now launched making rebellion righteous and the imperial interest in england which was still strong did its best to aid the rising of henry's lieges against him but the rebels were weakly led the greater nobles had for the most part been bought by grants of ecclesiastical lands and norfolk for all his moral baseness was an experienced and able soldier so the pilgrimage of grace threatening as it looked for a time flickered out and the yoke was riveted tighter than ever upon the neck of rural england to the party that had hoped to make use of her jane seymour was thus to some extent a disappointment but her placid submissiveness which made her a bad political instrument exactly suited a husband so imperious as henry and from a domestic point of view the union was successful during the summer jane shared in her husband's progresses and recreations but as the months rolled on and no hope came of offspring ominous rumors ran that jane's coronation would be deferred until it was proved that she might bear children to the king and some said that if she proved barren a pretext would be found for displacing her in favor of another indeed only a few days after the public marriage henry noticed two very beautiful girls at court and showed his annoyance that he had not seen them before taking jane after six months of marriage without sign of issue henry began to take fright the duke of richmond was dead and both the king's daughters were acknowledged by the law of england to be illegitimate he was already forty-six years of age and had lately grown very obese and his death without further issue or a resettlement of the succession would inevitably lead to a dynastic dispute with the probable result of the return of the house of york to the throne in the person of one of the poles under the aegis of rome whenever possible jane had said a good word for the princess mary and henry began to listen more kindly than before to his wife's well-meant attempts to soften him in favor of his daughter the catholic party was all alert with new hopes that the king convinced that he could father no more sons would cause his elder daughter to be acknowledged his heir but the reformers who had grown up numerously especially in and about london during henry's defiance of rome looked askance at a policy which in time they feared might bring back the old order of things the mainstay of this party at court apart from the professed lutherans and the new bishops were those who having received grants of ecclesiastical property despaired of any return to the roman communion and the imperial alliance without the restoration of the church property amongst these courtiers was jane's brother edward seymour viscount beauchamp 
who had received large grants of ecclesiastical lands at intervals since 1528. He was a personal friend of the king, and had taken no active part in the intrigue that accompanied his sister's elevation, though after the marriage he naturally rose higher than before in the favor of the king. He was a clever and superficially brilliant, but ostentatious and greedy man, of no great strength of purpose, whose new relationship to the king marked him out as a dominating influence in the future. The dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk, upon whom Henry had depended as generals, were now very old and ailing, and there was no other peer but Cromwell of any ability in the councils. Even thus early, it was clear that Seymour's weight would, notwithstanding the circumstances of his sister's rise, be thrown on to the anti-papal side when the crucial struggle came. He was, moreover, a new man, and as such, not welcomed by the older nobility, who, though desirous of retaining their church plunder, were yet bound by their traditions against bureaucrats such as Cromwell and the policy of defiance of the papacy that he and his like had suggested and carried out cromwell's own position at this time fifteen thirty six through fifteen thirty seven was a paradoxical one it was he who had led henry on step by step to entire schism and the plunder of the church it was he who not only had shown how to get rid of catherine but how to destroy her successor and it was he whom the catholic party hated with a whole-hearted detestation for the king's acts as well as his own on the other hand he was hardly less distrusted by the reforming party for his efforts were known to be directed to a reconciliation with the emperor which could only be effected conjointly with some sort of arrangement with the papacy his efforts to please the imperialists by siding with the princess mary during her dispute with her father led him to the very verge of destruction whilst the young princess was being badgered into making her shameful and insincere renunciation of her faith and birthright cromwell the very man who was the instrument for extorting her submission sat as he says for a week in the council considering himself quote, a dead man end quote, because the king believed that he was encouraging mary to resist cromwell therefore like most men who endeavor to hold a middle course was distrusted and hated by everyone and it must have been obvious to him that if he could ensure the adhesion of the rising seymour interest his chance of weathering the storm would be infinitely improved his son had recently married jane seymour's sister and this brought him into close relationship with the family and as will be seen led in the next year to a compact political union between the seymour brothers cromwell and the reforming party as against the nobles and traditional conservatives for the time however cromwell held on his way endeavoring to keep in with the imperialists and mary and it was doubtless to his prompting that jane used her influence when at its highest point to reconcile the princess personally to her father to the great joy of the king in march fifteen thirty seven jane was declared to be with child the emperor had already opened a negotiation for the marriage of mary with his brother-in-law the infante luis of portugal and henry was playing a waiting game till he saw if jane would bear him a child if so mary might go although he still refused to legitimize her but if no more issue was to be born to him he could hardly allow his elder daughter to leave england and fall into the hands of the emperor charles on the other hand was extremely anxious to obtain possession of so valuable a pledge for the future as mary and was willing to go to almost any lengths to get her either by fair means or foul fearing as he did 
that the girl might be married discreditably in england he thought even to cromwell himself in order to destroy her international value to henry's rivals as soon however as jane's pregnancy was announced mary's position changed if a child was born in wedlock to the king especially if it were a son there would be no need to degrade mary by joining her to a lowly husband she might on the contrary become a good international marriage asset in the hands of her father who might bargain with charles or francis for her the fresh move of jane seymour therefore in her favor in the spring of fifteen thirty seven when the queen's pregnancy had given her greater power over her husband was probably welcome both to the king and cromwell as enhancing mary's importance at a time when she might be used as an international political pawn without danger jane was sad one day in the early period of her pregnancy why darling said the king how happeneth you are not merrier it has pleased your grace replied the queen to make me your wife and there are none but my inferiors with whom to make merry with all your grace excepted unless it would please you that we might enjoy the company of the lady mary at court i could be merry with her we will have her here darling if that will make thee merry said the king and before many days had gone mary with a full train of ladies was brought from hunston magnificently dressed to whitehall where in the great presence chamber henry and his wife stood before the fire the poor girl was almost overcome at the tenderness of her reception and fell upon her knees before her father and his wife henry as usual anxious to throw upon others the responsibility of his ill treatment of his daughter turned to his counsellors who stood around and said some of you were desirous that i should put this jewel to death that were a pity quoth the queen to have lost your chiefest jewel of england the hint was too much for mary who changed colour and fell into a swoon greatly to her father's concern end of section nineteen section twenty of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain fifteen thirty six through fifteen forty plot and counterplot jane seymour and anne of cleves part two at length the day long yearned and prayed for by henry came jane had for some months lived in the strictest quietude and prayers and masses for her safe delivery were offered in the churches for weeks before in september she had travelled slowly to hampton court and on the twelfth october fifteen thirty seven a healthy son was born to her and henry the joy of the king was great beyond words the gross sensualist old beyond his years had in vain hoped through all his sturdy youth for a boy who beyond reproach might bear his regal name he had flouted christendom and defied the greatest powers on earth in order to marry a woman who might bear him a man-child when she failed to do so he had coldly stood aside whilst his instruments defamed her and did her to death and now at last in his declining years his prayer was answered and the house of tudor was secure upon the future throne of england bonfires blazed and joy bells rang throughout the land feasts of unexampled bounteousness coarsely brought home to the lieges the blessing that had come to save the country from the calamity of a disputed succession the seymour brothers at once became next to the king and his son the most important personages in england the elder edward 
being created Earl of Hertford, and both receiving great additional grants of monastic lands. In the general jubilation at the birth, the interests of the mother were forgotten. No attempt appears to have been made to save her from the excitement that surrounded her, and on the very day of her delivery, she signed an official letter, quote, Jane the Queen, unquote, to Cromwell, directing him to communicate to the Privy Council the joyful news. The most sumptuous royal christening ever seen was in bustling preparation in and about her sick chamber, and that no circumstance of state should be lacking. The mother herself, only four days after the birth, was forced to take part in the exhausting ceremony. In the chapel at Hampton Court, newly decorated like the splendid banqueting hall adjoining, where the initials of Jane carved in stone with those of the king, and her arms and device on glowing glass and gilded scutcheon still perpetuate her fleeting presence, the christening ceremony was held by torchlight late in the chill autumn evening. Through the long drafty corridors, preceded by braying trumpets, and followed by rustling crowds of elated courtiers, the sick woman was carried on her stately pallet, covered with heavy robes of crimson velvet and ermine. Under a golden canopy, supported by the four greatest nobles in the land, next to Norfolk, who was one of the godfathers, the Marchioness of Exeter bore the infant in her arms to the scene of the ceremony, and the Princess Mary, fiercely avid of love as she ever was, held the prince at the font. Suffolk, Arundel, and doomed Exeter, with a host of other magnates, stood around, whilst one towering handsome figure, with a long brown beard, carried aloft, in his arms, the tiny fair girl-child of Anne, the Lady Elizabeth, holding in her dainty hands the holy chrism. It was Edward Seymour, Earl of Hertford, looked at askance by the rest as a new man, but already overlapping them all as the uncle of the infant prince. During the Te Deum and the long pompous ceremony of the baptism, the mother lay flushed and excited upon her couch, whilst the proud father, his broad face beaming with pride, sat by her side, holding her hand. It was hard upon midnight when the queen gave her blessing to her child and was carried back to her chamber with more trumpet blasts and noisy gratulation. The next day, as was to be expected, she was in a high fever, so ill that she was confessed and received extreme unction. But she rallied, and seemed somewhat amended for the next few days, though ominous rumors were rife in London that her life had purposely been jeopardized in order to save that of the child at birth. They were not true, but they give the measure of the public estimate of Henry's character, and have been made the most of by Sanders, Rivadanera, and the other Jesuit historians. On the 23rd October, the queen fell gravely ill again, and in the night was thought to be dying. Henry had intended to ride to Escher that day, but, quote, could not find it in his heart, end quote, to go. And the next night, the 24th October, Jane Seymour died. A sacrifice to improper treatment and heartlessly exacted ceremonial. Henry had not been married long enough to her to have become tired of her, and her somewhat lethargic placidity had suited him. She had, moreover, borne him the long-looked-for son, and his grief for her loss was profound, and no doubt sincere. Much as he hated signs of mortality, he wore black mourning for her for three months, and shut himself up at Windsor, away from the world, and above all, away from the corpse of his dead wife, for a fortnight. Jane's body, embalmed, lay in the presence chamber at Hampton Court for a week. 
blazing tapers surrounded the great hearse and masses went on from dawn to midday in the chamber all night long the queen's ladies with princess mary watched before the bier until the end of the month when the catafalque had been erected in the chapel for the formal lying in state on the twelfth november with the greatest possible pomp the funeral procession bore the dead queen to windsor for burial in a grave in st george's chapel destined to receive the remains of henry as well as that of his third wife the mother of his son the writers of the time following the lead of henry and his courtiers never mentioned their grief for the queen without promptly suggesting that it was more than counterbalanced by their joy at the birth of her son who from his first appearance in the world was hailed as a paragon of beauty and perfection thanksgivings for the boon of a male heir to the king blended their sounds of jubilation with the droning of the masses for the mother's soul and the flare of the bonfires died down into the flickering tapers that dimly lit the funerals even henry himself in writing to give the news of his son's birth confessed that his joy at the event had far exceeded his grief for jane's death so far as the catholic party that had promoted it was concerned the marriage with jane had been a failure the pilgrimage of grace had been drowned in the blood of ruthless slaughter and partly because of mary's scruples and fears partly because they themselves had been gorged with the plunder of the church nearly all the great nobles stood aside and raised no voice whilst cromwell and his master still worked havoc on the religious houses regardless of jane's timid intercession boxley walsingham and even the sacred shrine of canterbury yielded their relics and images venerated for centuries to be scorned and destroyed whilst the vast accumulated treasures of gold and gems that enriched them went to fill the coffers of the king and their lands to bribe his favorites throughout england the work of confiscation was carried on now with a zeal which only greed for the resultant profit can explain the attacks upon superstition in the church by those in authority naturally aroused a feeling of greater freedom of thought amongst the mass of the people the establishment of an open bible in english in every church for the perusal of the parishioners do as indeed most of the doctrinal changes were to cranmer encouraged men to think to some extent for themselves but though for purposes to which reference will be made presently henry willingly concurred in cranmer's reforming tendencies and cromwell's anti-ecclesiastical plans for providing him with abundant money he would allow no departure from orthodoxy as he understood it his love for theological controversy and his undoubted ability and learning in that direction enabled him to enforce his views with apparently unanswerable arguments especially as he was able and quite ready to close the dispute with an obstinate antagonist by prescribing the stake and the gibbet either to those who repudiated his spiritual supremacy or to those who like the anabaptists questioned the efficacy of a sacrament which he had adopted for henry it was to a great extent a matter of pride and self-esteem now to show to his own subjects and the world that he was absolutely supreme and infallible and this feeling unquestionably had greatly influenced the progress effected by the reformation and emancipation from rome made after the disappointing marriage with jane seymour but there was also policy in henry's present action throughout the years fifteen thirty six and fifteen thirty seven francis and the emperor had continued at war but by the close of the latter year it was evident that both combatants were exhausted and would shortly make up their differences the papal excommunication of henry and his realm was now in full force 
making rebellion against the king a laudable act for all good catholics and any agreement between the two great continental sovereigns in union with rome boded ill for england and its king there were others too to whom such a combination boded ill the alliance between france and the infidel turk to attack the christian emperor had aroused intense indignation amongst catholics throughout the world against francis and the pope utilizing this feeling strove hard to persuade both christian sovereigns to cease their fratricidal struggle and to recognize that the real enemy to be feared and destroyed was lutheranism or heresy in their midst during the emperor's absence and the war protestantism in germany had advanced with giant strides the princes had boldly refused to recognize any conciliatory council of the church under the control of the pope and the pressure used by the emperor to compel them to do so aroused the suspicion that the day was fast approaching when lutheranism would have to fight for its life against the imperial suzerain of germany already the forces were gathering george of saxony the enemy of luther was hurrying to the grave and henry his brother and heir was a strong protestant philip of hesse had two years before thrown down the gauge and had taken by force from the emperor the territory of wurtenburg and had restored the protestant duke ulrich charles's brother ferdinand who ruled the empire clamored as loudly as did mary of hungary in flanders and eleanor of austria in france for a peace between the two champions of christendom the repudiation by france of the turkish alliance and a concentration of the catholic forces in the world before it was too late to crush the hydra of heresy which threatened them all it was natural in the circumstances that the enemies of the papacy should be drawn together a fellow-feeling makes us wondrous kind and a common danger drew henry of england and philip of hesse together henry was no lutheran and did not pretend to be he had been drawn into the reformation by the process that we have followed in which interested advisers had worked upon his passions and self-esteem but he had gone too far in defiance of rome now to turn back and was forced to look to his own safety by such policy as was possible to him for several months after jane seymour's death the envoys of the german protestants were in england in close negotiation with henry and cromwell in order that a close league should be made it was necessary that some common doctrinal standpoint should be agreed upon and infinite theological discussions took place to bring this about henry would not give way on any principal point and the protestant ambassadors went home again without a formal understanding but though henry remained as he intended to do thus unpledged it was good policy for him to impress upon the germans by his ruthless suppression of the monasteries and his prohibition of the ancient superstitions that he was the enemy of their enemy and that if he was attacked for heresy it would be incumbent upon the lutherans to be on his side even against their own suzerain this was not however the only move made by henry against the threatening danger of a joint attack of the catholic powers he had hardly thrown off his mourning for jane before he turned his hand to the old game of dividing his rivals his bluff was as audacious and brilliant as usual to the imperial and french ambassadors in turn he boasted that either of their masters would prefer his friendship and alliance to that of the other and rightly convinced that he would really be more likely to gain latitudinarian francis than charles he proposed in the spring of fifteen thirty eight that he should marry a french princess as the two great catholic sovereigns drew closer together 
though still nominally at war in Italy, Henry became, indeed, quite an eager wooer. His friend, Sir Francis Bryan, was sent to Paris secretly to forward his suit, and obtained a portrait of the Duke of Guise's second daughter, the sister of the King of Scotland's bride, Mary of Lorraine, with which Henry confessed himself quite smitten. He had, before this, only three months after Jane's death, made a desperate attempt to prevail upon Francis to let him have Mary of Lorraine herself, though she was already betrothed to the King of Scots, his nephew. But this had been positively and even indignantly refused. Even the younger daughter of Guise, beautiful as she was, did not quite satisfy his vanity. Both he and his agent Brian, who was a fit representative for him, disgusted Francis by suggesting that three other French princesses should be taken to Calais by the Queen of Navarre, Francis's sister, in order that they might be paraded before the King of England for his selection, quote, like hackneys, end quote, as was said at the time. He thought that the angry repudiation of such an insulting proposal was most unreasonable. Quote, how can I choose a wife by deputy? he asked. I must depend upon my own eyes. End quote. Besides, he added, he must hear them sing and see how they comported themselves. Perhaps, suggested the French ambassador sarcastically, he would like to go further and test the ladies in other ways, as the knights of King Arthur used to do. Henry colored at this, but wantingly replied that he could, if he pleased, marry into the imperial house, but he would not marry at all unless he was quite sure that his new relation would prefer his alliance to all others. When, at length, in June, the truce of Nice was signed, and soon afterwards the fraternal meeting and close community between Francis and Charles was effected at Aigues Henry began to get seriously alarmed. His matrimonial offers, to his surprise, were treated very coolly. All his attempts to breed dissension between the imperial and French ambassadors, who were now hand in glove, were laughed at, and the intimate confidence and friendship between his two Catholic rivals seemed at last to bring disaster to Henry's very doors, for it was not concealed that the first blow to be struck by the Catholic Confederacy was to be upon the schismatic heretic who ruled England. With Francis, there was no more to be done, for Henry and Brian, by their want of delicacy, had between them deeply wounded all the possible French brides and their families. But, at least, Henry hoped that sufficient show of friendship with Charles might be simulated to arouse Francis's jealousy of his new ally. Henry, therefore, began to sneer at the patched-up friendship, as he called it. And how about Milan? he asked the French ambassador, knowing that that was the still rankling sore, and soon he began to boast more openly that he himself might have Milan by the cession of it as a dower to Dom Luis of Portugal, on his marriage with the Princess Mary, whilst Henry himself married the young widowed Duchess of Milan, Charles's niece, Christina of Denmark, that clever, quick witted woman whose humorous face lives forever on the canvas of Holbein in the English National Gallery. There had been a Spanish ambassador, Diego Hurtado de Mendoza, in England since the spring of 1537 to negotiate the portuguese marriage of the princess mary but the eternal questions of dowry security and the legitimacy of the princess had made all negotiations so far abortive now they were taken up more strongly by means of wyatt at madrid and by special envoys to mary of hungary in flanders but it was all buckler play as the imperial agents and Charles himself soon found out. Henry and Cromwell knew perfectly well 
that no stable alliance with the emperor was possible then unless their religious policy was changed and they had gone too far to change it without humiliation if not destruction to henry the real object of the negotiations being simply to obtain some sort of promise about the cession of milan by which francis might be detached from the imperial alliance but it was unsuccessful and for once the two great antagonists held together for a time against all lutheranism and heresy then henry and cromwell had to look anxiously for support and alliances elsewhere to the king it was a repugnant and humiliating necessity he had puffed himself into the belief that he was the most potent and infallible of sovereigns and he found himself for the first time scorned by all those he had reason to fear he the embodiment of the idea of regal omnipotence would be forced to make common cause with those who like the german protestants stood for resistance to supreme authority with usurpers like christian the third of denmark and trading democracies like lubeck with much hesitation and dislike therefore he listened whilst cromwell urged the inevitable policy upon him which led him farther and farther away from the inner circle of potentates to which he and his father had gained entrance in the course of the events related in the first chapters of this book cromwell's arguments would probably have been unavailing but for the opportune discovery in the usual fortuitous cromwell fashion of a dangerous aristocratic conspiracy against henry himself cardinal pole had been entrusted with the papal excommunication and everywhere impressed upon english catholics the duty of obeying their spiritual father by deposing the king whether anything in the form of a regular conspiracy to do this existed in england is extremely doubtful but the cardinal had naturally written to his relatives in england especially to his brother joffrey and perhaps to his mother the countess of salisbury a princess of the blood royal of york first joffrey was seized and carried to the tower and some sort of incriminating admission drawn from him by threats of torture though so far as can be gathered nothing but the repetition of disaffected conversations it was enough however for cromwell's purpose when he needed it and the fatal net was cast over pole's elder brother lord montague the marquis of exeter allied to the royal house the master of the horse sir nicholas carew sir edward neville and half a score of other high gentlemen known to be faithful to the old cause all to be unjustly sacrificed on the scaffold to the fears of henry and the political exigencies of cromwell even the women and children of the supposed sympathizers with the papacy were not spared and the aged countess of salisbury with her grandson and the marchioness of exeter with her son were imprisoned with many humbler ones the defences of the kingdom on the coast and toward scotland were rapidly made ready to resist attack from abroad which indeed looked imminent and when the noble and conservative party had been sufficiently cowed by the sight of the blood of the highest of its members when the reign of terror over the land had made all men so dumb and fearsome that none dared say to him nay cromwell felt himself strong enough to endeavor to draw england into the league of protestant princes and defy the catholic world the position for henry personally was an extraordinary one he had gradually drifted into a position of independence from rome but he still professed to be a strict catholic in other respects his primate cranmer and several other of his bishops whose ecclesiastical status was unrecognized by the pope were unquestionably and not unnaturally protestant in their sympathies whilst cromwell was simply a politician who cared nothing for creeds and faiths except as ancillary to state policy francis 
and even on occasion charles himself made little of the taking church property for lay purposes when he needed it he had more than once been the ally of the infidel against catholic princes and his religious belief was notoriously lax and yet he remained quote, the eldest son of the church end quote. charles had struggled successfully against the papal pretensions to control the temporalities of the spanish church his troops had sacked rome and imprisoned the pope and his ministers for years had bullied pontiffs and scolded them as if they were erring schoolboys excommunication had fallen upon him and his and as hard things had been said of him in rome as of henry and yet he was the champion of catholic christendom the conclusion is obvious that henry's sin towards the papacy was not primarily the spoliation of the church the repudiation of catherine or even the assumption of control over the temporalities but that he had arrogated to himself the spiritual headship in his realm in most other respects he was as good a catholic as charles and a much better one than francis and yet under stress of circumstances he was forced into common cause with the growing party of reform in europe whose separation from the church was profoundly doctrinal and arose from entirely different motives from those of henry the danger that threatened england at the time early fifteen thirty nine was not really quite so serious as it seemed for close as the alliance between charles and francis was old jealousies were not dead and a joint war against england would have revived them whilst the papal plan of treating england commercially as outside the pale of civilization would have ruined charles's subject and was impracticable but in any case the peril was real to henry and cromwell and under the stress of it they were driven into the attempted policy of a protestant confederacy at the end of january fifteen thirty nine christopher mont was sent to germany with the first overtures he carried letters of credence to philip of hesse and hans frederick of saxony with the ostensible object of asking whether they had come to any conclusion respecting the theological disputations held in the previous year between their envoys and the english bishops to establish a common doctrinal basis this of course was a mere pretext the real object of the mission being to discover to what extent henry could depend upon the german protestant princes if he were attacked by their suzerain the emperor a private instruction was given to mont by cromwell to remind one of the saxon ministers who had come to england of a former conversation about a possible marriage between the young duke of cleves and the princess mary and he was to take the opportunity of finding out all he could about the quote, beauty and qualities shape stature and complexion end quote, of the elder of the two unmarried daughters of the old duke of cleves whose eldest daughter sibylla had married hans frederick of saxony himself and was as bold a protestant as he was at the same time approaches were made to christian the third of denmark who had joined the evangelical league and gradually the forces against the papacy were to be knitted together an excuse also was found to send english envoys to cleves itself to offer an alliance in the matter of the duchy of geldris which the duke of cleves had just seized without the emperor's connivance or consent carne and watton the envoys were also to offer the hand of the princess mary to the young duke and cautiously to hint at a marriage between his sister anne and henry if conditions were favorable and like mont in saxony were to close the ranks of protestantism around the threatened henry from whose court both the imperial and french ambassadors had now been withdrawn End of section 20.
Section 21 of The Wives of Henry the Eighth and the Parts They Played in History by Martin Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 1536 through 1540. Plot and Counterplot. Jane Seymour and Anne of Cleves. Part 3 whilst these intrigues for protestant support on the continent were being carried on and the defences of england on all sides were being strengthened henry apparently for the purpose of disarming the catholic elements and proving that apart from the papal submission he was as good a catholic as any forced through parliament may fifteen thirty nine the extraordinary statute called the six articles or the bloody statute which threw all english protestants into a panic the act was drafted on henry's instructions by bishop gardiner and was called a quote, act to abolish diversity of opinions end quote. the articles of faith dictated by the king to his subjects under ferocious penalties included the main catholic doctrine the real presence in the sacrament in its fullest sense the celibacy of the clergy that the administration of the sacrament in two kinds is not necessary that auricular confession is compulsory that private masses may be said and that vows of chastity must be kept forever cranmer who was married and had children dared to argue against the bill when the duke of norfolk introduced it in the house of lords and others of the new bishops timidly did likewise but they were overborne by the old bishops and the great majority of the lay peers influenced by their traditions and by the peremptory arguments of the king himself even more important was an act passed in the same servile parliament giving to the king's proclamations the force of law and an act of attainder against every one living or dead in england or abroad who had opposed the king completed the terror under which thenceforward the country lay henry was now indeed master of the bodies and souls of his subjects and had reduced them all protestants and catholics alike to a condition of abject subjection to his mere will the passage of these acts especially the six articles marks a temporarily successful attempt of the conservative party represented by the old bishops and the nobles under norfolk to overcome the influence of cromwell who was forwarding the protestant league but to henry the policy must in any case have seemed a good one as it tended to increase his personal power and prestige and to keep both parties dependent upon him before the summer of fifteen thirty nine had passed it was evident to henry that the new combination against him would not stand the strain of a joint attack upon england charles was full of cares of his own the lutherans were increasingly threatening even his own city of ghent had revolted and it was plain from his reception of pole at toledo that he could not proceed to extremes against henry it certainly was not the intention of francis to do so and the panic in england never fully justified passed away the french ambassador came back and once more henry's intrigues to sow dissension between the catholic powers went ceaselessly on in the circumstances it was natural that after the passage of the six articles and the resumption of diplomatic relations with france the negotiations with the german protestants slackened but the proposed marriage of henry with the princess of cleves offered too good an opportunity as cromwell pointed out to him of troubling the emperor when he liked to be dropped even though no general political league was effected with the german lutherans her brother-in-law hans frederick of saxony was cool about it 
he said that some sort of engagement had been made by her father and the duke of lorraine to marry her to the heir of the latter but finally in august watton reported from duren that hans frederick would send envoys to cleves to propose the match and they would then proceed to england to close the matter watton had been somewhat distrustful about the previous engagement of anne with the duke of lorraine's son but was assured by the council of cleves that it was not binding upon the princess quote, who was free to marry as she pleased End quote. she has been brought up he writes quote, with the lady duchess her mother and in a manner never from her elbow the lady duchess being a wise lady and one that very straightly looketh to her children all report her anne to be of very lowly and gentle conditions by the which she hath so much won her mother's favour that she is loath to suffer her to depart from her she occupieth her time mostly with her needle wherewithal she can read and write dutch but as to french latin or any other language she hath none nor yet she cannot sing nor play any instrument for they take it here in germany for a rebuke and an occasion of lightness that great ladies should be learned or have any knowledge of music her wit is good and she will no doubt learn english soon when she puts her mind to it i could never hear that she is inclined to the good cheer of this country and marvel it were if she should seeing that her brother doth so well abstain from it your grace's servant hans holbein hath taken the effigies of my lady anne and the lady amelia and hath expressed their images very lively End quote. holbein was not usually a flattering painter to his sitters and the portrait he sent of anne was that of a somewhat masculine and large-featured but handsome and intellectual young woman with fine soft contemplative brown eyes thick lashes and strong eyebrows the general appearance is dignified though handicapped by the very unbecoming dutch dress of the period and though there is nothing of the petite sprightliness and soft rotundity that would be likely to attract a man of henry's characteristics the princess cannot have been ill-favoured cromwell some months earlier had reported to henry that mont informed him that quote, everybody praises the lady's beauty both of face and body one said she excelled the duchess of milan as the golden sun did the silver moon End quote. if the latter statement be near the truth anne in her own way must have been quite good-looking there was no delay or difficulty in carrying through the arrangements for the marriage the envoys from cleves and saxony arrived in london in september and saw henry at windsor they could offer no great dowry for cleves was poor but they would not be exacting about the appendage to be settled upon the queen by her husband to whom they left the decision of the sum and the other covenants as to the eventual succession to her brother's duchy in case of his death without heirs were to be the same as those under which her elder sister married hans frederick this was the sort of spirit that pleased henry in negotiators and with such he was always disposed to be liberal he practically waived the dowry and only urged that the lady should come at once before the winter was too far advanced when he suggested that she should come from her home down the rhine through holland and thence by sea to england the envoys prayed that she might go through germany and flanders by land to calais and so across for said they by sea there will be great peril of capture and insult by some too zealous subjects of the emperor Quote, besides they fear lest the time of year being now cold and tempestuous she might there 
though she never were so well ordered take such cold or other disease considering she never was before upon the seas as should be to her great peril she is moreover young and beautiful and if she should be transported by sea they fear much how it might alter her complexion End quote. no sooner was the marriage treaty signed than splendid preparations were made for the reception of the king's coming bride the lord admiral fitzwilliam was ordered to prepare a fleet of ten vessels to escort her from calais repairs and redecorations of the royal residences went on apace and especially in the queen's apartments where again the initials of poor jane had to be altered to those of her successor and the quote, principal lords have bought much cloth of gold and silk a thing unusual for them except for some great solemnity end quote. the conclusion of the treaty was a triumph for cromwell and the protestant party in henry's council and the commissioners who signed it reflect the fact cranmer cromwell the duke of suffolk lord chancellor audley and lord admiral fitzwilliam were all of them inclined to the reforming side whilst bishop tunstall though on the catholic side was a personal friend of the king and the new man hertford jane seymour's brother though not one of the commissioners gave emphatic approval of the match Quote, i am as glad he wrote to cromwell of the good resolution of the marriage as ever i was of a thing since the birth of the prince for i think the king's highness could not in christendom marry in any place meet for his grace's honour that should be less prejudicial to his majesty's succession End quote. henry himself was in his usual vaunting mood about the alliance he had long desired he said to cement a union with the german confederation and could now disregard both france and the emperor besides his influence would suffice to prevent the lutherans from going too far in their religious innovations as for the lady he had only one male child and he was convinced that his desire for more issue could not be better fulfilled quote, than with the said lady who is of convenient age healthy temperament elegant stature and endowed with other graces End quote the news of the engagement was ill received by francis and charles they became more ostentatiously friendly than ever and their ambassadors in london were inseparable when Marillac and the emperor's temporary envoy went together to tell cromwell that the emperor was so confident of the friendship of francis that he was riding through france from spain to flanders the english minister quite lost his composure he was informed he told the ambassadors that this meeting of the monarchs was quote, merely with the view to making war on this poor king henry who aimed at nothing but peace and friendship end quote. ominous mutterings came too from flanders at the scant courtesy henry had shown in throwing over the match with the duchess of milan in the midst of the negotiation cromwell was therefore full of anxiety whilst the elaborate preparations were being made in calais and in england for the new queen's reception not only was a fresh household to be appointed the nobility and gentry and their retinue summoned fine clothes galore ordered or enjoined for others the towns on the way from dover to be warned of the welcome expected from them and the hundred details dependent upon the arrival and installation of the king's fourth wife but henry himself had to be carefully handled to prevent the fears engendered by the attitude of his rivals causing him to turn to the party opposed to cromwell before the protestant marriage was effected in the meanwhile anne with a great train of guards and courtiers three hundred horsemen strong 
rode from Dusseldorf towards Calais, through Cleves, Antwerp, Bruges, and Dunkirk. It was ordered that Lord Lyle, Lord Deputy of Calais, should meet the Queen on the English frontier near Gavlin, and that at St. Pierre, Lord Admiral Fitzwilliam, who had a fleet of fifty sail in the harbor, should greet her in the name of his king, gorgeously dressed in blue velvet, smothered with gold embroidery, and faced with crimson satin, royal blue and crimson, the king's colors, in velvet, damask, and silk, being the universal wear, even of the sailors and men-at-arms. The aged Duke of Suffolk and the Lord Warden were to receive her on her landing at Dover, and at Canterbury she was to be welcomed and entertained by Archbishop Cranmer. Norfolk and a great company of armed nobles were to greet the new queen on the downs beyond Rochester, whilst the queen's household, with Lady Margaret Douglas, the king's niece, and the Duchess of Richmond, his daughter-in-law, were to join her at Deptford and the whole vast and glittering multitude were to convey her thence to where the king's pavilions were erected for her reception at Blackheath. In the midwinter twilight of early morning on the 11th December 1539, Anne's cavalcade entered the English town of Calais, and during the long time she remained weather-bound there, she was entertained as sumptuously as the nobles and townsmen could entertain her the day she had passed through dunkirk in the emperor's dominions just before coming to calais a sermon was preached against her and all lutherans but with that exception no molestation was offered to her the ship that was to carry her over dressed fore and aft with silken flags streamers and banners was exhibited to her admiration by Fitzwilliam. Royal salutes thundered welcome to her. Bands of martial music clashed in her honor, and banquets and jousts were held to delight her. Good sense and modesty were shown by her in many ways at this somewhat trying time. Her principal mentor, Chancellor Alciliger, begged Fitzwilliam to advise her as to her behavior and she herself asked him to teach her some game of cards that the king of england usually played he taught her a game which he calls scent which she did learn with good grace and countenance and she then begged him to come to sup with her and bring some noble folk with him to sit with her in the german way he told her that this was not the fashion in england but he accepted her invitation thus anne began betimes to prepare for what she hoped greatly daring would be a happily married life in england whilst the wind and the waves thundering outside the harbor forbade all attempt to convey the bride to her now expectant bridegroom henry had intended to keep christmas with unusual state at greenwich in the company of his new wife but week after week slipped by with the wind still contrary and it was the twenty seventh december before a happy change of weather enabled anne to set sail for her new home she had a stout heart for the passage was a rough though rapid one when she landed at deal and thence after a short rest was conducted in state to dover castle the wind blew blusterously and the hail and winter sleet drove quote, continually in her grace's face end quote. but she would hear of no delay in her journey forward quote, so desirous was her grace of reaching the king's presence end quote. at canterbury the citizens received her with a great torchlight procession and peals of guns quote, in her chamber were forty or fifty gentlewomen waiting to receive her in velvet bonnets all of which she took very joyously and was so glad to see the king's subjects resorting to her so lovingly that she forgot all the foul weather 
and was very merry at supper. End quote. And so, with an evident determination to make the best of everything, Anne rode onward, accompanied by an ever growing cavalcade of sumptuously bedizened folk, through Sittingbourne, and so to Rochester, where she was lodged at the bishop's palace, and passed New Year's Day, 1540. News daily reached the king of his bride's approach whilst he remained consumed with impatience at greenwich at each successive stage of her journey forward supple courtiers had written to henry glowing accounts of the beauty and elegance of the bride fitzwilliam from calais had been especially emphatic and the king's curiosity was piqued to see the paragon he was to marry at length when he knew that Anne was on the way from Sittingbourne to Rochester, and would arrive there on New Year's Eve, he told Cromwell that he himself, with an escort of eight gentlemen clad in grey, would ride to Rochester incognito to get early sight of his bride, quote, whom he sorely desired to see, end quote. He went, he said, quote, to nourish love, end quote and full of hopeful anticipation henry on a great courser ambered over gad's hill from gravesend to rochester soon after dawn on new year's day fifteen forty with sir anthony brown his master of the horse on one side and sir john russell on the other it was in accordance with the chivalrous tradition that this should be done and that the lady should pretend to be extremely surprised when she was informed who her visitor was so that anne must have made a fair guess as to what was coming when sir anthony brown riding a few hundred yards ahead of his master entered her presence and kneeling told her that he had brought a new year's gift for her when the courtier raised his eyes and looked critically upon the lady before him experienced as he was in henry's tastes quote, he was never more dismayed in his life to see her so far unlike that which was reported End quote. anne was about twenty-four years of age but looked older and her frame was large bony and masculine which in the facial portraits that had been sent to henry was not indicated and her large low german features deeply pitted with the ravages of smallpox were as brown knew the very opposite of the type of beauty which would be likely to stimulate a gross unwholesome voluptuary of nearly fifty so with a sinking heart he went back to his master not daring to prepare him for what was before him by any hint of disparagement of the bride as soon as henry entered with russell and brown and saw for himself his countenance fell and he made a wry face which those who knew him understood too well and they trembled in their shoes at what was to come of it he nevertheless greeted the lady politely raising her from the kneeling position she had assumed and kissed her upon the cheek passing a few minutes in conversation with her about her long journey he had brought with him some rich presents of sables and other furs but he was quote, so marvelously astonished and abashed end quote, that he had not the heart to give them to her but sent them the next morning with a cold message by sir anthony brown in the night the royal barge had been brought round from gravesend to rochester and the king returned to greenwich in the morning by water he had hardly passed another word with anne since the first meeting though they had supped together and it was with a sulky frowning face that he took his place in the shelter of his galley turning to russell he asked do you think this woman so fair or of such beauty as report has made her russell courtier-like fenced with the question by feigning to misunderstand it 
i should hardly take her to be fair he replied but of brown complexion alas continued the king whom should men trust i promise you i see no such thing in her as hath been showed unto me of her and am ashamed that men have so praised her as they have done i like her not to brown he was quite as outspoken i see nothing in this woman as men report of her he said angrily and i am surprised that wise men should make such reports as they have done whereat brown who knew that his brother-in-law fitzwilliam was one of the wise men referred to scented danger and was silent the english ladies too who had accompanied anne on the road began to whisper in confidence to their spouses that anne's manners were coarse and that she would never suit the king's fastidious taste but he who had most to lose and most to fear was cromwell it was he who had drawn and driven his master into the protestant friendship against the emperor and the pope of which the marriage was to be the pledge and he had repeated eagerly for months the inflated praises of anne's beauty sent by his agents and friends in order to pique henry to the union he knew that vigilant enemies of himself and his policy were around him watching for their opportunity norfolk and the older nobles the pope's bishops and above all able ambitious stephen gardiner now sulking at winchester determined to supplant him if he could when on friday the second january henry entered his working closet at greenwich after his water journey from rochester cromwell asked him quote, how he liked the lady anne end quote. the king answered gloomily nothing so well as she was spoken of adding that if he had known before as much as he knew then she should never have come within his realm in the grievous self-pity usual with him in his perplexity he turned to cromwell the man hitherto so fertile in expedients and wailed what is the remedy cromwell for once at a loss could only express his grief and say he knew of none in very truth it was too late now to stop the state reception for preparations had been ordered for such a pageant as had rarely been seen in england cromwell had intended it for his own triumph and as marking the completeness of his victory over his opponents once more ambition overleaped itself and the day that was to establish cromwell's supremacy sealed his doom end of section 21section 22 of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain 1536 through 1540 plot and counterplot jane seymour and anne of cleves part four what anne thought of the situation is not on record she had seen little of the world outside the coarse boorishness of a petty low german court she was neither educated nor naturally refined and she probably looked upon the lumpishness of her lover as an ordinary thing in any case she bated none of her state and apparent contentment as she rode gorgeously bedight with her great train towards greenwich at the foot of shooter's hill there had been erected an imposing pavilion of cloth of gold and diverse other tents warmed with fires of perfumed wood and here a company of ladies awaited the coming of the queen on saturday third january fifteen forty a broad way was cleared from the pavilion across woolwich common and blackheath for over two miles to the gates of greenwich park 
and the merchants and corporation of london joined with the king's retinue in lining each side of this long lane cromwell had recently gained the goodwill of foreigners settled in london by granting them exemption from special taxation for a term of years and he had claimed as some return that they should make the most of this day of triumph accordingly the german merchants of the steelyard the venetians the spaniards the french and the rest of them donned new velvet coats and jaunty crimson caps with white feathers each master with a smartly clad servant behind him and so stood each side of the way to do honour to the bride at the greenwich end of the route then came the english merchants the corporation of london the knights and gentlemen who had been bidden from the country to do honour to their new queen the gentlemen pensioners the halberdiers and around the tent the nobler courtiers and queen's household all brave in velvet and gold chains behind the ranks of gentlemen and servitors there was ample room and verge enough upon the wide heath for the multitudes who came to gape and cheer king harry's new wife more than a little perplexed in many cases as to the minimum amount of enthusiasm which would be accepted as seemly cromwell himself marshalled the ranks on either side quote, running up and down with a staff in his hand for all the world as if he had been running postman end quote, as an eyewitness tells us it was midday before the queen's procession rode down shooter's hill to the tents where she was met by her official household and greeted with a long latin oration which she did not understand whilst she sat in her chariot then heartily kissing the great lady sent to welcome her she alighted and entered the tent to rest and warm herself over the perfumed fires and to don even more magnificent raiment than that she wore when she was ready for her bridegroom's coming she must have been a blaze of magnificence she wore a wide skirt of cloth of gold with a raised pattern in bullion and no train and her head was covered first with a close cap and then a round cap covered with pearls and fronted with black velvet whilst her bodice was one glittering mass of precious stones when swift messengers brought news that the king was coming anne mounted at the door of the tent a beautiful white palfrey and surrounded by her servitors each bearing upon his golden coat the black lion of cleves and followed by her train she set forth to meet her husband henry unwieldy and lame as he was with a running ulcer in his leg was as vain and fond of pomp as ever and outdid his bride in splendour his coat was of purple velvet cut like a frock embroidered all over with a flat gold pattern interlined with narrow gold braid and with gold lace laid crosswise over it all a velvet overcoat surmounted the gorgeous garment lined also with gold tissue the sleeves and breast held together with great buttons of diamonds rubies and pearls his sword and belt were covered with emeralds and his bonnet and undercap were quote, so rich in jewels that few men could value them End quote. whilst across his shoulders he wore a baldric composed of precious stones and pearls that was the wonder of all beholders the fat giant thus bedizened bestrode a great war-horse to match and almost equally magnificent and preceded by heralds and trumpeters followed by the great officers the royal household and the bishops and accompanied by the duke philip of bavaria just betrothed to the princess mary henry rode through the long lane of his velvet-clad admirers to meet anne hard by the cross upon blackheath when she approached him he doffed his jewelled bonnet and bowed low and then embraced her whilst she with every appearance of delight and duty expressed her pleasure at meeting him thus 
together with their great cavalcade united over five thousand horsemen strong they rode in the waning light of a midwinter afternoon to greenwich and as one who saw it but knew not the tragedy that lurked behind the splendor exclaimed quote, oh what a sight was this to see so goodly a prince and so noble a king to ride with so fair a lady of so goodly a stature and so womanly a countenance and a special of so good qualities i think no creature could see them but his heart rejoiced End quote. there was one heart at all events that did not rejoice and that was henry's he went heavily through the ceremony of welcoming home his bride in the great hall at greenwich and then led her to her chamber but no sooner had he got quit of her than retiring to his own room he summoned cromwell well he said is it not as i told you say what they will she is nothing like so fair as she was reported to be she is well and seemly but nothing else cromwell confused could only mumble something about her having a queenly manner but henry wanted a way out of his bargain rather than reconciliation to it and he ordered cromwell to summon the council at once norfolk suffolk cromwell cranmer fitzwilliam and tunstall to consider the prior engagement made between anne and the duke of lorraine's son the question had already been discussed and disposed of and the revival of it thus at the eleventh hour shows how desperate henry was the council assembled immediately and summoned the german envoys who had negotiated the marriage and were now in attendance on anne the poor men were thunderstruck at the point of an impediment to the marriage being raised then and begged to be allowed to think the matter over till the next morning sunday when they met the council again in the morning they could only protest that the prior covenant had only been a betrothal which had never taken effect and had been formally annulled if there was any question about it however they offered to remain as prisoners in england until the original deed of revocation was sent from cleves when this answer was carried to henry he broke out angrily that he was not being well treated and upbraided cromwell for not finding a loophole for escape he did not wish to marry the woman he said quote, if she had not come so far and such great preparations made and for fear of making a ruffle in the world of driving her brother into the hands of the emperor and the french king he never would marry her End quote. cromwell was apparently afraid to encourage him in the idea of repudiation and said nothing and after dinner the king again summoned the council to his presence to them he bitterly complained of having been deceived would the lady he asked make a formal protestation before notaries that she was free from all contracts of course she would and did as soon as she was asked but henry's idea in demanding this is evident if she had refused it would give a pretext for delay but if she did as desired and by any quibble the prior engagement was found to be valid her protestation to the contrary would be good grounds for a divorce but still henry would much rather not have married her at all oh is there no other remedy he asked despairingly on monday after anne had made her protestation must i needs against my will put my neck into the yoke cromwell could give him no comfort and left him gloomy at the prospect of going through the ceremony on the morrow on tuesday morning when he was apparelled for the wedding as usual in a blaze of magnificence of crimson satin and cloth of gold cromwell entered his chamber on business my lord said henry if it were not to satisfy the world in my realm i would not do what i must do this day for any earthly thing 
but withal he went through it as best he might though with heavy heart and gloomy countenance and the unfortunate bride we are told was remarked to be quote, demure and sad end quote, as well as she might be when her husband and cranmer placed upon her finger the wedding ring with the ominous inscription quote, god send me well to keep end quote. early the next morning cromwell entered the king's chamber between hope and fear and found henry frowning and sulky how does your grace like the queen he asked henry grumblingly and not quite relevantly replied that he cromwell was not everybody and then he broke out surely my lord as you know i liked her not well before but now i like her much worse with an incredible grossness and want of common decency he then went into certain details of his wife's physical qualities that had disgusted him and turned him against her he did not believe from certain peculiarities that he described that she was a maid he said but so far as he was concerned he was so quote, struck to the heart end quote, that he had left her as good a maid as he had found her nor was the king more reticent with others he was free with his details to the gentlemen of his chamber denny heniage and others as to the signs which it pleased him to consider suspicious as touching his wife's previous virtue and protested that he never could or would consummate the marriage though he professed later that for months after the wedding he did his best to overcome his repugnance and lived constantly in contact with his wife but he never lost sight of the hope of getting free if he did not find means soon to do so he said he should have no more issue his conscience told him that tender conscience of his that anne was not his legal wife and he turned to cromwell for a remedy and found none for cromwell knew that the breaking up of the protestant union upon which he had staked his future would inevitably mean now the rise of his rivals and his own ruin he fought stoutly for his position though norfolk and gardiner were often now at the king's ear his henchman dr barnes who had gone to germany as envoy during the marriage negotiations was a protestant and in a sermon on justification by faith he violently attacked gardiner the latter in spite of cromwell and cranmer secured from the king an order that barnes should humbly and publicly recant he did so at easter at the spittal but at once repeated the offence and he and two other clergymen who thought like him were burnt for heresy men began to shake their heads and look grave now as they spoke of cromwell and cranmer but the secretary stood sturdily and in may seemed as if he would turn the tables upon his enemies once indeed he threatened the duke of norfolk roughly with the king's displeasure and at the opening of parliament he took the lead as usual expressing the king's sorrow at the religious bitterness in the country and demanding large supplies for the purposes of national defence but though still apparently as powerful as ever and more than ever overbearing he dared not yet propose to the king a way out of the matrimonial tangle going home to austin friars from the sitting of parliament on the seventh june he told his new colleague ryothlessly that the thing that principally troubled him was that the king did not like the queen and that his marriage had never been consummated ryothlessly whose sympathies were then catholic suggested that quote, some way might be devised for the relief of the king end quote. ah sighed cromwell who knew what such a remedy would mean to him quote, but it is a great matter end quote. 
the next day ryothlessly returned to the subject and begged cromwell to devise some means of relief for the king quote, for if he remained in this grief and trouble they should all smart for it some day end quote. yes replied cromwell it is true but it is a great matter mary exclaimed ryothlessly out of patience i grant that but let a remedy be searched for but cromwell had no remedy yet but one that would ruin himself and that he dared not propose so he shook his head sadly and changed the subject the repudiation of anne was as cromwell said a far greater matter than at first sight appeared the plan to draw into one confederation for the objects of england the german protestants the king of denmark and the duke of cleves whose seizure of gelderland had brought him in opposition to the emperor was the most threatening that had faced charles for years his own city of ghent was an open revolt and francis after all was but a fickle ally if once more the french king turned from him and made friends with the turk and the lutherans then indeed would the imperial power have cause to tremble and henry to rejoice cromwell had striven hard to cement the protestant combination but again and again he had been thwarted by his rivals the passage of the six articles against his wish although the execution of the act was suspended at cromwell's instance had caused the gravest distrust on the part of hans frederick and the landgrave of hesse and if henry were encouraged to repudiate his german wife not only would her brother already in negotiation with the imperial agents for the investiture of Geldris, and his marriage with the emperor's niece the duchess of milan be at once driven into opposition to england but hans frederick and hesse would also abandon henry to the tender mercies of his enemies the only way to avoid such a disaster following the repudiation of anne was first to drive a wedge of distrust between charles and francis now in close confederacy in january the emperor had surprised the world by his boldness in traversing france to his flemish dominions he was feasted splendidly by francis and escaped unbetrayed but during his stay in france desperate attempts were made by wyatt henry's ambassador with charles bonner the ambassador in france and by the duke of norfolk who went in february on a special mission to sow discord between the allied sovereigns and not without some degree of success charles during his stay in france was badgered by wyatt into saying some hasty words which were deliberately twisted by norfolk into a menace to france and england alike francis was reminded with irritating iteration that charles had plenty of smiles and soft words for his french friends but avoided keeping his promises about the cession of milan or anything else so in france those who were in favor of the imperial alliance the montmorencys and the queen declined in their hold over francis and their opponents the Birons, the queen of navarre francis's sister and the duchess of etampes his mistress planned with henry's agents for an understanding with england this as may be supposed was not primarily cromwell's policy but that of norfolk and his friends because its success would inevitably mean the conciliation of the german princes and cleves by the emperor and the break-up of the protestant confederacy and england by which cromwell must now stand or fall as early as april marillac the french ambassador in england foretold the great change that was coming the arrest of barnes gerard and jerome for anti-catholic teaching and the persecutions everywhere for those who offended 
ever so slightly in the same way presaged cromwell's fall Quote, cranmer and cromwell writes merillac do not know where they are within a few days there will be seen in this country a great change in many things which this king begins to make in his ministers recalling those he had disgraced and degrading those he had raised cromwell is tottering for all those now recalled were dismissed at his request and bear him no little grudge amongst others the bishops of winchester that is gardiner durham and bath men of great learning and experience who are now summoned to the privy council it is said that tunstall that is durham will be vicar general and bath privy seal which are cromwell's principal offices if he holds his own that is cromwell it will only be because of his close assiduity in business though he is very rude in his demeanor he does nothing without consulting the king and is desirous of doing justice especially to foreigners End quote. this was somewhat premature but it gives a good idea of the process that was going on there is no doubt that cromwell believed in his ability to keep his footing politically for he was anything but rigid in his principles and if the friendship with france initiated by his rivals had as it showed signs of doing developed into an alliance that would enable henry both to dismiss his fears of the emperor and throw over the protestants he would probably have accepted the situation and have proposed a means for henry to get rid of his distasteful wife but this opportunism did not suit his opponents in henry's council they wanted to get rid of the man quite as much as they did his policy for his insolence had stung them to the quick great nobles as most of them were and he the son of a blacksmith some other means therefore than a mere change of policy was necessary to dislodge the strong man who guided the king parliament had met on the twelfth april and it was managed with cromwell's usual boldness and success as if to mark that his great ability was still paramount he was made earl of essex and great chamberlain of england in the following week but the struggle in the council and around the king continued unabated henry was warned by cromwell's enemies of the danger of allowing religious freedom to be carried too far and of thus giving the catholic powers an excuse for executing the pope's decree of deprivation against him he was reminded that the emperor and francis were still friends that the latter was suspiciously preparing for war and that henry's brother-in-law the duke of cleves quarrel with the emperor might drag england into war for the sake of a beggarly german dukedom of no importance or value to her on the other hand cromwell would point out to henry the disobedience and insolence of the catholics who questioned his spiritual supremacy and caused churchmen who advocated a reconciliation with rome to be imprisoned clearly such a position could not continue indefinitely and norfolk anticipated cromwell by playing the final trump card that of arousing henry's personal fears the word treason and a hint that anything could be intended against his person always brought henry to heel what the exact accusation against cromwell was no one knows though it was whispered at the time that the nobles had told henry that cromwell had amassed great stores of money and arms and maintained a vast number of dependents fifteen hundred men it was asserted wore his livery with a sinister object some said to marry the princess mary and make himself king and that he had received a great bribe from the duke of cleves and the protestants to bring about the marriage of anne others said that he had boasted 
that he was to receive a crown abroad from a foreign potentate that is the emperor and that he had talked of defending the new doctrines at the sword's point no such accusations however are on official record and there is no doubt that the real reason for his arrest was the animosity of the aristocratic and catholic party against him acting upon the king's fears and his desire to get rid of anne of cleves on the ninth june parliament was still sitting discussing the religious question with a view to the settlement of some uniform doctrine the lords of the council left the chamber to go across to whitehall to dinner before midday and as they wended their way across the great courtyard of westminster a high wind carried away cromwell's flat cap from his head it was the custom when one gentleman was even accidentally uncovered for those who were with him also to doff their bonnets but as an attendant ran and recovered cromwell's flying headgear on that occasion the haughty minister looked grimly round and saw all his colleagues once so humble holding their own caps upon their heads a high wind indeed must this be sneered cromwell to blow my cap off and for you to need hold yours on he must have known that ill foreboded for during dinner no one spoke to him the meal finished cromwell went to the council chamber with the rest and as was his custom stood at a window apart to hear appeals and applications to him and when these were disposed of he turned to the table to take his usual seat with the rest on this occasion norfolk stopped him and told him that it was not meet that traitors should sit amongst loyal gentlemen i am no traitor shouted cromwell dashing his cap upon the ground but the captain of the guard was at the door and still protesting the wretched man was hurried to the water gate and rode swiftly to the tower surrounded by halberdiers norfolk as he left the council chamber tearing off the fallen minister's badge of the garter as a last stroke of ignominy cromwell knew he was doomed for by the iniquitous act that he himself had forged for the ruin of others he might be attainted and condemned legally without his presence or defence mercy 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 he wrote to the king in his agony but for him there was as little mercy as he had shown to others his death was a foregone conclusion for henry's fears had been aroused but cromwell had to be kept alive long enough for him to furnish such information as would provide a plausible pretext for the repudiation of anne he was ready to do all that was asked of him to swear to anything the king wished he testified that he knew the marriage had never been consummated and never would be that the king was dissatisfied from the first and had complained that the evidence of the nullification of the prior contract with the heir of lorraine was insufficient that the king had never given full consent to the marriage but had gone through the ceremony under the compulsion of circumstances and with mental reservation when all this was sworn to cromwell's hold upon the world was done upon evidence now unknown he was condemned for treason and heresy without being heard in his own defence and on the twenty eighth july fifteen forty he stood a sorry figure upon the scaffold in the tower he had been a sinner he confessed and had travailed after the things of this world but he fervently avowed that he was a good catholic and no heretic and had harbored no thought of evil towards his sovereign but protestations availed not and his head the cleverest head in england was pitiably hacked off by a bungling headsman before that happened the repudiation of anne of cleves was complete 
and a revival of the aristocratic and catholic influence in england was an accomplished fact end of section 22section twenty three of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain fifteen forty through fifteen forty two the king's good sister and the king's bad wife the lutherans and english catholics part one during her few months of incomplete wedlock with the king anne had felt uneasily the strange anomaly of her position she accompanied henry in his daily life at bed and board and shared with him the various festivities held in celebration of the marriage the last of which was a splendid tournament given by the bachelor courtiers at durham house on may day she had studied english diligently and tried to please her husband in a hundred well-meant but ungainly ways she had by her jovial manner and real kindness of heart become very popular with those around her but yet she got no nearer to the glum bloated man by her side in truth she was no fit companion for him either physically or mentally her lack of the softer feminine charms her homely manners her lack of learning and of musical talent on which henry set so much store were not counterbalanced by strong will or commanding ability which might have enabled her to dominate him or by feminine craft by which he might have been captivated she was a woman however and could not fail to know that her repudiation in some form was in the air it was one of the accusations against cromwell that he had divulged to her what the king had said about the marriage but so far from doing so he had steadily avoided compliance with her oft-repeated requests for an interview with him shortly before cromwell's fall henry had complained to him that anne's temper was becoming tart and then cromwell thought well to warn her through her chamberlain that she should try to please the king more the poor woman desirous of doing right tactlessly flew to the other extreme and her cloying fondness aroused henry's suspicion that cromwell had informed her of his intention to get rid of her anne's lutheranism moreover had begun to grate upon the tender conscience of her husband under the prompting of the catholic party although she scrupulously followed the english ritual and later became a professed catholic and to all these reasons which now made henry doubly anxious for prompt release was added another more powerful than any one of anne's maids of honor was a very beautiful girl of about eighteen catherine the orphan daughter of lord edmund howard brother of the duke of norfolk and consequently first cousin of anne boleyn during the first months of his unsatisfying union with anne henry's eyes must have been cast covetously upon catherine for in april fifteen forty she received a grant from him of a certain felon's property and in the following month twenty-three quilts of quilted sarsnet were given to her out of the royal wardrobe when cromwell was still awaiting his fate in the tower and whispers were rife of what was intended against the queen marillac the observant french ambassador wrote in cipher to his master telling him that there was another lady in the case and a week afterwards sixth july he amplified his hints by saying that either for that reason or some other anne had been sent to richmond on the false pretense that plague had appeared in london and that henry very far from joining her there as he had promised had not left london and was about to make a progress in another direction 
Marillac rightly says that, quote, if there had been any suspicion of plague, the king would not stay for any affair, however great, as he is the most timid person that could be in such a case. End quote. The true reason why Anne was sent away was Henry's invariable cowardice that made him afraid to face a person whom he was wronging. Gardiner had promptly done what Cromwell had been ruined for not doing, and had submitted to the king within a few days of the arrest of his rival a complete plan by which Anne might be repudiated. First, certain ecclesiastics, under oath of secrecy, were to be asked for their opinion as to the best way to proceed, and the council was thereupon to discuss and settle their procedure in accordance. The question of the previous contract and its repudiation was to be examined. The manner in which the queen herself was to be approached was to be arranged, and evidence from everyone to whom the king had spoken at the time as to his lack of consent and consummation was to be collected. All this had to be done by the 7th July, when the clergy met at Westminster, summoned by writ under the great seal dated the 6th, to decide whether the king's marriage was valid or not, in the circumstances detailed. The obedient Parliament, sitting with closed doors a few days previously, had, by Norfolk's orders, petitioned the king to solve certain doubts that had been raised about the marriage, and Henry, ever desirous of pleasing his faithful lieges, and to set at rest conscientious scruples, referred the question to his prelates in synod for decision. Anne, two days before this, summoned to Richmond the ambassador of her brother, who came to her at four o'clock in the morning, and she then sent for the Earl of Rutland, the chief of her household, to be present at the interview. The king, she said, had sent her a message and asked for a reply. The effect of the message was to express doubts as to the validity of their marriage, and to ask her if she was content to leave the decision of it to the English clergy. The poor woman, much perturbed, had refused to send an answer without consideration, and she had then desired that her brother's envoy should give, or at all events carry, the answer to the king. But this he refused to do, and she in her trouble could only appeal to Rutland for advice. He prated about the graciousness and virtue of the king, and assured her that he would, quote, do nothing but that should stand by the law of God, and for the discharge of his conscience and hers, and the quietness of the realm, and at the suit of all his lords and commons. End quote. The king was content to refer the question to the learned and virtuous bishops, so that she had cause to be glad rather than sorry. Anne was confused and doubtful for she did not know what was intended towards her. But, considering the helplessness of her position and the danger of resistance, she met the deputation of the council that came to her next day, 6th July, in a spirit of complete surrender. She was, she said in German, always content to obey the king, and would abide by the decision of the prelates, and with this answer, Gardiner posted back to London that night to appear at the Synod the next morning. Neither Anne nor any one for her appeared. The whole evidence, which was that already mentioned, was to show the existence of a prior contract, of the annulling of which no sufficient proofs had been produced. The avowals of the king and the queen to their confidants that the marriage had never been consummated, and never would be, and, lastly, the absence of, quote, inner consent, end quote, on the part of the king from the first. Under the pressure of Gardiner, for Cranmer, overshadowed by a cloud, and in hourly fear of Cromwell's fate, was ready to sign anything, 
the union was declared to be invalid and both parties were pronounced capable of remarriage a bill was then hurriedly rushed through parliament confirming the decision of convocation and cranmer for the third time as primate annulled his master's marriage anne was still profoundly disturbed at the fate that might be in store for her and when suffolk southampton and riothlessly went to richmond on the tenth july to obtain her acceptance of the decision she fainted at the sight of them they did their best to reassure her giving her from the king a large present of money and a specially affectionate letter she was assured that if she would acquiesce and remain in the realm she should be the king's adopted sister with precedence before all other ladies but the king's wife and daughters a large appendage should be secured to her and jewels furniture and the household of a royal princess provided for her she was still doubtful and some persuasion had to be used before she would consent to sign the letter dictated to her as the king's sister but at last she did so and was made to say that quote, though the case was hard and sorrowful for the great love she bears to his noble person yet having more regard for god and his truth than for any worldly affection she accepts the judgment praying that the king will take her as one of his most humble servants and so determine of her that she may sometimes enjoy his presence End quote. this seemed almost too good to be true when henry read it and he insisted upon its being written and signed again in german that anne might not subsequently profess ignorance of its wording when anne however was asked to write to her brother saying that she was fully satisfied she at first refused why should she write to him before he wrote to her she asked if he sent a complaint she would answer it as the king wished but after a few days she gave way on this point when further pressed so delighted was henry at so much submission to his will that he was kindness and generosity itself on the fourteenth july he sent the councillors again to richmond with another handsome present and a letter to his right dear and right entirely beloved sister thanking her gratefully for her wise and honourable proceedings Quote, as it is done in respect of god and his truth and continuing your conformity you shall find us a perfect friend content to repute you as our dearest sister End quote. he promised her four thousand pounds a year with the two royal residences of richmond and bletchingley and a welcome at court when she pleased to come in return she sent him another amiable letter and the wedding ring expressing herself fully satisfied she certainly carried out her part of the arrangement to perfection whether from fear or complacence assuring the envoys of her brother the duke that she was well treated as in a material sense indeed she was and thenceforward made the best of her life in england her brother and the german protestants were of course furiously indignant but as the injured lady expressed herself not only satisfied but delighted with her position no ground could be found for open quarrel she was probably a person of little refinement of feeling and highly appreciated the luxury and abundance with which she thenceforward was surrounded enjoying as she always did recreation and fine dress in which she was distinguished above any of henry's wives on the day after the synod had met in westminster to decide the invalidity of the marriage seventh july pate the english ambassador saw the emperor at bruges with a message from henry which foreshadowed an entire change in the foreign policy of england 
charles received pate at midnight and was agreeably surprised to learn that conscientious scruples had made henry doubt the validity of his union with anne the emperor's stiff demeanor changed at once and as the news came day by day of the progress of the separation of henry from his protestant wife the cordiality of the emperor grew towards him whilst england itself was in full catholic reaction the fall of cromwell had as it was intended to do provided henry with a scapegoat the spoliation and destruction of the religious houses by which the king and many of the catholic nobles had profited enormously was laid to the dead man's door the policy of plundering the church of union with lutherans and the favoring of heresy had been the work of the wicked minister and not of the good king that ill-served and ungratefully used king who was always innocent and never in the wrong who simply differed from other good catholics in his independence of the bishop of rome merely a domestic disagreement with such suave hypocrisy as this difficulties were soon smoothed over and to prove the perfect sincerity with which henry proceeded protestants like barnes gerard and jerome were burnt impartially side by side with catholics who did not accept the spiritual supremacy of henry over the church in england such as abel powell featherstone and cook the catholic and aristocratic party in england had thus triumphed all along the line by the aid of anti-protestant churchmen like gardiner and tunstall their heavy-handed enemy cromwell had gone bearing the whole responsibility for the past the king had been flattered by exoneration from blame and pleased by the release of his wife so deftly and pleasantly effected no one but cromwell was to blame for anything they were all good catholics whom the other catholic powers surely could not attack for a paltry quarrel with the pope and best of all the ecclesiastical spoil was secured to them and their heirs forever for they all maintained the supremacy of the king in england good catholics though they were but withal they knew that henry must have someone close to him to keep him in the straight way the nobles were not afraid of cranmer for he kept in the background and was a man of poor spirit and moreover for the moment the danger was hardly from the reformers the nobles had triumphed by the aid of gardiner and gardiner was now the strong spirit near the king but the aims of the nobles were somewhat different from those of churchmen and a catholic bishop as the sole director of the national policy might carry them farther than they wished to go henry's concupiscence must therefore once more be utilized and the woman upon whom he cast his eyes if possible made into a political instrument to forward the faction that favored her gardiner was nothing loath for he was sure of himself but how eager norfolk and his party were to take advantage of henry's fancy for catherine howard to effect her lodgment by his side as queen is seen by the almost indecent haste with which they began to spread the news of her rise even before the final decision was given as to the validity of the marriage with anne on the twelfth july a humble dependent of the howards mistress joan balmore of whom more will be heard wrote to catherine congratulating her upon her coming greatness and begging for an office about her person quote, for i trust the queen of britain will not forget her secretary End quote. less than a fortnight later twenty first july the french ambassador gives as a piece of gossip that catherine howard was already pregnant by the king and that the marriage was therefore being hurried on exactly when or where the wedding took place is not known 
but it was a private one and by the eleventh august catherine was called queen and acknowledged as such by all the court on the fifteenth Marillac wrote that her name had been added to the prayers in the church service and that the king had gone on a hunting expedition presumably accompanied by his new wife whilst quote, madame de cleves so far from claiming to be married is more joyous than ever and wears new dresses every day End quote. everybody thus was well satisfied except the protestants henry indeed was delighted with his tiny sparkling girl wife and did his best to be a gallant bridegroom to her though there was none of the pomp and splendor that accompanied his previous nuptials the autumn of fifteen forty was passed in a leisurely progress through the shires to grafton where most of the honeymoon was spent the rose crowned was chosen by henry as his bride's personal cognizance and the most was made of her royal descent and connections by the enamoured king the king is so amorous of her wrote Marillac in september that he cannot treat her well enough and caresses her more than he did the others even thus early however whispers were heard of the king's fickleness once it was said that anne of cleves was pregnant by him and he would cast aside catherine in her favor and shortly afterwards he refrained from seeing his new wife for ten days together because of something she had done to offend him the moral deterioration of henry's character which had progressed in proportion with the growing conviction of his own infallibility and immunity had now reached its lowest depth he was rapidly becoming more and more bulky and his temper never angelic was now irascible in the extreme his health was bad and increasing age had made him more than ever impatient of contradiction or restraint and no consideration but that of his own interest and safety influenced him the policy which he adopted under the guidance of gardiner and norfolk was one of rigorous enforcement of the six articles and at the same time of his own spiritual supremacy in england all chance of a coalition of henry with the lutherans was now out of the question squire henry means to be god and to do as pleases himself said luther at the time and the emperor freed from that danger and faced with the greater peril of a coalition of the french and turks industriously endeavored to come to some modus vivendi with his german electors the rift between charles and francis was daily widening and henry himself was aiding the process to his full ability for he knew that whilst they were disunited he was safe but for the first time in his reign except when he defied the pope he adopted a policy probably his own and not that of his ministers calculated to offend both the catholic powers whilst he was alienated from the reforming element on the continent by an act of parliament the ancient penal laws against foreign denizens were re-enacted and all foreigners but established merchants were to be expelled the country whilst alien merchants resident were to pay double taxation the taxation of englishmen enormous under cromwell was now recklessly increased with the set purpose of keeping the lieges poor just as the atrocious religious executions were mainly to keep them submissive and incapable of questioning the despot's will but though englishmen might be stricken dumb by persecution the expulsion or oppression of foreigners led to much acrimony and reprisals on the part both of the emperor and francis an entirely gratuitous policy of irritation towards france on the frontier of calais and elsewhere was also adopted apparently to impress the emperor and for the satisfaction of henry's arrogance 
when he thought it might be safe to exercise it the general drift of english policy at the time was undoubtedly to draw closer to the emperor not entirely to the satisfaction of the duke of norfolk who was usually pro-french but even here the oppressive act against foreigners by which henry hoped to show charles that his friendship was worth buying made cordiality in the interim extremely difficult when chapus in the emperor's name remonstrated with the council about the new decree forbidding the export of goods from england except in english bottoms the english ministers rudely said that the king could pass what laws he liked in his own country just as the emperor could in his charles and his sister the regent of the netherlands took the hint and utterly astounded henry by forbidding goods being shipped in the netherlands in english vessels the danger was understood at once not only did this strike a heavy blow at english trade but it upset the laboriously constructed pretense of close communion with the emperor which had been used to hoodwink the french henry himself bullied and hectored as if he was the first injured party and then took chapus aside in a window bay and hinted at an alliance he said that the french were plotting against the emperor and trying to gain his henry's support which however he would prefer to give to the emperor if he wished for it henry saw indeed that he had drawn the bow too tight and was ready to shuffle out of the position into which his own arrogance had led him so gardiner was sent in the winter to see the emperor with the king's friend knevet who was to be the new resident ambassador the object of the visit being partly to impress the french and partly to persuade charles of henry's strict catholicism and so to render more difficult any such agreement being made as that aimed at by the meeting at worms between the lutheran princes and their suzerain gardiner's mission was not very successful for charles understood the move perfectly but it was not his policy then to alienate henry for he was slowly maturing his plans for crushing france utterly and hoped whilst catholic influence was paramount in england to obtain the help or at least the neutrality of henry the fall of cromwell had been hailed by catholics in england as the salvation of their faith and high hopes had attended the elevation of gardiner but the crushing taxation the arbitrary measures and above all the cruel persecution of those who however slightly questioned the king's spiritual supremacy caused renewed discontent among the extreme catholics who still looked yearningly towards cardinal pole and his house it is not probable that any yorkist conspiracy existed in england at the time the people were too much terrified for that but henry's ambassadors and agents in catholic countries had been forced sometimes to dally with the foreign view of the king's supremacy and gardiner whose methods were even more unscrupulous than those of cromwell suddenly pounced upon those of henry's ministers who might be supposed to have come into contact with the friends of the house of york pate the english ambassador with the emperor was suspicious and escaped to rome but sir thomas wyatt who had been the ambassador in spain was led to the tower handcuffed with ignominy dr mason another ambassador was also lodged in the fortress at the suggestion of bonner even sir ralph sadler one of the secretaries of state was imprisoned for a short time whilst sir john wallop the ambassador in france was recalled and consigned to a dungeon as was sir thomas palmer knight porter of calais and others though most of them were soon afterwards pardoned at the instance of catherine howard in the early spring of fifteen forty one an unsuccessful attempt was made at a catholic rising in yorkshire where the feeling was very bitter 
and though the revolt was quickly suppressed it was considered a good opportunity for striking terror into those who still doubted the spiritual supremacy of henry and resented the plunder of the monasteries the atrocious crime was perpetuated of bringing out the mother of pole the aged countess of salisbury last of the plantagenets from her prison in the tower to the headsman's block lord leonard gray was another blameless victim whilst lord dacre of the south was on a trumped-up charge of murder hanged like a common malefactor at tyburn lord lyle henry's illegitimate uncle was also kept in the tower till his death end of section twenty three section twenty four of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain fifteen forty through fifteen forty two the king's good sister and the king's bad wife the lutherans and english catholics part two when the reign of terror had humbled all men to the dust the king could venture to travel northward with the purpose of provoking and subjecting his nephew the king of scots the ally of france all this seems to point to the probability that at this time fifteen forty one henry had decided to take a share on the side of the emperor in the war which was evidently looming between charles and francis he was broken and fretful but his vanity and ambition were still boundless and gardiner whose policy and not norfolk's it undoubtedly was would easily persuade him that an alliance in war with charles could not fail to secure for him increased consideration and readmission into the circle of catholic nations whilst retaining his own supremacy unimpaired henry's pompous progress in the north accompanied by catherine occupied nearly five months till the end of october how far the young wife was influential in keeping henry to the policy just described it is impossible to say but beyond acquiescence in an occasional petition or hint it is difficult to believe that the elderly self-willed man would be moved by the thoughtless giddy girl whom he had married if the opposite had been the case norfolk's traditions and leanings would have been more conspicuous than they are in henry's actions at the time it is true that during the whole period a pretense of cordial negotiation was made for a marriage between princess mary and a french prince but it is certain now whatever norfolk may have thought at the time that the negotiation was solely in order to stimulate charles to nearer approach and to mislead francis whilst the english preparations for war and the strengthening of the garrisons towards france and scotland went steadily on an alliance with the emperor in a war with france was evidently the policy upon which henry instigated by his new adviser now depended to bring him back with flying colors into the comity of catholic sovereigns whilst bating no jot of his claims to do as he chose in his own realm such a policy was one after henry's own heart it was showy and tricky and might if successful cover him with glory as well as redound greatly to his profit in the case of the dismemberment of france but it would have been impossible whilst the union symbolized by the cleves marriage existed and seen by this light the eagerness of gardiner to find a way for the king to dismiss the wife who had personally repelled him is easily understood as well as cromwell's disinclination to do so the encouragement of the marriage with catherine howard part of the same intrigue was still further to attach the king to its promoters 
and the match was doubtless intended at the same time to conciliate norfolk and the nobles whilst gardiner carried through his policy we shall see that either by strange chance or deep design those who were opposed to this policy were the men who were instrumental in shattering the marriage that was its concomitant henry and his consort arrived at hampton court from the north on the thirtieth october fifteen forty one and to his distress he found his only son edward seriously ill of courton fever all the physicians within reach were summoned and reported to the anxious father that the child was so fat and unhealthy as to be unlikely to live long the king had now been married to catherine for fifteen months and there were no signs of probable issue strange whispers were going about on back stairs and antechambers with regard to the queen's proceedings she was known to have been a giddy neglected girl before her marriage having been brought up by her grandmother the dowager duchess of norfolk without the slightest regard for her welfare or the high rank of her family and her confidants in a particularly dissolute court were many and untrustworthy the king naturally was the last person to hear the malicious tittle-tattle of jealous waiting-maids and idle pages about the queen and though his wife's want of reserve and dignity often displeased him he lived usually upon affectionate terms with her there was other loose talk also going on to the effect that on one of the visits of anne of cleves to hampton court after henry's marriage with catherine the king and his repudiated wife had made up their differences with the consequence that anne was pregnant by him it was not true though later it gave much trouble both to henry and anne but it lent further support to the suggestions that were already being made that the king would dismiss catherine and take anne back again the air was full of such rumors some prompted as we shall see by personal malice others evidently by the opponents of gardiner's policy which was leading england to a war with france and a close alliance with the imperial champion of catholicism on the second november henry still in distress about the health of his son attended mass as usual in the chapel at hampton court and as he came out cranmer prayed for a private interview with him the archbishop had for many months been in the background for gardiner would brook no competition but cranmer was personally a favorite with the king cromwell said once that henry would forgive him anything and when they were alone cranmer put him in possession of a shameful story that a few days before had been told to him which he had carefully put into writing and after grave discussion with the earl of hertford seymour and the lord chancellor audley had determined to hand to the king the conjunction of cranmer seymour and audley as the trio that thought it their duty to open henry's eyes to the suspicions cast upon his wife is significant they were all of them in sympathy with the reformed religion and against the norfolk and gardiner policy and it is difficult to escape from the conclusion that however true may have been the statements as to catherine's behavior and there is no doubt that she was guilty of much that was laid to her charge the enlightenment of henry as to her life before and after marriage was intended to serve the political and religious ends of those who were instrumental in it the story as set forth by cranmer was a dreadful one it appears that a man named john laskells who was a strong protestant and had already foretold the overthrow of norfolk and gardiner went to cranmer and said that he had been visiting in sussex a sister of his whose married name was hall she had formerly been in the service of the howard family and of the dowager duchess of norfolk 
in whose houses Catherine Howard had passed her neglected childhood, and Laskell's, recalling the fact, had, he said, recommended his sister to apply to the young queen, whom she had known so intimately as a girl, for a place in her household. No, replied the sister, I will not do that, but I am very sorry for her. Why are you sorry for her? asked Laskell's. Mary, quoth she, because she is light, both in living and conditions, that is, behavior. The brother asked for further particulars, and thus pressed, Mary Hall related that, quote, one Francis Durham had lain in bed with her, and between the sheets in his doublet and hose, a hundred nights, and a maid in the house had said that she would lie no longer with her, Catherine, because she knew not what matrimony was. Moreover, one Manock, a servant of the Dowager Duchess, knew and spoke of a private mark upon the Queen's body. End quote. This was the document which Cranmer handed to the King, quote, not having the heart to say it by word of mouth. End quote. And it must be admitted that, as it was only a bit of second hand scandal, without corroboration, and could not refer to any period subsequent to Catherine's marriage, it did not amount to much. Henry is represented as having been inclined to make light of it, which was natural, but he nevertheless summoned Fitzwilliam, Southampton, Lord Russell, Lord Admiral, Sir Anthony Brown, and Ryothlessly, and deputed to them the inquiry into the whole matter. Fitzwilliam hurried to London, and then to Sussex, to examine Laskells and his sister, whilst the others were sent to take the depositions of Durham, who was now in Catherine's service, and was ordered to be apprehended on a charge of piracy in Ireland some time previously, and Manock, who was a musician in the household of the Duchess. On the 5th November, the ministers came to Hampton Court with the shocking admissions which they had extracted from the persons examined. Up to that time, Henry had been gay and had thought little of the affair, but now, when he heard the statements presented to him, he was overcome with grief. Quote, his heart was pierced with pensiveness, we are told, so that it was long before he could utter his sorrow, and finally, with copious tears, which was strange in his courage, opened the same. End quote. The next day, Sunday, he met Norfolk and the Lord Chancellor secretly in the fields, and then, with the closest privacy, took boat to London without bidding farewell to Catherine, leaving in the hands of his counsel the unraveling of the disgraceful business. The story, pieced together from the many different depositions, and divested of its repetitions and grossness of phraseology, may be summarized as follows. Catherine, whose mother had died early, had grown up uncared for in the house of her grandmother at Horsham, in Norfolk, and later at Lambeth, apparently living her life in common with the women servants. Whilst she was yet quite a child, certainly not more than thirteen, probably younger, Henry Manock, one of the Duchess's musicians, had taught her to play the virginals, and, as he himself professed, had fallen in love with her. The age was a licentious one, and the maids, probably to disguise their own amours, appeared to have taken a sport in promoting immoral liberties between the orphan girl and the musician, carrying backwards and forwards between the ill-matched pair tokens and messages, and facilitating secret meetings at untimely hours, and Manock deposed unblushingly to have corrupted the girl systematically and shamefully, though not criminally. On one occasion the old duchess found this scamp hugging her granddaughter, and in great anger she beat the girl, upbraided the musician, and forbade such meetings for the future. 
mary hall who first gave the information represents herself as having remonstrated indignantly with mannock for his presumption in pledging his troth as one of the other women told her he had with catherine he replied impudently that all he wanted of the girl was to seduce her and he had no doubt that he should succeed in doing so seeing the liberty she had already permitted him to take with her mary hall said that she had warned him that the howards would kill or ruin him if he did not take care catherine according to mary hall's tale when told of mannock's impudent speech had angrily said that she cared nothing for him but he managed the next time he saw her by her own contrivance to persuade her that he was so much in love as not to know what he said before long however a more dangerous lover because one of better rank appeared in the field and spoilt mannock's game this was francis durham a young gentleman of some means in the household of the duke of norfolk of whom he seems to have been a distant connection in his own confession he boldly admitted that he was in love with catherine and had promised her marriage the old duchess always had the keys of the maid's dormitory where catherine also slept brought to her chamber after the doors were locked but means were found by the women to laugh at locksmiths and the most unbridled license prevailed amongst them durham with the lovers of two of the women used to obtain access almost nightly to the dormitory where they remained feasting and rioting until two or three in the morning and there can remain little doubt that on the promise of marriage durham practically lived with catherine as his wife thus clandestinely for a considerable period whilst she was yet very young mannock who found himself supplanted thereupon wrote an anonymous letter to the duchess and left it in her pew at chapel saying that if her grace would rise again an hour after she had retired and visit the gentlewoman's chamber she would see something that would surprise her the old lady who was not free from reproach in the matter herself railed and stormed at the women and catherine who was deeply in love with durham stole the anonymous letter from her grandmother's room and showed it to him charging mannock with having written it the result of course was a quarrel and the further enlightenment of the duchess with regard to her granddaughter's connection with durham the old lady herself was afterwards accused of having introduced durham into her household for the purpose of forwarding a match between him and catherine and finally got into great trouble and danger by seizing and destroying durham's papers before the king's council could impound them but when she learnt the lengths to which the immoral connection had been carried and the shameful licentiousness that had accompanied it she made a clean sweep of the servants inculpated and brought her granddaughter to live at lambeth amongst a fresh set of people there is no doubt that catherine and durham were secretly engaged to be married and apart from the immoral features of the engagement no very great objection could have been taken to it she was a member of a very large family an orphan with no dower or prospects and her marriage with durham who was a sort of relative would have been not a glaringly unequal one with lover-like alacrity he provided her with the feminine treasures which she coveted but which her lack of means prevented her from buying artificial flowers articles of dress or materials for them trinkets and adornments not to speak of the delicacies which he brought to furnish forth the tables during the nightly orgy he had made no great secret of his engagement to and intention of marrying catherine and had shown various little tokens of her troth that she had given him on one of his piratical raids moreover he had handed to her the whole of his money 
as to his affianced wife and told her she might keep it if he came not back whilst on other occasions he had exercised his authority as her betrothed to chide her for her attentions to others when at last the old duchess learnt fully of the immoral proceedings that had been going on catherine got another severe beating and durham fled from the vengeance of the howards after the matter had blown over and catherine was living usually at lambeth durham found his way back and attempted clandestinely to renew the connection but catherine by this time was older and more experienced as beseemed a lady at court it was said that she was affianced to her cousin thomas culpepper but in any case she indignantly refused to have anything to do with durham and hotly resented his claim to interfere in her affairs so far the disclosures referred solely to misconduct previous to catherine's marriage with the king and however reprehensible this may have been it only constructively became treason post facto by reason of the concealment from the king of his wife's previous immoral life whereby the royal blood was quote, tainted end quote, and he himself injured cranmer was therefore sent to visit catherine with orders to set before her the iniquity of her conduct and the penalty prescribed by the law and then to promise her the king's mercy on certain conditions the poor girl was frantic with grief and fear when the primate entered and he in compassion spared her the first parts of his mission and began by telling her of her husband's pity and clemency the reaction from her deadly fear sent her into greater paroxysms than ever of remorse and regret this sudden mercy made her offences seem the more heinous this was about the hour six o'clock she sobbed that master heneage was wont to bring me knowledge of his grace the promise of mercy may or may not have been sincere but it is evident that the real object of cranmer's visit was to learn from catherine whether the betrothal with durham was a binding contract if that were alleged in her defence the marriage with the king was voidable as that of anne of cleves was for a similar cause and if by reason of such prior contract catherine had never legally been henry's wife her guilt was much attenuated and she and her accomplices could only be punished for concealment of fact to the king's detriment a sufficiently grave crime it is true in those days but much less grave if catherine was never legally henry's wife it may therefore have seemed good policy to offer her clemency on such conditions as would have relieved him of her presence for ever with as little obloquy as possible but other counsels eventually prevailed orders were given that she was to be sent to sion house with a small suite and no canopy of state pending further inquiry whilst the lord chancellor councillors peers bishops and judges were convened on the twelfth november and the evidence touching the queen laid before them it was decided however that durham should not be called and that all reference to a previous contract of marriage should be suppressed on the following sunday the whole of the queen's household was to be similarly informed of the offences and their gravity and to them also no reference to a prior engagement that might serve to lighten the accusations or their own responsibility was to be made catherine howard's fate if the matter had ended here would probably have been divorce on the ground of her previous immorality tainting the royal blood and lifelong seclusion but in their confessions the men and women involved had mentioned other names and on the thirteenth november the day before catherine was to be taken to sion the scope of the inquiry widened Manock, in his first examination on the fifth november 
had said that mistress catherine tilney the queen's chamberwoman a relative of the old duchess could speak as to catherine's early immoral life and when this lady found herself in the hands of ryothlessly she told some startling tales did the queen leave her chamber any night at lincoln or elsewhere during her recent progress with the king yes her majesty had gone on two occasions to lady rockford's room which could be reached by a little pair of back stairs near the queen's apartment mrs tilney and the queen's other attendant marjorie morton had attempted to accompany their mistress but had been sent back mrs tilney had obeyed and had gone to bed but marjorie had crept back up the stairs again to lady rockford's room about two o'clock in the morning marjorie came to bed in the same dormitory as the other maids jesu is not the queen abed yet asked the surprised tilney as she awoke yes in effect replied marjorie she has just retired on the second occasion catherine sent the rest of her attendants to bed and took tilney with her to lady rockford's room but the maid with lady rockford's servant were shut up in a small closet and not allowed to see who came into the principal apartments but nevertheless her suspicions were aroused by the strange messages with which she was sent by catherine to lady rockford's quote, so strange that she knew not how to utter them end quote even at hampton court lately as well as at grimsthorpe during the progress she had been bidden by the queen to ask lady rockford quote, when she should have the thing she promised her end quote. the answer being that she lady rockford was sitting up for it and would bring the queen word herself then marjorie morton was tackled by sir anthony brown she had never mistrusted the queen until the other day at hatfield quote, when she saw her majesty look out of the window to mr culpepper in such sort that she thought there was love between them end quote. whilst at hatfield the queen had given orders that none of her attendants were to enter her bedroom unless they were summoned marjorie too had been sent on mysterious secret errands to lady rockford which she could not understand and with others of the maids had considered herself slighted by the queen's preference for catherine tilney and for those who owed their position to lady rockford which lady she said she considered the principal cause of the queen's folly thus far there was nothing beyond the suspicions of jealous women but lady rockford was frightened into telling a much more damning story though she tried to make her own share in it as light as possible the queen she confessed had had many interviews in her rooms with culpepper at greenwich lincoln pontefract york and elsewhere for many months past but as culpepper stood at the farther end of the room with his foot upon the top of the back stairs so as to be ready to slip down in case of alarm and the queen talked to him at the door lady rockford professed to be ignorant of what passed between them one night she recalled the queen and herself were standing at the back door at eleven at night when a watchman came with a lantern and locked the door shortly afterwards however culpepper entered the room saying that he and his servant had picked the lock since the first suspicion had been cast upon the queen by lascelles catherine according to lady rockford had continually asked for culpepper quote, if that matter came not out she feared nothing end quote. and finally lady rockford although professing to have been asleep during some of culpepper's compromising visits declared her belief that criminal relations had existed between him and the queen culpepper according to the depositions made quite a clean breast of it though what means were adopted for making him so frank is not clear probably torture 
or the threat of it was resorted to since hertford reich and audley had much to do with the examinations whilst even the duke of norfolk and ryothlessly not to appear backward in the king's service were as anxious as their rivals to make the case complete culpepper was a gentleman of great estate in kent and elsewhere holding many houses and offices a gentleman of the chamber clerk of the armory steward and keeper of several royal manors and he had received many favors from the king with whom he ordinarily slept he deposed too and described many stolen interviews with catherine all apparently after the previous passion week fifteen forty one when the queen he said had sent for him and given him a velvet cap lady rochford according to his statement was the go-between and arranged all the assignations in her apartments whilst the queen whenever she reached a house during the progress would make herself acquainted with the back doors and back stairs in order to facilitate the meetings at pontefract she thought the back door was being watched by the king's orders and lady rochford caused her servant to keep a counter watch on one occasion he said the queen had hinted that she could favor him as a certain lady of the court had favored lord parr and when culpepper said he did not think that the queen was such a lady as the one mentioned she had replied well if i had tarried still in the maiden's chamber i would have tried you and on another occasion she had warned him that if he confessed even when he was shriven what had passed between them the king would be sure to know as he was the head of the church culpepper's animus against lady rochford is evident she had provoked him much he said to love the queen and he intended to do ill with her evidence began to grow too that not only was durham admittedly guilty with the queen before marriage but that suspicious familiarity had been resumed afterwards he himself confessed that he had been more than once in the queen's private apartment and she had given him various sums of money warning him to heed what he said which truth to tell he had not done according to other deponents end of section twenty four section twenty five of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain fifteen forty through fifteen forty two the king's good sister and the king's bad wife the lutherans and english catholics part three everybody implicated in the scandals was imprisoned mostly in the tower several members of the house of howard being put under guard and norfolk trembling for his own position showed as much zeal as any one to condemn his unfortunate niece he knew indeed at this time that he had been used simply as a cat's paw in the advances towards france and complained bitterly that the match he had secretly suggested between the princess mary and the duke of orleans was now common talk which gave ground for his enemies who were jealous of him to denounce him to the king as wishing to embrace all great affairs of state it is clear that at this period it was not only the protestants who were against norfolk but his own colleagues who were planning the alliance with the emperor which to some extent explains why such men as ryothlessly fitzwilliam and brown were so anxious to make the case of catherine and her family look as black as possible and why norfolk aided them so as not to be left behind when on the fifteenth december the old dowager duchess of norfolk his stepmother his half-brother lord william howard and his wife and his sister lady bridgewater 
were imprisoned on the charge of having been privy to catherine's doings before marriage the duke wrote as follows to the king quote, i learnt yesterday that mine ungracious mother-in-law mine unhappy brother and his wife and my lewd sister of ridgewater were committed to the tower and am sure it was not done but for some false proceeding against your majesty weighing this with the abominable deeds done by my two nieces that is catherine howard and anne boleyn and the repeated treasons of many of my kin i fear your majesty will abhor to hear speak of me or my kin again prostrate at your majesty's feet i remind your majesty that much of this has come to light through my own report of my mother-in-law's words to me when i was sent to lambeth to search durham's coffers my own truth and the small love my mother-in-law and nieces bear me make me hope and i pray your majesty for some comfortable assurance of your royal favour without which i will never desire to live Kenninghall Lodge, 15th December, 1541. On the 1st December, Culpepper and Durham had been arraigned before a special commission in Guildhall, accused of treason. The indictment set forth that before her marriage, Catherine had, quote, led an abominable, base, carnal, voluptuous, and vicious life like a common harlot whilst at other times maintaining an appearance of chastity and honesty that she led the king to love her believing her to be pure and arrogantly coupled with him in marriage End quote. that upon her and durham being charged with their former vicious life they had excused themselves by saying that they were betrothed before the marriage with the king which betrothal they falsely and traitorously concealed from the king when he married her after the marriage they attempted to renew their former vicious courses at pontefract and elsewhere the queen having procured durham's admission into her service and entrusted secret affairs to him against culpepper it was alleged that he had held secret and illicit meetings with the queen who had quote, incited him to have intercourse with her and insinuated to him that she loved him better than the king and all others similarly culpepper incited the queen and they had retained lady rockford as their go-between she having traitorously aided and abetted them End quote. it will be noticed that actual adultery is not alleged and the indictment follows very closely the deposition of the witnesses the liaison with durham before the marriage was not denied nor were the meetings with culpepper after the marriage this and the concealment were sufficient for the king's purpose without adding to his ignominy by laboring to prove the charge of adultery after pleading not guilty the two men in face of the evidence and their own admissions changed their plea to guilty and were promptly condemned to be drawn through london to tyburn quote, and there hanged cut down alive disemboweled and they still living their bowels burnt the bodies then to be beheaded and quartered end quote a brutal sentence that was carried out to the letter in durham's case only on the tenth december culpepper being beheaded although the procedure had saved the king as much humiliation as possible the affair was a terrible blow to his self-esteem as well as to his affections for he seems to have been really fond of his young wife chapus writing on the third december says that he shows greater sorrow at her loss than at any of his previous matrimonial misfortunes Quote, it is like the case of the woman who cried more bitterly at the loss of her tenth husband than for all the rest put together though they had all been good men 
but it was because she had never buried one before without being sure of the next as yet it does not seem that he has any one else in view End quote. the french ambassador a few days later wrote that quote, the grief of the king was so great that it was believed that it had sent him mad for he had called suddenly for a sword with which to kill the queen whom he had loved so much sometimes sitting in council he suddenly calls for horses without saying whither he would go sometimes he will say irrelevantly that that wicked woman had never had such delight in her incontinency as she should have torture in her death and then finally he bursts into tears bewailing his misfortune in meeting such ill-conditioned wives and blaming his counsel for this last mischief End quote. in the meanwhile henry sought such distraction as he might at oatlands and other country places solaced by music and mummers whilst norfolk in grief and apprehension lurked on his own lands and gardiner kept a firm hand upon affairs the discomfiture of the howards who had brought about the catholic reaction gave new hope to the protestants that the wheel of fate was turning in their favor anne of cleves they began to whisper had been confined of a fair boy Quote, and who should it be but the king's majesties begotten when she was at hampton court End quote. this rumor which the king apparently was inclined to believe gave great offence and annoyance to him and his council as did the severely repressed but frequent statements that he intended to take back his repudiated wife it was not irresponsible gossip alone that took this turn for on the twelfth of december the ambassador from the duke of cleves brought letters to cranmer at lambeth from chancellor osiliger who had negotiated the marriage commending to him the reconciliation of henry with anne cranmer who understood perfectly well that with gardiner as the king's factotum such a thing was impossible was frightened out of his wits by such a suggestion and promptly assured henry that he had declined to discuss it without the sovereign's orders but the envoy of cleves was not lightly shaken off and at once sought audience of henry himself to press the cause of madame anne he was assured that the king's grief at his present troubles would prevent his giving audience and the protestant envoy then tackled the council on the subject as may be supposed he met with a rebuff the lady would be better treated than ever he was told but the separation was just and final and the duke of cleves must never again request that his sister should be restored to the position of the king's wife the envoy begged that an answer might be repeated formally to him whereupon gardiner flew into a rage and said that the king would never take anne back whatever happened the envoy was afraid to retort for fear of evil consequences to anne but the duke of cleves who was now in close league with the french endeavored to obtain the aid of his new allies to forward his sister's cause in england francis however saw like everyone else that war between him and the emperor was now inevitable and was anxious not to drive henry into alliance with charles against him cleves by himself was powerless and the trend of politics in england under gardiner and with henry in his present mood was entirely unfavorable to a union with the lutherans on the continent so anne of cleves continued her placid and jovial existence as the king's good sister rather than his wife whilst the protestants of england 
soon found that they had misjudged the situation produced by Catherine Howard's fall. All that the latter really had done was to place Norfolk and the French sympathizers under a cloud and make Gardiner entirely master of the situation whilst he carried out the king's own policy. Henry returned to Greenwich for Christmas, 1541 and at once began his bargaining to sell his alliance with the emperor at as high a price as possible he had already in hand the stoppage of trade with flanders which his ministers were still laboriously and stiffly discussing with the emperor's representatives any concession in that respect would have to be paid for the french too were very anxious according to his showing for his friendship and were offering him all manner of tempting matrimonial alliances and when henry on the day after christmas day received chapus at greenwich he was all smiles but determined to make the best of his opportunities the emperor had just met with a terrible disaster at sea during his operations against algiers and had returned to spain depressed at his losses and the more ready to make terms with henry if possible chapus was a hard bargainer and it was a fair game of brag that ensued between him and henry chapus began by flattering the king quote, and got him into very high spirits by such words which the lord privy seal that is fitzwilliam says are never thrown away upon him End quote. and then told him that he would give him in strict confidence some important information about french intrigues after dinner the ball opened in earnest chapus and henry being alone and seated with fitzwilliam russell and brown at some distance away the imperial ambassador began by saying that the king of france had made a determined bid to marry his second son orleans with the infanta of portugal this was a shock to henry and he changed color for one of his own trump cards was the sham negotiation in which norfolk had been the tool to marry the princess mary to orleans for a time he could only sputter and exclaim but when he had collected his senses he countered by saying that francis only wished to get the infanta into his power not for marriage but for objects of greater consequence than people imagined besides the french wanted the princess mary for orleans and were anxious to send an embassy to him about it indeed the french ambassador was coming to see him about it with fresh powers next day chapus protested that he spoke as one devoted to henry's service but he was sure the french did not mean business they would never let orleans marry a princess of illegitimate birth ah replied henry but though she may be a bastard i have power from parliament to appoint her my successor if i like but chapus gave several other reasons why the match with mary would never suit the french why cried henry francis is even now soliciting an interview with me with a view to alliances yes i know they say that replied the ambassador but at the same time francis has sent an ambassador to scotland with orders not to touch at an english port this was a sore point with henry and he again winced at the blow then he began to boast he was prepared to face anyone and james of scotland was in mortal fear of him chapus then mentioned that france had made a secret treaty with sweden and denmark to obtain control of the north sea and divert all the anglo-german trade to france which henry parried by saying that francis was in league with the german protestants and notwithstanding the new decree of the diet of ratisbon could draw as many mercenary soldiers as he liked from the emperor's vassals 
he felt sure that francis would invade flanders next spring and if he henry had cared to marry a daughter of france as her father wished him to do he might have had a share of his conquests this made chapus angry and he said that perhaps holstein and cleves had also been offered shares henry then went on another tack and said that he knew quite well that francis and charles together intended if they could to make war on england considering however the emperor's disaster at algiers and the state of europe he was astonished that charles had not tried to make a close friendship with him chapus jumped at the hint and begged henry to state his intentions that they might be conveyed to the emperor but the king was not to be drawn too rapidly and would not say whether he was willing to form an alliance with the emperor until someone with full and special powers was sent to him he had been cheated too often and left in the lurch before he said Quote, he was quite independent if people wanted him they might come forward with offers End quote. this sparring went on for hours on that day and the next interspersed with little wrangles about the commercial question and innuendos as to the french intrigues but chapus who knew his man quite understood that henry was for sale and as usual might if dexterously handled be bought by flattery and feigned submission to his will hurriedly wrote to his master that quote, if the emperor wishes to gain the king he must send hither at once an able person with full powers to take charge of the negotiation end quote, since he chapus was in ill health and unequal to it thus the english catholic reaction that had been symbolized by the repudiation of anne of cleves and the marriage with catherine howard was triumphantly producing the results which henry and gardiner had intended the excommunicated king the man who had flung aside his proud spanish wife and bade defiance to the vicegerent of christ was to be flattered and sought in alliance by the head of the house of aragon and the appointed champion of roman orthodoxy he was to come back into the fold unrepentant with no submission or reparation made a good catholic but his own pope it was a prospect that appealed strongly to a man of henry's vain and ostentatious character for it gave apparent sanction to his favorite pose that everything he did was warranted by the strictest right and justice it promised the possibility of an extension of his continental territory and the establishment of his own fame as a warrior and a king we shall see how his pompous self-conceit enabled his ally to trick him out of his reward and how the consequent reaction against those who had beguiled him drew his country farther along the road of the reformation than henry ever meant to go but at present all looked rose-colored for the imperial connection and the miserable scandal of catherine howard rather benefited than injured the chances of its successful negotiation cranmer hertford and audley had shot their bolt in vain so far as political or religious aims were attained in the meanwhile the evidence against catherine and her abettors was being laboriously wrung out of all those who had come into contact with her the poor old duchess of norfolk and her son and daughters and several underlings were condemned for misprision of treason to perpetual imprisonment and confiscation and in parliament on the twenty first january a bill of attainder against catherine and three lady accomplices was presented to the lords the evidence presented against catherine was adjudged to be insufficient 
in the absence of direct allegations of adultery after her marriage or of specific admissions from herself this and other objections seem to have delayed the passage of the bill until the eleventh of february when it received the royal assent by commission condemning catherine and lady rockford to death for treason during the passage of the bill as soon indeed as the procedure of catherine's condemnation had been settled henry plucked up spirits again and with characteristic heartlessness once more began to play the gallant the king writes chapus had never been merry since first hearing of the queen's misconduct but he has been so since the attainder was arranged especially on the twenty ninth when he gave a supper and banquet with twenty-six ladies at the table besides gentlemen and thirty-five at another table adjoining the lady for whom he showed the greatest regard was a sister of lord cobham whom wyatt some time ago divorced for adultery she is a pretty young creature with wit enough to do as badly as the others if she were to try the king is also said to fancy a daughter of mistress albert and niece of sir anthony brown and also for a daughter by her first marriage of the wife of lord lyle late deputy of calais up to this time catherine had remained at sion house as chapus reported making good cheer fatter and more beautiful than ever taking great care to be well apparelled and more imperious and exacting to serve than even when she was with the king although she believes she will be put to death and admits that she deserves it perhaps if the king does not wish to marry again he may show her some compassion no sooner however had the act of attainder passed its third reading in the commons tenth january than fitzwilliam was sent to isleworth to convey her to the tower she resisted at first but was of course overpowered and the sad procession swept along the wintry river londonward first came fitzwilliam's barge with himself and several privy councillors then in a small covered barge followed the doomed woman and the rear was guarded by a great barge full of soldiers under the aged duke of suffolk whose matrimonial adventures had been almost as numerous as those of his royal brother-in-law under the frowning portcullis of the traitor's gate in the gathering twilight of the afternoon the beautiful girl in black velvet landed amidst a crowd of councillors who treated her with as much ceremony as if she still sat by the king's side she proudly and calmly gloried in her love for her betrothed culpepper whom she knew she would soon join in death there was no hysterical babbling like that of her cousin anne boleyn no regret in her mien or her words now even as he with his last breath had confessed his love for her and mourned that the king's passion for her had stood in the way of their honest union so did she with flashing eyes and blazing cheeks proclaim that love was victorious over death and that since there had been no mercy for the man she loved she asked no mercy for herself from the king whose plaything of a year she had been on sunday evening twelfth february she was told that she must be prepared for death on the morrow and she asked that the block should be brought to her room that she might learn how to dispose her head upon it this was done and she calmly and smilingly rehearsed her part in the tragedy of the morrow early in the morning before it was fully light she was led out across the green upon which the hoar-frost glistened to the scaffold erected on the same spot that had seen the sacrifice of anne boleyn around it stood all the councillors except norfolk and suffolk even her first cousin the poet surrey with his own doom not far off witnessed the scene upon the scaffold half crazy with fear 
stood the wretched lady rockford the ministress of the queen's amours who was to share her fate catherine spoke shortly she died she said in full confidence in god's goodness she had grievously sinned and deserved death though she had not wronged the king in the particular way that she had been accused of if she had married the man she loved instead of being dazzled by ambition all would have been well and when the headsman knelt to ask her forgiveness she pardoned him but exclaimed quote, i die a queen but i would rather have died the wife of culpepper End quote. and then kneeling in prayer her head was struck off whilst she was unaware lady rockford followed her to the block as soon as the head and trunk of the queen had been piteously gathered up in black cloth by the ladies who attended her at last and conveyed to the adjoining chapel for sepulture close to the grave of anne boleyn catherine howard had erred much for love and had erred more for ambition but taking a human view of the whole circumstances of her life and of the personality of the man she married she is surely more worthy of pity than condemnation only a few days after her death we learn from chapus twenty fifth february that quote, the king has been in better spirits since the execution and during the last three days before lent there has been much feasting sunday was devoted to the lords of his council and courtiers monday to the men of the law tuesday to the ladies who all slept at the court the king himself did nothing but go from room to room ordering and arranging the lodgings to be prepared for these ladies and he made them great and hearty cheer without showing special affection for any particular one indeed unless parliament prays him to take another wife he will not be in a hurry to do so i think besides there are few if any ladies now at court who would aspire to such an honor for by a new act just passed any lady that the king may marry if she be a subject is bound on pain of death to declare any charge of misconduct that can be brought against her and all who know or suspect anything against her must declare it within twenty days on pain of perpetual imprisonment and confiscation End quote. henry with five unsuccessful matrimonial adventures to his account might well pause before taking another plunge though from the extract printed above it was evident that he had no desire to put himself out of the way of temptation the only course upon which he seemed quite determined was to resist all the blandishments of the protestants the german lutherans and the french to take back anne of cleves who we are told had waxed half as beautiful again as she was since she had begun her jolly life of liberty and beneficence away from so difficult a husband as henry end of section 25section twenty six of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain fifteen forty two through fifteen forty seven catherine parr the protestants win the last trick part one the disappearance of catherine howard and the temporary eclipse of norfolk caused no check to the progress of the catholic cause in england when gardiner was with the emperor in the summer of fifteen forty one he had been able to make in henry's name an agreement by which neither monarch should treat anything to the other's disadvantage for the next ten months and as war loomed nearer between charles and francis the chances of a more durable and binding treaty 
being made between the former and henry improved when gardiner had hinted at it in germany both charles and granville had suggested that the submission of henry to the pope would be a necessary preliminary but the emperor's brother ferdinand was in close grips with the turk in hungary and getting the worst of it francis was again in negotiation with the infidel and french intrigue in italy was busy henry therefore found that the emperor's tone softened considerably on the report of chapus's conversation at windsor in february whilst the english terms became stiffer as francis endeavoured to turn his feigned negotiations with henry into real ones the whole policy of henry at the period was really to effect an armed league with the emperor by means of which france might be humiliated perhaps dismembered whilst henry was welcomed back with open arms by the great catholic power in spite of his contumacy and the hegemony of england established over scotland in order the better to incline charles to essential concessions it was good policy for henry to give several more turns of the screw upon his own subjects to prove to his future ally how devout a catholic he was and how entirely cromwell's later action was being reversed the great bibles were withdrawn from the churches the dissemination of the scriptures restricted and the six articles were enforced more severely than ever but yet when after some months of fencing and waiting chapus came to somewhat closer quarters with the english council he still talked though with bated breath now about henry's submission to the pope and the legitimation of the princess mary but the emperor's growing need for support gradually broke down the wall of reserve that henry's defection from rome had raised and gardiner and chapus during the spring of fifteen forty two were in almost daily confabulation in a quiet house in the fields at stepney in june the imperial ambassador made a hasty visit to flanders to submit the english terms for an alliance to the queen regent henry's conditions in appearance were hard for by going to war with france he would he said lose the great yearly tribute he received from that country but charles and his sister knew how to manage him and were not troubled with scruples as to keeping promises so to begin with the commercial question that had so long been rankling was now rapidly settled and the relations daily grew more cordial henry had agents in germany and flanders ordering munitions of war and making secret compacts with mercenary captains he was actively reinforcing his own garrisons and castles organizing a fine fleet collecting vast fresh sums of money from his groaning subjects and in every way preparing himself to be an ally worth purchase by the emperor at a high price in july fifteen forty two the french simultaneously attacked the imperial territory in four distinct directions and henry summoned the ambassadors of charles and francis to windsor to tell them that as war was so near him he must raise men for his defence especially towards scotland but meant no menace to either of the continental powers chapus had already been assured that the comedy was only to blind the french and cheerfully acquiesced but the frenchman took a more gloomy view and knew it meant war with scotland and henry it was a case of the lamb and the wolf henry knew that he dared not send his army across the channel to attack france without first crushing his northern neighbor the pretended negotiations with and allegations against the unfortunate stuart were never sincere james was surrounded by traitors 
for english money and religious rancor had profoundly divided the scottish gentry cardinal beaton the scots king's principal minister was hated the powerful douglas family were disaffected and in english pay and the forces with which james v rashly attempted to raid the english marches in reprisal for henry's unprovoked attacks upon him were wild and undisciplined the battle of solway moss november fifteen forty two was a disgraceful rout for the scots and james heartbroken fled from the ruin of his cause to tantalon and edinburgh and thence to falkland to die then with scotland rent in twain with a new-born baby for a queen and a foreign woman as a regent henry could face a war with france by the side of the emperor with assurance of safety on his northern border especially if he could force upon the rulers of scotland a marriage between his only son and the infant mary stuart as he intended to do there was infinite haggling with chapus with regard to the style to be given to henry in the secret treaty even after the heads of the treaty itself had been agreed upon he must be called sovereign head of the english church said gardiner or there would be no alliance with the emperor at all and the difficulty was only overcome by varying the style in the two copies of the document that signed by chapus bearing the style of quote, king of england france and ireland etc end quote. and that signed by the english ministers added the king's ecclesiastical claims if the territories of either monarch were invaded the other was bound to come to his aid the french king was to be summoned to forbear intelligence with the turk to satisfy the demands of the emperor and the king of england in the many old claims they had against him and no peace was to be made with france by either ally unless the other's claims were satisfied the claims of henry included the town and county of boulogne with montre and thiouen his arrears of pension and assurance of future payment and the two allies agreed within two years to invade france together each with twenty thousand foot and five thousand horse this secret compact was signed on the eleventh february fifteen forty three and the diplomatic relations with france were at once broken off at last the repudiation of catherine of aragon was condoned and henry was once more the emperor's good brother a fit ally for the catholic king the champion of orthodox christianity as if to put the finishing touch upon henry's victory charles held an interview with the pope in june fifteen forty three on his way through italy and succeeded in persuading him that the inclusion of the king who defied the church in the league of militant catholics was a fit compliment to the alliance of france and enemies of all christianity and would secure the triumph of the papacy and the return of england into the fold whilst the preparations for war thus went busily forward on all sides with chantenay in england and thomas seymour in germany and flanders arranging military details of arms levies and stores and the emperor already clamoring constantly for prompt english subsidies and contingents against his enemies henry full of importance and self-satisfaction at his position contracted the only one of his marriages which was not promoted by a political intrigue although at the time it was effected it was doubtless looked upon as favoring the catholic party certainly no lady of the court enjoyed a more blameless reputation than catherine lady latimer upon whom the king now cast his eyes a daughter of the great and wealthy house of parr of kendal 
allied to the royal blood in no very distant degree and related to most of the higher nobility of england she was so far as descent was concerned quite as worthy to be the wife of a king as the unfortunate daughters of the house of howard her brother lord parr soon to be created earl of essex and marcus of northampton a favorite courtier of the king and a very splendid magnate had been one of the chief enemies of cromwell who had in his last days usurped the ancient earldom which parr had claimed in right of his bourchier wife whilst catherine's second husband neville lord latimer had been so strong a catholic as to have risked his great possessions as well as his head by joining the rising in the north that had assumed the name of the pilgrimage of grace and had been mainly directed against cromwell's measures she was moreover closely related to the throckmortons the stoutly catholic family whose chief sir george cromwell had despoiled and imprisoned until the intrigue already related drove the minister from power in june 1540 with the mysterious support so it is asserted of catherine lady latimer herself though the evidence of it is not very convincing catherine had been brought up mostly in the north country with extreme care and wisdom by a hard-headed mother and had been married almost as a child to an elderly widower lord borough who had died soon afterwards leaving her a large jointure her second husband lord latimer had also been many years older than herself and accompanying him as she did in his periodical visits to london where they had a house in the precincts of the charter house she had for several years been remarkable in henry's court not only for her wide culture and love of learning but also for her friendship with the princess mary whose tastes were exactly similar to her own lord latimer died in london at the beginning of fifteen forty three leaving to catherine considerable property and certainly not many weeks can have passed before the king began to pay his court to the wealthy and dignified widow of thirty-two his attentions were probably not very welcome to her for he was a terribly dangerous husband and any unrevealed peccadillo in the previous life of a woman he married might mean the loss of her head there was another reason than this however that made the king's addresses especially embarrassing to catherine the younger of the two magnificent seymour brothers sir thomas had thus early also approached her with offers of love he was one of the handsomest men at court and of similar age to catherine he was already very rich with the church plunder and was the king's brother-in-law so that he was in all respects a good match for her he must have arrived from his mission to germany immediately after lord latimer's death and remained at court until early may about three months during which time from the evidence of catherine's subsequent letters she seems to have made up her mind to marry him it may be that the king noticed signs of their courtship for sir thomas seymour was promptly sent on an embassy to flanders in company with dr wotton and subsequently with the english contingent to the emperor's army in france where he remained until long after henry's sixth marriage that henry himself lost no time in approaching the widow after her husband's death is seen by a tailor's bill for dresses for lady latimer being paid out of the exchequer by the king's orders as early as the sixteenth february fifteen forty three when it would seem that her husband cannot have been dead much more than a month this bill includes linen and buckram the making of italian gowns pleats and sleeves a slope hood and tippet kirtles 
french dutch and venetian gowns venetian sleeves french hoods and other feminine fripperies the amount of the total being eight pounds nine shillings five d and as showing that even before the marriage considerable intimacy existed between catherine and the princess mary it is curious to note that some of the garments appear to have been destined for the use of the latter by the middle of june the king's attentions to lady latimer were public and already the lot of the sickly disinherited princess mary was rendered happier by the prospective elevation of her friend mary came to court at greenwich as did her sister elizabeth and catherine is specially mentioned as being with them in a letter from dudley the new lord lyle to catherine's brother lord parr the warden of the scottish marches the king had then twentieth june just returned from a tour of inspection of his coast defences and three weeks later cranmer as primate issued a license for his marriage with catherine lady latimer without the publication of bans on the twelfth july fifteen forty three the marriage took place in the upper oratory called the queen's praevi closet at hampton court when gardiner the celebrant put the canonical question to the bridegroom his majesty answered with a smiling face yea and taking his bride's hand firmly recited the usual pledge catherine whatever her inner feelings may have been made a bright buxom bride and from the first endeavoured as none of the other wives had done to bring together into some semblance of family life with her the three children of her husband her reward was that she was beloved and respected by all of them and princess mary who was nearly her own age continued her constant companion and friend as she began so she remained amiable tactful and clever throughout her life with henry her influence was exerted wherever possible in favor of concord and i have not met with a single disparaging remark with regard to her even from those who in the last days of the king's life became her political opponents her character must have been an exceedingly lovable one and she evidently knew to perfection how to manage men by humoring their weak points she could be firm too on occasions where an injustice had to be remedied a story is told of her in connection with her brother parr earl of essex in the chronicle of henry the eighth which so far as i know has not been related by any other historian of the reign parr fell in love with lord cobham's daughter a very beautiful girl who as told in our text was mentioned as one of the king's flames after catherine howard's fall parr had married the great borshear heiress but had grown tired of her and by suborned evidence charged her with adultery and she was found guilty and sentenced to death the good queen his sister threw herself at the feet of the king and would not rise until he had promised to grant her the boon she craved which was the life of the countess of essex when the king heard what it was he said but madam you know that the law enacts that a woman of rank who so forgets herself shall die unless her husband pardon her to this the queen answered your majesty is above the law and i will try to get my brother to pardon well said the king if your brother be content i will pardon her the queen then sends for her brother and upbraids him for bringing perjured witnesses against his wife which he denies and says he has only acted in accordance with the legal evidence i can promise you brother that it shall not be as you expect i will have the witnesses put to the torture and then by god's help we shall know the truth before this could be done parr sent his witnesses to cornwall out of the way 
and again catherine insisted upon the countess's pardon by virtue of the promise that the king had given her this somewhat alarmed parr and catherine managed to effect a mutual renunciation after which parr married lord cobham's daughter gardiner had been not only the prelate who performed the ceremony but had himself given the bride away so that it may fairly be concluded that he at least was not discontented with the match riothlessly his obedient creature moreover must have been voicing the general feeling of catholics when he wrote to the duke of suffolk in the north his eulogy of the bride a few days after the wedding Quote, the king's majesty was married one thursday last to my lady latimore a woman in my judgment for virtue wisdom and gentleness most matey for his highness and sure i am his majesty had never a wife more agreeable to his heart than she is our lord send them long life and much joy together End quote. both the king's daughters had been at the wedding mary receiving from catherine a handsome present as bridesmaid but henry had the decency not to bid the presence of anne of cleves she is represented as being somewhat disgusted at the turn of events her friends and perhaps she herself had never lost the hope that if the protestant influence became paramount henry might take her back but the imperial alliance had made england an enemy of her brother of cleves whose territory the emperor's troops were harrying with fire and sword and her position in england was a most difficult one she would says chapus prefer to be with her mother if with nothing but the clothes on her back rather than be here now having specially taken great grief and despair at the king's espousal of his new wife who is not nearly so good-looking as she is besides that there is no hope of her catherine having issue seeing that she had none by her two former husbands as we have seen catherine had all her life belonged to the catholic party of which the northern nobles were the leaders and doubtless this fact had secured for her marriage the ready acquiescence of gardiner and his friends especially when coupled with the attachment known to exist between the bride and the princess mary but catherine had studied hard and was devoted to the new learning which had suddenly become fashionable for high-born ladies the latin classics the writings of erasmus of juan louis vives and others were the daily solace of the few ladies in england who had at this time been seized with the new craze of culture catherine the king's daughters his grand nieces the greys and the daughters of sir anthony cook being especially versed in classics languages philosophy and theology the new learning had been and was still to be for the most part promoted by those who sympathized with the reformed doctrines and catherine's devotion to it brought her into intimate contact with the learned men at court whose zeal for the spread of classical and controversial knowledge was coupled with the spirit of inquiry which frequently went with religious heterodoxy not many days after the marriage gardiner scented danger in this foregathering of the queen with such men as cranmer and latimer and at the encouragement and help given by her to the young princesses in the translation of portions of the scriptures and of the writings of erasmus there is no reason to conclude that catherine as yet had definitely attached herself to the reform party but it is certain that very soon after her marriage her love of learning or her distrust of gardiner's policy and methods caused her to look sympathetically towards those at court who went beyond the king in his opposition to rome gardiner dared not as yet 
directly attack either catherine or cranmer for the king was personally much attached to both of them whilst gardiner himself was never a favorite with him but indirectly these two persons in privileged places might be ruined by attacking others first and the plan was patiently and cunningly laid to do it before a new party of reformers led by cranmer reinforced by catherine could gain the king's ear and reverse the policy of his present adviser at the instance of gardiner's creature dr london a canon of windsor a prosecution under the six articles was commenced against a priest and some choristers of the royal chapel and one other person who were known to meet together for religious discussion for weeks london spies had been listening to the talk of those in the castle and town who might be suspected of reformed ideas and with the evidence so accumulated in his hand gardiner moved the king in council to issue a warrant authorizing a search for unauthorized books and papers in the town and castle of windsor henry whilst allowing the imprisonment of the accused persons with the addition of sir philip hoby and dr haynes both resident in the castle declined to allow his own residence to be searched for heretical books this was a setback for gardiner's plan but it succeeded to the extent of securing the conviction and execution at the stake of three of the accused this was merely a beginning and already those at court were saying that the bishop of winchester aimed at higher deer than those that had already fallen to his bow hardly had the ashes of the three martyrs cooled than a mass of fresh accusations was formulated by london against several members of the royal household the reports of spies and informers were sent to gardiner by the hand of Ockham, the clerk of the court that had condemned the martyrs but one of the persons accused a member of catherine's household received a secret notice of what was intended and waylaid Ockham. perusal of the documents he bore showed that much of the information had been suborned by dr london and his assistant simmons and catherine was appealed to for her aid she exerted her influence with her husband to have them both arrested and examined unaware that their papers had been taken from Ockham, they forswore themselves and broke down when confronted with the written proofs that the case against the accused had been trumped up on false evidence with ulterior objects disgrace and imprisonment for the two instruments london and simmons followed but the prelate who had inspired their activity was too indispensable to the king to be attacked and he firm in his political predominance bided his time for yet another blow at his enemies amongst whom he now included the queen whose union with the king he and other catholics had so recently blessed cranmer secure as he thought in the king's regard and in his great position as primate had certainly laid himself open to the attacks of his enemies by his almost ostentatious favor to the clergy of his province who were known to be evading or violating the six articles the chapter of his own cathedral was profoundly divided and the majority of its members were opposed to what they considered the injustice of their archbishop cranmer's commissary his nephew nevinson whilst going out of his way to favor those who were accused before the chapter of false doctrine offended deeply the majority of the clergy by his zeal which really only reflected that of the archbishop himself in the displacing and destruction of images in the churches even when the figures did not offend against the law by being made the objects of superstitious pilgrimages and offerings for several years past the cathedral church of canterbury had been a hotbed of discord 
in consequence of cranmer's having appointed apparently on principle men of extreme opinions on both sides as canons prebendaries and preachers and so great had grown the opposition in his own chapter to the primate's known views in the spring of fifteen forty three that it was evident that a crisis could not be long delayed especially as the clergy opposed to the prelate had the letter of the law on their side and the countenance of gardiner bishop of winchester all powerful as he was in the lay councils of the king some of the kentish clergy who resented the archbishop's action had laid their heads together in march fifteen forty three and formulated a set of accusations against him this the two most active movers in the protest had carried to the metropolis for submission to gardiner they first however approached the doctor london already referred to who rewrote the accusations with additions of his own in order to bring the accused within the penal law the two first movers willoughby and searle took fright at this for it was a dangerous thing to attack the archbishop and hastily returned home but dr london had enough for his present purpose and handed his enlarged version of their depositions to gardiner london's disgrace already related stayed the matter for a time but a few months afterwards a fresh set of articles alleging illegal acts on the part of the archbishop was forwarded by the discontented clergy to gardiner and the accusers were then summoned before the privy council where they were encouraged to make their testimony as strong as possible when the depositions were complete they were sent to the king by gardiner in the hope that now the great stumbling block of the catholic party might be cleared from the path and that the new queen's ruin might promptly follow that of the primate but they reckoned without henry's love for cranmer rowing on the thames one evening in the late autumn soon after the depositions had been handed to him the king called at the pier by lambeth palace and took cranmer into his barge ah my chaplain he said jocosely as the archbishop took his seat in the boat i have news for you i now know who is the greatest heretic in kent and with this he drew from his sleeve and handed to cranmer the depositions of those who had sought to ruin him the archbishop insisted upon a regular commission being issued to test the truth of the accusations but henry could be generous when it suited him and he never knew how soon he might need cranmer's pliable ingenuity again so although he issued the commission he made cranmer its head and gave to him the appointment of its members with the natural result that the accusers and all their abettors were imprisoned and forced to beg the primate's forgiveness for their action but the man who gave life to the whole plot bishop gardiner of winchester still led the king's political councils much as henry disliked him personally for the armed alliance with the emperor could only bring its full harvest of profit and glory to the king of england if the catholic powers on the continent were convinced of henry's essential orthodoxy notwithstanding his quarrel with the pope so though cranmer might be favored privately and catherine's coquetting with the new learning of its professors winked at gardiner whose catholicism was stronger than that of his master had to be the figurehead to impress foreigners end of section twenty six section twenty seven of the wives of henry the eighth and the parts they played in history by martin hume this librivox recording is in the public domain 1542 through 1547 catherine parr the protestants win the last trick part two in july 1543 
the english contingent to aid the imperial troops to protect flanders was sent from guine and calais under sir john wallop by the strict terms of the treaty they were only to be employed for a limited period for the defence of territory invaded by the enemy but soon after wallop's arrival he was asked to take part in the regular siege of Landrecy in hainault that had been occupied by the french henry allowed him to do so under protest it was a waste of time he said and would divert the forces from what was to be their main object but if he allowed it he must have the same right when the war in france commenced to call upon the imperial contingent with him also to besiege a town if he wished to do so both the allies even before the war really began were playing for their own hands with the deliberate intention of making use of each other and in the dismal comedy of chicanery that followed and lasted almost to henry's death this siege of landrecy and that of saint dissier were made the peg upon which countless reclamations and recriminations were hung the emperor was ill in dire need of money and overwhelmed with anxiety as to the attitude of the lutheran princes during the coming struggle his eyes were turned towards italy and he depended much upon the diversion that henry's forces might effect by land and sea and conscious that the campaign must be prompt and rapid if he was to profit by it he sent one of his most trusted lieutenants ferrante gonzaga viceroy of sicily to england at the end of the year fifteen forty three to settle with henry the plan of the campaign to be undertaken in the spring his task was a difficult one for henry was as determined to use charles for his advantage as charles was to use him after much dispute it was agreed that henry as early in the summer as possible should lead his army of thirty five thousand foot and seven thousand horse to invade france from calais whilst the imperial troops were to invade by lorraine form a junction with the english on the somme and push on towards paris rapidity was the very essence of such a plan but henry would not promise celerity he could not he said transport all his men across the sea before the end of june the fact being that his own secret intention all along was to conquer the boulognese country for himself gain a free hand in scotland and leave the emperor to shift as he might utter bad faith on both sides pervaded the affair from first to last the engaging and payment of mercenaries by england the purchase of horses arms and stores the hire of transport the interference with commerce everything in which sharp dealing could be employed by one ally to get the better of the other was taken advantage of to the utmost henry enfeebled as he was by disease and obesity was determined to turn to his personal glory the victory he anticipated for his arms his own courtiers dared not remonstrate with him and although catherine prayed him to have regard for his safety he brushed aside her remonstrances as being womanly fears for a dearly loved husband charles knew that if the king himself crossed the channel the english army would not be at the imperial bidding envoys were consequently sent from flanders to pray henry for his health's sake not to risk the hardships of a sea voyage and a campaign the subject was a sore one with him and when the envoy began to dwell too emphatically upon his infirmities he flew into a passion and said that the emperor was suffering from gout which was much worse than any malady he henry had and it would be more dangerous for the emperor to go to the war henry's decision to accompany his army at once increased the importance of catherine who in accordance with precedent would become regent in her husband's absence a glimpse of her growing influence at this time 
is seen in a letter of hers dated third june 1544 to the countess of hertford that termagant and stanhope who afterwards was her jealous enemy hertford had been sent in march to the scottish border to invade again and this time utterly crushed scotland where henry's pensioners had played him false and betrothed their infant queen to the heir of france the countess anxious that her husband should be at home during the king's absence probably in order that if anything happened to henry hertford might take prompt measures on behalf of the new king his nephew and safeguard his own influence wrote to catherine praying for her aid the queen's answer is written on the same sheet of paper as one from princess mary to the countess whose letters to catherine had been sent through the princess Quote, my lord your husband's coming hither is not altered for he shall come home before the king's majesty takes his journey over the seas as it pleases his majesty to declare to me of late you may be right assured i would not have forgotten my promise to you in a matter of less effect than this and so i pray you most heartily to think catherine the queen End quote. since henry insisted upon going to the war himself the next best thing according to the emperor's point of view to keeping him away was to cause some spanish officer of high rank and great experience to be constantly close to him during the campaign except the little skirmishes on the borders of scotland englishmen had seen no active military service for many years and it was urged upon henry that a general well acquainted with modern continental warfare would be useful to him the emperor's spanish and italian commanders were the best in the world as were his men-at-arms and a grandee the duke of Nahara, who was on his way from flanders to spain by sea was looked upon as being a suitable man for the purpose of advising the king of england henry was determined to impress him and entertained him splendidly delaying him as long as possible in order that he might be persuaded to accompany the english forces the accounts of Nahara's stay in england show that catherine had now the spring of fifteen forty four quite settled down in her position as queen and coming regent chapus mentions that when he first took Nahara to court he quote, visited the queen and princess mary who asked very minutely for news of the emperor and although the queen was a little indisposed she wished to dance for the honor of the company the queen favors the princess all she can and since the treaty with the emperor was made she has constantly urged the princess's cause insomuch as in this sitting of parliament she mary has been declared capable of succeeding in default of the prince End quote a spaniard who attended nahara tells the story of the duke's interview with catherine somewhat more fully quote, the duke kissed the queen's hand and was then conducted to another chamber to which the queen and ladies followed and there was music and much beautiful dancing the queen danced first with her brother very gracefully and then princess mary and the princess of scotland that is lady margaret douglas danced with other gentlemen and many other ladies also danced a venetian of the king's household danced some galliards with such extraordinary activity that he seemed to have wings upon his feet surely never was a man seen so agile after the dancing had lasted several hours the queen returned to her chamber first causing one of the noblemen who spoke spanish to offer some presents to the duke who kissed her hand he would likewise have kissed that of the princess mary but she offered her lips and so he saluted her and all the other ladies the king is regarded as a very powerful and handsome man the queen is graceful and of cheerful countenance and is praised for her virtue she wore an underskirt showing in front of cloth of gold and a sleeved overdress of brocade 
lined with crimson satin the sleeves themselves being lined with crimson velvet and the train was two yards long she wore hanging from the neck two crosses and a jewel of very magnificent diamonds and she wore a great number of splendid diamonds in her headdress End quote. the author of this curious contemporary document excels himself in praise of the princess mary whose dress on the occasion described was even more splendid than that of the queen consisting as it did entirely of cloth of gold and purple velvet the house and gardens of whitehall also moved the witness to wonder and admiration the green alleys with the high hedges of the garden and the sculpture with which the walks were adorned especially attracted the attention of the visitors and the greatness of london and the stately river thames are declared to be incomparable the duke of nahara unwilling to stay and apparently not impressing henry very favorably went on his way and was immediately followed by another spanish commander of equal rank and much greater experience in warfare the duke of albuquerque and he too was received with the splendor and ostentation that henry loved ultimately accompanying the king to the siege of boulogne as military adviser both the king and queen we are told treating him with extraordinary favor by the time that henry was ready to cross the channel early in july to join his army which several weeks before had preceded him under the command of norfolk and suffolk the short-lived and insincere alliance with the emperor from which henry and gardiner had expected so much was already strained almost to the breaking point the great imperialist defeat at cirasol in savoy earlier in the year had made henry more disinclined than ever to sacrifice englishmen and treasure to fight indirectly the emperor's battle in italy even before that henry had begun to show signs of an intention to break away from the plan of campaign agreed upon how dangerous it would be he said for the emperor to push forward into france without securing the ground behind him Quote, far better to lay siege to two or three large towns on the road to paris than to go to the capital and burn it down End quote charles was indignant and continued to send reminders and remonstrances that the plan agreed upon must be adhered to henry retorted that charles himself had departed from it by laying siege to landrecy the question of supplies from flanders the payment and passage of mercenaries through the emperor's territories the free concession of trading licenses by the queen regent of the netherlands and a dozen other questions kept the relations between the allies in a state of irritation and acrimony even before the campaign well began and it is clear thus early that henry started with the fixed intention of conquering the territory of boulogne and then perhaps making friends with francis leaving the emperor at war with both the great rivals exhausted he would be more sought after than ever he at once laid siege to montre and boulogne and personally took command deaf to the prayers and remonstrances of charles and his sister that he would not go beyond calais quote, for his health's sake end quote, but would send the bulk of his forces to join the emperor's army before saint dissier the emperor had himself broken the compact by besieging Landrecy and saint dissier and so the bulk of henry's army sat down before boulogne whilst the emperor short of provisions far in an enemy's country with weak lines of communication unfriendly lorraine on his flank and two french armies approaching him could only curse almost in despair the hour that he trusted the word of his good brother the king of england catherine bade farewell to her husband at dover when he went on his pompous voyage and returned forthwith to london 
fully empowered to rule england as regent during his absence she was directed to use the advice and counsel of cranmer ryothlessly the earl of hertford who was to replace her if she became incapacitated thoroughby and peter gardiner accompanying the king as minister the letters written by catherine to her husband during his short campaign show no such instances of want of tact as did those of the first catherine quoted in the earlier pages of this book it is plain to read in them the clever discreet woman determined to please a vain man content to take a subordinate place and to shine by a reflected light alone Quote, she thanks god for a prosperous beginning of his affairs she rejoices at the joyful news of his good health end quote. and in a businesslike way shows that she and her council are actively forwarding the interests of the king with a single-hearted view to his honor and glory alone during this time the young prince edward and his sister mary were at hampton court with the queen but the other daughter elizabeth lived apart at st james though it is evident that the girl was generally regarded and treated as inferior to her sister she appears to have felt a real regard for her stepmother almost the only person who since her infancy had been kind to her elizabeth wrote to the queen on the thirty first july a curious letter in italian quote, envious fortune she writes for a whole year deprived me of your highness's presence and not content therewith has again despoiled me of that boon i know nevertheless that i have your love and that you have not forgotten me in writing to the king i pray you in writing to his majesty deign to recommend me to him praying him for his ever welcome blessing praying at the same time to almighty god to send him good fortune and victory over his enemies so that your highness and i together may the sooner rejoice at his happy return i humbly pray to god to have your highness in his keeping and respectfully kissing your highness's hand elizabeth End quote. catherine indeed in this trying time of responsibility comes well out of her ordeal the prayer composed by her for peace at this period is really a beautiful composition and the letter from her to her husband printed by stripe breathes sentiment likely to please such a man as henry but in language at once womanly and dignified Quote, although the distance of time and account of days she writes neither is long nor many of your majesty's absence yet the want of your presence so much beloved and desired by me maketh me that i cannot quietly pleasure in anything until i hear from your majesty the time therefore seemeth to me very long with a great desire to know how your highness hath done since your departing hence whose prosperity and health i prefer and desire more than mine own and whereas i know your majesty's absence is never without great need yet love and affection compel me to desire your presence again the same zeal and affection forceth me to be best content with that which is your will and pleasure thus love maketh me in all things set apart mine own convenience and pleasure and to embrace most joyfully his will and pleasure whom i love god the knower of secrets can judge these words to be not only written with ink but most truly impressed upon the heart much more i omit lest it be thought i go about to praise myself or crave a thank which thing to do i mind nothing less but a plain simple relation of the love and zeal i bear your majesty proceeding from the abundance of the heart i make like account with your majesty as i do with god for his benefits and gifts heaped upon me daily acknowledging myself to be a great debtor to him 
not being able to recompense the least of his benefit in which state i am certain and sure to die yet i hope for his gracious acceptance of my good will even such confidence have i in your majesty's gentleness knowing myself never to have done my duty as were requisite and meet for such a noble prince at whose hands i have received so much love and goodness that with words i cannot express it it will be seen by this and nearly every other letter that catherine wrote to her husband that she had taken the measure of his prodigious vanity and indulged him to the top of his bent in a letter written to him on the ninth august referring to the success of the earl of lennox who had just married henry's niece margaret douglas and had gone to scotland to seize the government in english interest catherine says quote, the good speed which lennox has had is to be imputed to his serving a master whom god aids he might have served the french king his old master many years without attaining such a victory End quote. this is the attitude in which henry loved to be approached and with such letters from his wife in england confirming the jove-like qualities attributed to him in consequence of his presence with his army in france henry's short campaign before boulogne was doubtless one of the pleasantest experiences in his life to add to his satisfaction he had not been at calais a week before francis began to make secret overtures for peace it was too early for that however just yet for henry coveted boulogne and the sole use made of the french approaches to him was to impress the imperial agents with his supreme importance the warning was not lost upon charles and his sister the queen regent of the netherlands who themselves began to listen to the unofficial suggestions for peace made by the agents of the duchess de Trompe, the mistress of francis in order if possible to benefit herself and the duke of orleans in the conditions to the detriment of the dauphin henry thenceforward it was a close game of diplomatic finesse between henry and charles as to which should make terms first and arbitrate on the claims of the other saint dissier capitulated to the emperor on the eighth august and charles at once sent another envoy to henry at boulogne praying him urgently to fulfil the plan of campaign decided with gonzaga or the whole french army would be concentrated upon the imperial forces and crush them but henry would not budge from before boulogne and charles whilst rapidly pushing forward into france and in serious danger of being cut off by the dauphin listened intently for sounds of peace they soon came through the duke of lorraine and before the end of august the emperor was in close negotiation with the french determined come what might that the final settlement of terms should not be left in the hands of the king of england henry's action at this juncture was pompous inflated and stupid whilst that of charles was statesmanlike though unscrupulous even during the negotiations charles pushed forward and captured a pernay and chateau Thierry, where the dauphin's stores were this was on the seventh september and then having struck his blow he knew that he must make peace at once he therefore sent the young bishop of arras granville with a message to henry which he knew would have the effect desired the king of england was again to be urged formally but insincerely to advance and join the emperor but if he would not the emperor must make peace always providing that the english claims were satisfactorily settled arras arrived in the english camp on the eleventh september he found henry in his most vaunting mood for only three days before the ancient tower on the harbour side opposite boulogne had been captured by his men he could not move forward he said 
it was too late in the season to begin a new campaign and he was only bound by the treaty to keep the field four months in a year if the emperor was in a fix that was his lookout the terms moreover suggested for the peace between his ally and france were out of the question especially the clause about english claims the french had already offered him much better conditions than those aris pushed his point the emperor must know definitely he urged whether the king of england would make peace or not as affairs could not be left pending then henry lost his temper as the clever imperial ministers knew he would do and blurted out in a rage quote, let the emperor make peace for himself if he likes but nothing must be done to prejudice my claims End quote. it was enough for the purpose desired for in good truth the emperor had already agreed with the french and aris posted back to his master with henry's hasty words giving permission for him to make a separate peace in vain for the next two years henry strove to unsay to palliate to disclaim those words quarrels bursts of violent passion incoherent rage indignant denials were all of no avail the words were said and vouched for by those who heard them and charles hurriedly ratified the peace already practically made with france on terms that surprised the world and made henry wild with indignation the emperor victor though he was in appearance gave away everything his daughter or niece was to marry orleans with milan or flanders as a dowry savoy was to be restored to the duke and the french were to join the emperor in alliance against the turk none knew yet though henry may have suspected it that behind the public treaty there was a secret compact by which the two catholic sovereigns agreed to concentrate their joint powers and extirpate a greater enemy than the turk namely the rising power of protestantism in europe henry was thus betrayed and was at war alone with france all of whose forces were now directed against him boulogne fell to the english on the fourteenth september three days after aris arrived in henry's camp and the king hurried back to england in blazing wrath with the emperor and inflated with the glorification of his own victory eager for the applause of his subjects before his laurels faded and the french beleaguered the captured town gardiner and paget soon to be joined temporarily by hertford remained in calais in order to continue if possible the abortive peace negotiations with france but it was a hopeless task now for francis free from fear on his northeast frontier was determined to win back bologna at any cost the dauphin swore that he would have no peace whilst bologna remained in english hands and henry boastfully declared that he would hold it forever now that he had won it thenceforward the relations between henry and the emperor became daily more unamiable henry claimed under the treaty that charles should still help him in the war but that was out of the question when in fifteen forty six the french made a descent upon the isle of wight once more the treaty was invoked violently by the king of england almost daily claims complaints and denunciations were made on both sides with regard to the vexed question of contraband of war for the french mostly dutch herrings and the right of capture by the english the emperor was seriously intent upon keeping henry on fairly good terms and certainly did not wish to go to war with him but he had submitted to the hard terms of the peace of crespi with a distinct object and dared not jeopardize it by renewing his quarrel with france for the sake of henry slowly 
it had forced itself upon the mind of charles that his own protestant vassals the princes of the small caldic league must be crushed into obedience or his own power would become a shadow and his aim was to keep all christendom friendly until he had choked lutheranism at its fountainhead from the period of henry's return to england in these circumstances growing sympathy for those whom a papal and imperial coalition were attacking caused the influence of the catholic party in his councils gradually but spasmodically to decline chapus who himself was hastening to the grave accompanied his successor vanderdelft as ambassador to england at christmas 1544 and describes henry as looking very old and broken but more boastful of his victory over the french than ever he professed no doubt sincerely a desire to remain friendly with the emperor and after their interview with him the ambassadors without any desire being expressed on their part were conducted to the queen's oratory during divine service in reply to their greetings and thanks for her good offices for the preservation of friendship and her kindness to princess mary catherine quote, replied very graciously that she did not deserve so much courtesy from your majesty the emperor what she did for lady mary was less than she would like to do and was only her duty in every respect with regard to the maintenance of friendship she said she had done and would do nothing to prevent its growing still firmer and she hoped that god would avert the slightest dissension as the friendship was so necessary and both sovereigns were so good End quote. End of section 27.